Oberon. By Christoph Martin Wieland. Translated into a simple easy English listening version. Canto 1. Once more saddle me the hippogriff, you muses, to ride to the old romantic land. How sweetly the lovely madness plays around my unleashed bosom. Who wrapped the magic band around my forehead? Who drives from my eyes the mist that lies on the wonders of the prehistoric world? I see, in a colourful throng, now victorious, now defeated, the knight's good sword, the heathen's gleaming sabre. In vain does the wrath of the old sultan great, in vain a forest of rigid lances threatens, the ivory horn sounds in a lovely tone, and, like a whirlwind, seizes them all the fury to dance, they turn in circles until sense and breath escape. Triumph, Sir Knight, triumph. The beauty is won. What are you hemming? Away. The pennant is waving, to Rome, that your alliance may be crowned by the Holy Father. Only lest you crave the sweet forbidden fruit ahead of time. Patience. The friendliest wind favours your escape, two days more. Hesperia's golden coast beckons. Oh save. Save her. Faithful Sherismin, if it is possible. In vain. The drunken souls do not even hear the thunder. Unfortunate ones, where take you a moment? Can love so beguile? Into what sea of misery does she plunge you? Who will melt the wrath of the little demigod? Oh. How they roll arm in arm on the waves. Still happy with the consolation of at least sinking one into the other's breast at the same time. Oh. Hope not. Too angry with you, Oberon denies you even the last consolation, the poor last consolation of the suffering, to die. Saved for more severe torment I see them wandering helpless, naked, on the desolate shore, their bed a chasm, strewn with a handful of dry, half-rotten reeds and berries of a wild kind that are simmering here and there on bare hedges, all their fare. In this urgent need no cottage smoke from afar, no boat waving help, luck, chance and nature conspire to their fall. And the avenger's wrath has not yet softened, their misery has not yet reached the highest level. It only feeds their punishable flames. They may suffer, but they suffer together. To be separated. As in thunder and lightning, the wild storm separates two brotherships, and extinguished, when in the most secret seat of hope a faint flame still burns, this was still missing. O oh thou, her genius once, her friend! Does love deserve what was lacking, revenge without limits? Woe to you! I can still see tears glistening in his eyes, expect the worst when Oberon weeps. Yes, muse, where does the eagle's wing take you the high, drunken enthusiasm? Your listener stands in amazement, he wonders what you are, and your visions are mysterious things to him. Come, sit down with us on this sofa, and, instead of calling out, I see, I see, what no one sees but you, tell us calmly how everything happened. See how, with mouth listening and eyes wide open, the hearers all fit, inclined to mutual covenant, if you can deceive them willingly be deceived. Come on. Then hear the matter for the reason. The paladin, with whose adventures we are determined to delight you if you still delight was a long time bound by his word to steer to Babylon. What he was to do in Babylon was a breakneck work. Even in the days of Charlemagne, in ours, at the same risk, no young knight would dare for all the glory of the world. Son, said his uncle to him, the Holy Father in Rome, at whose feet, moistened with a copious stream of penitence tears, he, as a pious Christian, first confessed his guilt, Son, he said, as he blessed him with the indulgence, go in peace. You will probably succeed in what you begin. Above all, if you come to Joppen, visit the holy grave. The knight kisses his slipper in humility, pledges obedience, and goes on confidently. Hard was the work to which the emperor had condemned him, but, with God and Saint Christopher, he hopes to extricate himself to his glory. He gets out in Joppen, begins the pilgrimage to the precious holy grave with the pilgrim's staff, and now feels doubly bold in courage and faith. Then it's off to Baghdad with the reins draped over it. He always thinks, is it coming soon? Alone there lay many a steep hill and some deserts and many thick forests in between. Bad enough that in the heathen lands the beautiful language of okay was unheard of, 
is this the nearest way to Baghdad? He asks at every gate, but not understood by any soul. Once upon a time the path that lay ahead met a forest. He rode through storm and rain, now to the left, now to the right, the whole long day, and often first had to hack his way through the wild bushes with his broad sword. He rode up to the mountain to look around more freely. Woe to him! The forest seems to spread out from all sides, the more he looks, the wider it spreads. What came naturally to him seems like magic. How is he feeling when in such wild grounds, from which it was hardly possible to find oneself by day, the night finally overcame him? His misfortune now reached its peak. Not a star shines through the overgrown treetops, he leads his horse as best he can by the bridle, and with every step he bangs his forehead against a tree. The dense raven black covering that lies about the sky, an unknown forest, and what rings in his ears for the first time. The lion's thunderous roar from deep in the mountains. Which, made more terrible by the deathly stillness of the night, echoes from rocks, the man who never trembled in his whole life, all this made him tremble for the first time. Even our hero, although no woman's son ever saw him tremble, yet at this sound he feels the sinews in his arms and knees loosen, and against his will a chill runs down his back. But no fear can quench the courage that impels him to go to Babylon, and with drawn sword. His steed always at hand, he climbs a path that wound through rocks. He hadn't gone long, so he thinks he sees the glow of fire in the distance. The sight immediately pumps more blood to his cheeks, and, between doubt and longing to find a human being perhaps in these desolate heights, he continues to follow the gleam that soon dies and soon reappears as the path itself decreases or increases. Suddenly a cave yawns at him in the deepest rocky ground, before whose dark gorge a crackling fire is blazing. The illuminated rock juts out of the dark night in wondrous shapes, interspersed with wild bushes that nod down from the black crevices, and burn in the reflection as a green fire. With a lust mixed dread, our knight stands still to look at the magic. A thunderous halt resounds from the belly of the tomb. And suddenly before him stood a rough-looking man, covered in a cloak of wild cat skins, roughly patched together, beating rough thighs. A greyish-black beard hung in ruffled waves to his stomach. And on his shoulder he carried a cedar nest for a club, heavy enough to chop down the biggest bull in one fell swoop. The knight, unafraid of the man and his cedar and beard, begins in the language of OK, the only one he can, to discover his need. What am I hearing? exclaims the old man of the woods, delighted, oh sweet music from the banks of the Garonne. The sun has already traversed the circle of stars sixteen times, and all the time I've had to do without this feast for the ears. Welcome, noble lord. To Lebanon, welcome. Although it's easy to guess that you didn't take the path to this dragon's nest for my sake. Come, rest, and have a light meal for good, while the friendliness of the innkeeper does the best. My wine jumping out of this rocky cellar dilutes the blood and brightens the eyes. The hero, to whom this salute gave great joy, follows his countrymen straight into the grotto, takes off his helmet and armor, and stands there disarmed, like a young god. Alquif's staff seems to touch the woodsman, as he now unbuckles his shining helmet, and his long yellow hair winds in large rings down his slender back. How similar, he cries, oh how similar, little by little. Forehead, eyes, mouth, and hair. Like whom? Asks the knight. Excuse me, young man. It was a moment, a dream from a better time. So sweet, and also so bitter. It can't be. And yet, when that beautiful hair fell down your back. It was me I see him yourself from head to toe. By God. His imprint, all over, only he with a broader chest, and your curls more yellow. You are, according to the language, from my country, perhaps it is not in vain that you are so like the good Lord, for whom I have been weeping here in this wild grove, so far from my people, for sixteen years. Alas! To him to survive was my destiny. This hand closed his eyes, that I watered his early grave with faithful tears, and now to see him again in you, how wonderful! Chance sometimes plays such games, replies the young man. Be it then, he continues, enough, my brave young man, 
the love with which I feel drawn to you is trusting. No madness, and grant her the reward that Shirazmin name you when you take her. My name is Huon, heir and son of the brave Sijuin, once Duke of Guyen. Oh! cries the old man who falls at his feet, so my heart didn't lie to me. Oh welcome a thousand times in this lonely, inhospitable part of the world. Welcome, son of the chivalrous, pious, worthy lord, with whom in my better days I had many an adventure in shame and seriousness. You were still hopping in your first flight of wings when we joined together to drive to the holy grave. Who would then have thought we should meet in these gorges of rocks in Lebanon after eighteen years? Do not ever despair of anyone whose last stars vanish in the saddest night of hope. Yes, sir, forgive me if it gives me pleasure to talk. Rather, let me ask first of all, what tempest winds have brought you to this land? Herr Huan sits down with the old man on a moss bench by the hearth, and when he gives the travel-weary limbs a drink, as fresh as the spring gives him, and strengthens some honeycomb, he begins to tell his story to the innkeeper who is can't get enough of looking at him, and always noticed something in which his former lord resembled the young knight. The young man tells, in the manner of dear youth. A little broadly. How his mother at court the true place to educate princes very diligently brought him up to good teaching and knightly virtue, how swiftly childhood's lovely dream flew by, and how, as soon as some down had pricked his chin, he was proclaimed duke with great pomp at Bordeaux, from the steps of the castle, and how they spent it in vain lust and splendour, with hunts, tournaments, banquets, bluster and shower, two full years as single days, till Amory. The enemy of his house, by the emperor whose grace his father has already forsaken from behind, slandered him wickedly, and how Cole summoned him, for show in all grace, to court, to receive the fiefdom, like his said enemy, the cunning Baron von Hohenblatt, with Charlotte, the second son of the great Charles, the worst princely boy in Christianity when he had long been lusting after Huan's country secretly dug a pit for him on his way to Hofdig, and like her, early one morning, watched him in the woods near Montlery. My brother, he continued, young Gerard, with his falcon in hand, made the voyage. Out of happy ignorance, the boy leaves our troop, since no one was thinking anything bad, lets go of his falcon, and runs after him, meanwhile we all went our way and didn't care much when the falcon and boy flew out of our sight. Suddenly a pitiful cry comes into our ears. We hurry here quickly, and lo and behold! My brother lies on the ground. Fell from his horse. Soiled and bleeding. A squire recognised by none of our company, though it was Charlotte himself was about to pound it, and to one side a dwarf halted with his falcon. Inflamed with anger. I cried, you ruffian, what has that boy done to you, who is defenceless, playing along with him? Back and touch it with a finger, if you feel my sword in your stomach itching to feel it. Ha! He shouted at me, is that you? I was just looking for you. I have long thirsted for the desire to cool my vengeful heart in your blood. If you don't know me, then know I am the son of Duke Dietrich von Ardennes, your father siege when may he burn in the abyss. Carried away my thanks in an open race with insidiousness, and by fleeing alone he escaped his wages. Yes, I swore revenge on him, you shall pay me for him. There, look at your ears. And with the word he runs against me, who, unprepared for such a dance, did not anticipate it, with a lance drawn. Luckily I parried his stab with my left arm, around which I hurriedly wrapped my cloak, and immediately the fiend received a dent on his right sleep with my sword stud, from which he couldn't breathe. He fell, in a word. Never to rise. Suddenly riders appeared in the forest in large numbers, but the cowardly followers had no need to avenge the slain death. While we bound the boy's wound, they kept silent and distant until we disappeared from their sight, then they laid the corpse on a horse and hurried away to the imperial palace. Ignorant of how Carl S. business is getting worse, I follow my path, unconcerned about what is happening. We're getting there. My old uncle, Abbot at St. Denise, a man gifted with wisdom, leads the word by ear. We are well received, and everything would have turned out well for us, but just as one wants to sit down at the table, Hohenblatt stands still at the castle with Charlotte's corpse. Twelve squires carry her, disguised in black gauze, up the high steps, and whoever sees her is silent and stands frozen. 
they take their course to D.E.M. Sol. The doors spring open, twelve ghosts carry a beer covered with bloody linen right up to the middle of the hall. The emperor himself turns pale, the rest of us make our hair stand on end, and it hit me like a ray of lightning. Meanwhile Amory steps forward, lifts the bloody cloth from the corpse, and look! He calls out to the emperor this is your son. And here the wicked one who wounded the rich man and you, the murderer of ours alas. Woe is me. I came too late. Not inadvertently, your Charlotte fell in the bushes, by assassination, not like in the open field by the hand of a knight and knightly hero. However much vexation his wicked son daily brought to the old master, he remained his son, his flesh and blood. At first he stood motionless, then he cried out in pain, my son. My son! And threw himself in desperation beside the corpse. The anxious father tone was a dagger in my heart, I would have given my best blood for Charlotte's life at that moment. Lord, I cried, hear me! My will is without guilt, he pretended to be the son of the Duke of Ardennes, and what he did, by God! It could have murdered the patience of a saint. He hit the boy there, who had done him no harm spoken blasphemously about my father's honour, unexpectedly attacked me in a murderous manner, I'd like to see him who would have remained cold. Ha! Villain! Screams Carl, hearing me, inflamed jumps up from the corpse, with a lion's fury in his eyes, tears the iron out of a servant's hand, and if the princes hadn't held him back with might and main, he would have run through me in his rage. Suddenly the whole equestrian order shakes, a lightning radiance from a hundred bare weirs seems to awaken the lust for murder in every breast. The hall is thundered by screams, the Eastrick trembles, the old windows rattle. Murder resounds from every mouth. Treachery. The languages seem to get confused again. You snort, you run at each other, you pull out the threatening hand. The abbot, whom only Saint Benedict's robe still protects from crime, finally holds out his scapula to our sword with raised arm. Honour, he cries aloud, the Holy Father in me whose son I am. In the name of the God whom I serve, I command peace. He cried with an expression and a tone that would have required heathens to pay. And straight away the waves of rebellion lighten up every look, and every dagger and every naked sword creeps silently back into its scabbard. The abbot then presented the whole course of the matter to the emperor. The persuasion was on his lips. But what use was that to me? The corpse of the son lies there and cries for revenge. Here, calls the father, look, and pronounce judgment on my son's murderer. Speak for me yes, vengeful spirit, your taste buds shall feast on his blood. He dies and fattens the ravens. Now my heart swelled up. I'm not a murderer, I screamed loudly. The judge does not judge fairly in his own case. The plaintiff Amory is a traitor, sir. Here I stand. Free and willing, willing in his false heart, with my life's journey, proving that he is a rogue and a liar, and was and will remain so as long as his breath poisons the air. His work is all this, he instigated it. Like him, I am of princely lineage, a power of the realm, and here claim my justice, the emperor can't deny me. There lies my glove, let him dare to pick it up, and God in his judgment decide which of us the voice of this blood shall thunder to hell. The source of my courage is my innocence, Lord. Its thunder doesn't frighten me. The princes of the empire, so many of them present, each sees himself wounded in my condemnation. They murmur, like the sea, when the storm begins to stir from afar, they beg, press, present the law to him. For free his gaze lowered to Charlotte's bloody head, nothing can move his father, although Hohenblatt, who thinks it's easy to win over me, puts himself among the supplicants. Lord, says he. Let me go to punish the wrongdoer. I dare nothing where duty and justice protect me. Ha! I cried loudly, heated up with shame and rage, are you still mocking? Tremble. The Avenger's lightning never sleeps. My sword, Hohenblatt cries, let it, murderer, heap it on your head. But Karl, whom my order has only embittered, commands the guard to seize me. This hasty word arouses the whole sal anew, all swords flash, 
to protect the knightly right that hurts Karl in me. Sees him, calls the emperor again, but he sees, with his sword held before him, the knights encircle me in a tight circle. In vain, almost smothered in the crowd, threatens the spiritual master with ban and interdict. The fate of the empire seemed to hang by a hair. The grey counsellors beg the emperor on their knees to yield to the right of the knights, the more they beg, the less he is moved, until finally Duke names who often in his life, when Karl lost his head, lent him his put his mouth to his ear, then turned against us and swears leave to the emperor's coveted battle. Mr. Huan then went on to tell. How straight after this single word the rebellion subsided, the knights all retreated, and Karl, although angry at heart, with quiet anger in his half-clouded eyes, the eighth day was determined for the judgment battle, how both parts armed with great splendor, and, sure of triumph, Amory boasted. The proud man, although in his breast a plaintiff beats, who shakes his courage, was aware of an iron arm, which has already splintered many a forest with lances. He had never trembled before an enemy, and fighting to the death or life was his delight. But all his defiance and his enormous strength betrayed him in this bloody work. The day of judgment had now come, gather all the people together. With my silver tournament shield in front of my breast, and greeted, as I like to say, with love by all, I appeared in the barriers. The plaintiff was already there. In a bay window lay old Charles, surrounded by his princes, and seemed, in open treaty with Amory, to thirst for my blood. The sun is divided. The judges sit down. My opponent seems to burn with impatience until the trumpet calls. Now she calls, and we run. And meet so violently that the horses fall on their knees, and I and Hohenblatt can hardly keep each other in the saddle. We hurry to free ourselves from the hangers, and now, in a flash, both swords are bare. Don't ask me to paint you a picture of our struggle. My adversary was evidently superior to me in anger and strength, as in experience, but the innocence of my cause protected me, and made my strength equal to the will. Victory remained in doubt for a long time, blood was already flowing from many a source of the plaintiff, and Huan was still unhurt and alert. Wild Amory, as he sees his steaming blood staining his armor, inflamed with new fury, and rushes at Huan, like a storm that shatters and devastates everything before him, lightning blow after blow, so that my young knight the superior defended himself with difficulty. An arm comparable in strength to Roland's, at last, after a long struggle, makes him give way. Already certain of victory. Amory immediately grasps his mighty sword with both strained hands. To end the fight at one stroke. But Huan's good luck slips away from the death stroke, and, before he can swing himself into balance, where the helmet laces on the collar, he delivers a blow that makes his ears ring, and the unnerved hand loses the grip of the sword. The proud falls at the feet of his adversary, and Huan, sword drawn, strikes at him. Unload your conscience, he cries, if life still has value in your eyes. Confess it now bandit, Amory yells, gathering all his strength for the final thrust with Grimm, take this and follow me to hell. Luckily the thrust, guided with an uncertain hand from the ground up, through a quick turn that makes Huan harmless, only touches the edge of the left arm, alone, my knight, in the dazzle of the first anger, forgets that Hohenblatt still needs a little breath in order to make the truth publicly known to Karl, and thrusts his broad sword furiously into his jaws. The wicked spay out the black soul in waves of red tide. The victor stands, sanctified and washed clean in his accuser's blood, before all eyes. The herald's call proclaims it aloud to the people. A loud shout of joy resounds in the clouds. The knights rush here to staunch the blood that wells up on the armor's sides, and to accompany him to the emperor. But Karl so the young knight goes on to tell the man from the rock Karl still held his grudge. Can this new murder inspire my son, he cried. Has Huan's innocence been recognized? Did Hohenblatt drop a word of recantation? May he be banished from our kingdom forever, and all his land and property have fallen into the hands of the crown. Severe was this verdict, severe the mouth from which it came, alone. What could we do about it? The only way was to ask us to lie down. The pars, the knights, we all knelt round round his throne, our knees sore, 
and finally gave up ever moving it, when Carl finally broke his long silence, come on, you princes and knights, you want it, we give in. But here the condition, which nothing can be revoked. Here he bent the scepter against me down to the steps of the throne I pardon you, alone, from all my kingdoms your banished foot shall escape straight away at this hour, and, until you have done my imperial command piece by piece, coming is immediate death. Go to Babylon, and in the festive hour, when the caliph, in the state, at his round table, enjoys himself with his emirs at the high meal, step up and cut off the head of the one lying on his left, so that his blood spattered the tablet. When this is done, chasten the heiress to his throne, first at his seat, and kiss her three times publicly as your bride. And when the caliph, who did not anticipate such a scene in his own presence, stares at your boldness, then throw yourself down on the golden back of his chair. In the manner of the Orient, and, as a gift for me, to crown our friendship, ask him for four of his molars and a handful of hair from his grey beard. Go there, and, as I said, before you have accomplished what I commanded you here word for word, your return will be immediate death. By the way, we remain in your favour. The emperor said it and was silent. There is no need to describe how we felt about it. Everyone saw that nothing was better than a sentence of death. A dull grumbling began to sniff out the deep valley. By St. George. Said one of the knights. On the rough course of Lancelot and Tristan. Many an adventure done with honour. Otherwise I don't usually tremble easily before a thing, put your head down, I'll put mine on it, but what the emperor had planned for Huan, even if Mr. Gorin hadn't started it, no matter how good he was. Why do I talk a lot? It was too obvious that Carl was trying to kill me by this commandment. However it came about. Whether it was desperation. Whether suspicion or defiance, that made me so foolhardy, enough. I stepped before him and said with confidence, what you commanded. Lord, cannot bend my courage. I'm a frank. Impossible or not, I'll do it and you'll all be witnesses. And now, by virtue of this word, my good Sherismin, do you see me here resolved to journey to Babylon? If you want to show me the next way out of these mountains, thank you, if not, I'll do it as I can. My best lord, replies the rock man, while the tears tremble down his beard, you call me into a new life as if from the grave. Here I swear to you, and there, as a holy pledge, is this old hand, though not unnerved, to live and die with you, the dear son and heir of my good lord. The work for which the emperor sent you is difficult, but honour can also be gained with it. Enough, I'll lead you there and stand up to you with firm courage to the last drop of blood. The young prince, touched by such loyalty, gratefully throws his arms around the old man's neck. Then the two lie down on the litter, and Huan sleeps as if it were down. And when the day awakens, the knight also awakens with cheerful looks. Buckles on his armour. The old man takes the sack on his back, the knit in his hand, and hikes briskly ahead. Canto 2. So the noble couple, always merry, awake and alert, by sunshine and starlight, already three days down Lebanon, and when the midday heat bites them on their heads, high grass in the shade of old cedars serves as a resting place, meanwhile, in colourful feathers, the light people of the air tune their silver throats, and take a trusting part in their meal. On the fourth morning a little band of horsemen show themselves on a hill quite near. They are Arabs, his companion says to Huan, and to avoid the rude people, if possible, would be best, I know them as impudent guests. Hey, hey, where are you thinking? Replies Seguin's son, where did you hear that Franks ever fled? The sons of the desert, drawn magnetically by Huan's helmet, which flashes towards them in the sun's brilliance, as if it were all carbuncle and ruby, they come with bow and arrow, sabre drawn, flying in the storm. A man on foot, a man on horseback seems scarcely worth attacking, but they found themselves cheated. The young hero, covered with his shield, bursts among them, and with his spear throws the one who seemed to be their leader from the mare so hard that a bloody stream spurted from his mouth and nose. Now all rush at once, to avenge the captain's fall, at his victor, with heaves, and stabs, alone from Sherismin, who covers his back, at the first blow, a thump is thrown out, and on the other train our night works so tirelessly that soon a second and third clears the saddle. 
with every fresh move a head flies here, and there an arm, the saber still in the fist. The old man struck no less hard with his heavy lever. The heroes cry out cursing to their maham, and whoever can still flee flees at full speed. The field is dreadfully covered with corpses and with butts of horse and man swarming about one another. The hero, as soon as his new accomplice. The best horse that has lost its master. Along with a good sword, emerges from the booty, spurs on his snorting stallion and hurries like a bird to the valleys that stretch out in unforeseeable distances at the foot of the mountains in front of them spread gaze. It seemed a well-built country, with brooks intersected everywhere the meadows covered with sheep, the meadows in flower robes, and between the palm trees scattered the peaceful huts of the brown inhabitants, who happily go about their day's work, think themselves rich in their poverty. And, when they rest hungry and tired in the cool shade, wave friendly to the pilgrim to the raw peasant meal. Here the knight, as the sun began to oppress him, lets himself break bread in fresh milk from a shepherdess. The good people, half frightened, stare to one side, as he lies in the grass, at the strange iron man, but since sight and sound quickly won their hearts to him, children soon dared to go and play with his curls. The brave man is amused by their cosy, happy crowd, he becomes a child with them and shares their sweet play. How blessed, he thinks, would it be to live in these huts? Vain wish. His destiny calls him elsewhere. The evening beckons. At parting his heart trembles, and, to reward the good people for the friendly meal, Huan throws a handful of gold into the landlady's lap. But the lucky ones did NT know what it was, and practiced the right of hospitality without pay, so that the gentlemen only had to take their gold back. So they rode until at last. As day was beginning to dawn, a forest lay before them. Friend, says the paladin to the old man, I'll burn like fire until I keep my word with the emperor. Did you want to lead me the next way to Baghdad? It's me, I've been riding for years. The next way, replies his accomplice, is through the middle of this forest, alone, I do not advise you to do so. No one speaks well of him, at least no one who ventured in ever came out again. Are you smiling? Believe me, sir, an ill-tempered little mischievous goblin keeps house in this forest. It's teeming with foxes, dear, dear the people were as good as we were. Heaven knows what wild beast we'll see ourselves clothed in before morning. Just go, replied Seguin's son, through this forest on the way to Babylon, so I fear nothing. Lord, let me pray you on my knees. By God. I care more about you than I do, because against this spirit I'm sure that believe me, it won't help either to resist or to flee. Five or six days later it's done, and alas, you always arrive in Baghdad too early. If you're afraid, says the knight, you stay, I'll go, I've made up my mind. Not that, cries Shirazmin, death always tastes bitter, alone, a rogue who forsakes his master. If you are determined, I will follow without hesitation, and help us God and our wife to ACQS. Come on, says Huan, come. And writes, pale as wax, into the forest. The old man follows with a shudder. He had scarcely trotted two hundred paces away in the twilight, when left and right an army of stags and deer roamed towards him in full leap. They seemed, with tears in their eyes of warning, as sheriffsmen, though of little light, will remark from pity to shoo them back, as if to say, O oh flee, you poor wretches. Well. Do you see he whispers to the knight how things are? And will you believe me some other time? Isn't that quite literal? The animals that you see, which snort at us so strongly out of pity, are people, I tell you, and if you go on, believe me, we've got the goblin on the hood. Don't be so hard and run out of stubbornness, in defiance of a friend's advice, towards your misfortune. How, dude? Says the hero, I'm going with these steps to Baghdad, to ask the caliph for a handful of hair from his beard and four of his teeth, and you ask me to let the uncertain journey frighten me. Where has your mind gone? Who knows, the leprechaun might be my good friend. With these at least it's not meant so badly, see them all scatter in a hui. As he speaks, he rushes at them, and everything vanishes like air and is gone in the hui. Mr. Huan and his guide went away for a while in undisturbed peace, 
both silent. The day had now fallen, and the brown night poured down its poppy juice, all around her everything lay drunk asleep, and through the whole forest it was quiet as in the grave. Finally the old man can no longer break free. Lord, says he, if I disturb you in a whimsical plan, think it too good for me, it's one of my weaknesses. I won't deny it. Alone, in the dark I have to speak, that was my way from my childhood on. It is so quiet here as if the great pan had died. Were it not for the sound of our horse's hoofbits. I believe that one could even hear the mole scratching. Ye think I am afraid, but without boasting, for whatever man has, it is in the end a gift, and some still live who have seen it where swords clash, in the field and in the tourney, man against man, on stabbing or hewing, it would be two in an emergency two and three at five to six, I'm there. You can trust your bones. In short, an enemy is only flesh and blood, I am his man. But, I must freely admit, walking in a churchyard at midnight that lifts my hat a little. Assuming that such a spirit that meets me across the country, my physiognomy does not suit me, what use is my arm and sword, Ventregris? When it rains invisible blows on my back. Assuming that there are examples, I'll also cut his skull flat off his body, even as it rolls, two new heads stand on the stump in its place. Often even the torso runs at full speed after the head and puts it back on as if it were just a hat that the wind has taken from it. Well, I beg you, how is one to get rid of one? It is true, as you know, as soon as the rooster crows, so it is with all the spooks that lurk in the dark between eleven and twelve, ghosts or elves. As if the wind had blown them away. Alone, the spirit that drives its being here is of a very special kind to you, keeps open court, eats, drinks, and lives and loves like us one, and goes by broad daylight. To pique in my curiosity, you did your best, replies Seguin's son, people talk so much about ghosts and lie about them so much that lay people of our kind don't know what they believe. Once upon a time a deeply studied man came to our court, he swore to us that there was nothing to it, and cursed all spirits ears thoroughly, also the chaplain called him only a Manichaean. They often argued over a bottle of wine, but when the last glass began to go to your head, they mixed in so much Latin that one of us could scarcely understand a word. Then I often thought, no matter how highly learned you chatter, you know nothing but what you experience yourself, I wanted a spirit to honour me and tell me what was going on. Meanwhile, our wandering couple found themselves caught up unnoticed in a park through which so many paths snaked back and forth. That wandering about it was almost inevitable. The moon had just risen full-faced, to confuse with false lights through a deceptive darkness those eyes that stray for a way out. Lord, said Sherismin, here it is to twist us into a labyrinth. The only way to find out is by randomly checking your nose. The council who is wiser than many a wise man thinks will soon lead our pious wanderers to the centre where the whole forest unites in a great star. And in the distance they see in the bushes a castle that, as if woven from the red of the evening, rises shimmering in the air. With eyes in which desire and horror mix, and doubtful between dream and waking, Huan hovers speechless and gapes, when suddenly flew on the golden doors and rolled along a chariot pulled by leopards. A little boy, beautiful, as on Scytherin's lap the god of love, sat in the silver chariot, the reins in his hand. There he comes at us, my good lord, cries Sherismin with trepidation, as he pulls Huan's horse after him by the bridle, we are lost. Flee, oh flee! Here comes the dwarf! How beautiful he is! Says that one only all the worse. Away! And were it ten times nicer. Flee, I tell you! or it's over for us. The knight resists, but no resisting helps, the old man chases ahead with the fastest flight and pulls him after him, and does not stop driving, to hunt over hill and dale, through forest and bush, and to set over fence and ditch, until they have saved themselves from the grove into the open. With rain, storm, and lightning. A tempest pursues those who are fleeing. The most terrible night devours the moon, it thunders, hisses, and cracks all around them, as if it smashed the whole forest into splinters, in short, all elements in strife fight each other with unbridled fury, but in the midst of the storm, from time to time, with a loving tone of spirit, gentle voice resounds, why are you fleeing me? 
You are fleeing from your happiness, trust me, come, Huan, come back. Lord, if you do it, you are lost, shout Sherismun. Away, away, put your fingers in your ears, and don't speak a word. He's up to no good. Now it's off again through thick and thin, swept around by the storm, flooded by the rain, until a monastery wall stops the swift riders. A new adventure. The day this happened was just the name Feast of Holy Agatha, the protector of this virgin kennel. Now there was scarcely a shot of it a pen full of well-fed disciples of the holy abbot Antonius, and in these evening hours both of them had joined together as friends for a prayer trip. They came back just as, near the clostibule. Waving pair after pair in the most beautiful order, the rest of the storm fell upon them. Crosses, flags, scapulars are the play of mad winds, and the tide pours into the folds of the veil. All effort to maintain decency is in vain, the devotion tears, with a comic throng everything runs back and forth in strange shapes. Here wades up to the knee a nun in the mud, there a monk slips as he runs, and as he throws himself on a bunch of little sisters running in front of him, in his fear he grabs the dominatrix by the legs. But finally, when the storm had done its utmost, breathless, the whole congregation, soaked through and splashed, arrived in the monastery forecourt. Here everything was still full of turmoil, when through the gate, which stood wide open, my sherismin threw himself into the midst of the crowd of monastery people, for he believes it is as safe on consecrated ground as in heaven. Huan will soon follow. And as soon as he wants to open his mouth to ask for freedom. So with a flash the dwarf stands in their midst. Suddenly the sky is cloudless, and everything is bright and mild and dry as before. Beautiful, like a newborn angel in the morning light, he stands leaning on a lily stalk, and about his shoulders hangs an ivory horn. As beautiful as he is, an unknown terror comes over you all, for earnestness and quiet anger clouds over his eyebrows. He puts the horn to his lips and blows the sweetest sound. Straight overpowers the old man a dizzy spirit, he cannot refrain from dancing, grabs a toothless nun, who is dying of desire to take part in a little dance, and hops and jumps around with her like a young buck so quickly that veil and skirt blow far in the air, to everyone's laughter. Soon the same fury seizes the whole monastic estate, every penitent takes his little nun by the hand, and a ballet begins, the likes of which will not be seen again any time soon. The sisters and the brothers are conscious of no discipline or rule, no fawn dance can turn lightly. The only Huan stands on his feet, watches her leaps, and laughs heartily. Then the handsome dwarf approached him, and spoke to him in his voice with a serious countenance, Why flee from me, O Huan of Guyenne? As? Are you silent? By the God of heaven whom I know, answer me. Now the confidence is returning in Huan's breast. What do you want my replies the youth? Fear nothing, says the one, he who must not fear the light is my brother. I've loved you since you were a child, and whatever good I decreed for you, I've never done it for any Adam's child. Your heart is pure, your walk without crookedness, where duty and honour call, you don't ask flesh and blood. Have faith in yourself, have courage in the test, you can never fail to have my protection, for my punishment only affects polluted souls. If these monastery people were not a hypocritical bread, if their chaste look, their quiet penance would not deceive a secretly punishable conscience, they would stand on their feet, like you, despite the horn. Even Shirazmin, for whom his honest eye speaks, must pay for the crime of his tongue. They all don't dance because the tickle stings them, the poor dance because they have to. Meanwhile a new whirlwind begins to churn up the fawn dance even faster, they jump so high and turn so quickly that they melt in their own heat like snow in a thaw, and every struggling heart beats to the throat. The knight's humanity no longer endures the sight, he thinks it's a pity for all the young blood, and begs mercy for her. The beautiful dwarf swings his lily staff, and straight away the thick magic swindle melts away, S.D. Anton's fat wards stand petrified. And every little nun, pale as if she were climbing out of the grave, hurry, veil, skirt, and everything else that has shifted in jumping, to put it right. Only Sherismin, too old for such a joke, falls down powerlessly, and believes his heart will burst. Oh! Does he whine, gracious sir, what do I tell you? 
No further, friend Sherismin. The dwarf interrupts him, I know you as a brave fighter, only sometimes your head runs away with your heart. Why, in other words, so quick to slander me? F.Y. Already greyish from the beard, still so young in judgment. Take the little chastisement with patience. You others, go and atone for yourselves and your sisters. The people of the monastery sneak away in shame. Then the beautiful dwarf speaks to the old man in a friendly manner. What, old man? Still the dark lines of suspicion. But because you're stayed, Oberon forgives you. Come closer, good old reveller, come, take heart with me and fear no deceit. You are exhausted, take this cup and empty it in one gulp. With this word the elf king gives him a drinking vessel twisted of fine gold. The old man, who stands on his feet in need, is not a little startled when he sees it empty. Hey! Calls the spirit, no confidence yet. Fresh to the mouth, and drink, and do not doubt. The good man obeys, albeit only half-wildly, and sees the gold quickly fill with wine from Langan. And when he emptied it in one gulp, it seemed to him as if a new spirit of life flashed through all his veins with lustful heat. He feels as strong and safe as he was when, in his prime, he rode to the holy tomb with his first master. Full of reverence and trust, he falls to the beautiful dwarf's foot and calls, now my faith stands like a mountain. Then the ghost said to the knight with a serious look, I know well the commission with which Charles sent you to Babylon. You see what a storm he has prepared for you, his resentment demands your blood, only what you have begun with faith and courage, I will help you to complete. There, brave Huon, take this horn from my hands. His snail-like wounded belly resounds with a lovely sound. And ten thousand men threaten you with sword and spear. They begin to dance, and dance without rest in the whirl, as you saw an example here, until they fall to the ground. Yes, if you let it sound with power, it is a call, and I will appear to you. Then you see me. And if I were a thousand miles from you, hurry to your aid. Only save such a reputation until the greatest need presses on you. Take this cup too, which fills itself with wine, as soon as an honest man puts it to his lips, the spring never runs dry, from which its nectar swells, but a rogue brings it to the rim of his mouth, the cup empties and glows in his hand. Mr. Huan takes with thanks the wonderful pledges of his new protector's grace, and since he sees the purple edges of the east golden, he searches with impatience for Babylon the shortest of the ways. Go down, says Oberon, after he has instructed him, and that I may never see the hour when Huan's heart is dishonored by weakness. Not that I distrust your courage and heart. But, alas! You are an Adam's child, made of soft clay, and blind to the future. Too often short pleasure is the source of long pain. Never forget the warning Oberon gave you. Then he stirs it with his lily staff. And Huan sees two bright pearls rolling out of his loving azure eyes. And when he wanted to swear loyalty and duty to him, the forest spirit had vanished from his sight, and only the scent of lilies remained where he stood. Stunned, speechless, the young knight stands still, rubs his eyes and forehead, like someone waking up from a beautiful dream. Trying to make sure whether what fills him with such joy is real, whether it is only a nocturnal one picture. But even if he had doubted, the cup and the horn that hung round his shoulders on a gold chain, left no room for doubt. The cup especially seems to the rejuvenated old man the most beautiful piece in the whole fairy treasure. Sir, he says, about to hold the stirrup for him one more pull, to thank the good dwarf. His wine, by my loyalty, is a real drink of the gods. And now, after she had strengthened herself for the new journey, she went over hill and dale, in the manner of an old knight, all day long, and only part of the short night is spent under trees. So they went, without any adventure, for four days, the knight already in spirit to Babylon, and happy his faithful that it is Seguin's son that he travels to the side. Canto 3. On the fifth, as their way stole through the mountains, suddenly they saw many rich tents pitched in a narrow valley, and knights, more than twenty in number, lying in groups around in the shade of palm trees. They rested, it seemed, after their midday meal, while helmet and spear hung on low branches, and their horses grazed freely in the grass. 
Scarcely does the knightly troop become aware of the two horses on the hill, then all of the earth hurry up from their midday rest, as if the horns were blown to fight. The whole valley becomes active in a moment, one trembles to and fro, one runs to arms, the knights arm themselves, the squires their horses. Let us see, says my hero to Shirazmin, what causes this knighthood, which seemed so peacefully in charge of the work of digestion, to be so uneasy. We ourselves, as I see, replies that, be on your guard. They come towards us in half-moon. Herr Huan draws his sword with cold blood, friend, he says, he is good for all harm. Meanwhile, a fine man steps out of the circle in his armory, politely greets both of us, and asks to be heard. With favour, Lord Paladin. Everyone, he says, has been stopped here, whoever of our class and order has appeared in this valley for half a year. Now it is your choice to break a spear here, if not. To do at once why we discuss you. And what? Huan asks demurely. Not far from here, says the one, the giant Angulafa fattens himself in a strong castle, a nasty enemy of Christianity, a real rampage, more keen on beautiful women than a Kaffir, and, what is worst, strong against cuts and thrusts, power of a ring, which he took from the dwarf, from whose park the gentleman came. My lord, I am a prince from Mount Lebanon. I had enlisted myself in the service of the most beautiful of all beautiful women for three years, before she accepted so many requests to be crowned, and just as I, as bridegroom, wanted to loosen her belt, then the werewolf came and took her under his arm and trolled away before my eyes with my lovely lamb. Almost seven months have passed since I tried my utmost for her salvation, only the iron tower, in which he locked her, prevented me from entering, her from fleeing. The only thing I've enjoyed of Cupid's sweet fruit in the long time was to lurk for days on a tree from afar. And look at the hated walls. Sometimes I even thought I saw her, with her hair loosely tied, standing at the window, with her arms raised, as if she were begging heaven for mercy. A dagger pierced my heart. And now desperation drove me, since that day. Out of sheer necessity to do what you have experienced, like all these fighters, in short, unchallenged, sir, no knight can advance here. If you succeed, which no one has yet succeeded in lifting me out of my saddle, then you are free and travel without compulsion wherever you want, if not, then you must surrender, like these gentlemen here, to be at my command, and not to go a single step from here until we have passed the adventure and redeemed my bride from Angulafa's bonds. Yes, if you would rather swear to penetrate his iron tower straight away, and bring my Angela back alone, you have a free choice and are still worthy of thanks. Prince, said the paladin, why do you need to pee here? Enough that you have done me the honour. Come, a ride with you and your whole number, from the rest another time. The handsome knight is startled, but he puts up with it, they ride, the trumpets sound, and, in short, Mr. Huan lays the Prince of Lebanon with a hard push on the lap of good old Mother Earth. Then come the noble servants in turn, and when he has done to them as their lord did, he picks them up again with a courteous gesture. By God, Sir Knight, speaks, limping to him, the cedar prince you owe a sharp stab. But Buster, your hand. Come, because the evening beckons, to a brotherly meal and a cup of reconciliation. Herr Huan accepts the proposal gratefully, three hours flew by drinking and joking, and when the knights saw him so handsome and polite, they heartily forgave him the pain in their ribs. Now, he says, dear sir and friends, since I have honestly won what was mine from you, now, you should know, it goes straight to the giant. It was my intention before, and now I'm doing it with all the greater pleasure, because it's a service to an honest man. Then he thanks her for trying so hard with him, and presses them all one after the other to his breast. And when she showed him the nearest way to the castle of the hulking giant through a forest of pines, he dismissed her, with the assurance that they should soon hear from their lady. Farewell, gentlemen. Good luck. And now in full leap to the forest. The morning sun had scarcely reddened the pine trees when in the pale field an immense tower appeared before his eyes. The whole work seemed to be cast in iron, and it was so tightly closed all around that only a little gate. Scarcely two feet wide, stood open, and in front of the little gate, with flails in hand, stand two mighty metal colossuses, 
animated by magic, and thrash tirelessly so hail-proof that between blow and blow no ray of light can push itself unbroken. The paladin stands for a while, and, as he ponders what to do, a maiden shows herself at a window, and demurely waves him over with her hand. Hey yes! exclaims Sherismin, the damsel is good to wave. Surely you won't be such a daredevil. Don't you see the Swiss on the right and on the left? You don't get a bone all the way in there. But Huan was true to his rule, not to turn his back on Satan himself. Here, he thinks, there is no advice but to go straight through the boar straight to the little gate. Sword high, eyes closed, he rushes in, and happy him. His faith does not deceive him, the brazen colossuses stand motionless as soon as he touches them. No sooner has the hero gone in. While Sherisman keeps the horses in the yard. The beautiful maid hastens to receive the knight, with black hair that hangs down her back, in a white satin skirt that falls to the ground, and her lightly covered bosom is held together by a golden ribbon, the most dainty model for graces or muses. What an angel speaking, barely touching his hand, the girl blushing sweetly what angel, Lord, hath sent you to me. I was just standing at the window, praying to the Holy Virgin, when you appeared. Certainly she did it, an ascent by her Angela accepts you. Sent to my aid by her, who has so often taken care of me, you are welcome a thousand times. Only let us not forgive, for I hate every moment that we dwell in this dungeon. I'm not coming, says Huan, to hurry like this, where is the giant? Oh he, she replies, lies, fortunately, in a deep sleep, and it's good that you hit him like this, for if he is raised again, you would hope in vain to conquer him, as long as the magic ring is on his finger. But it is still just time to take this ring safely from him. How so? The deep sleep that paralyzes and numbs him three to four times a day is not a common sleep. Because there are still two whole hours to go before he wakes up, I want to tell you the whole thing briefly. My father, called Balazan of Phrygian, is lord of Jericho in the land of Palestine. It's been nearly four years since Alexis loved me, the fairest prince of Mount Lebanon, and if I saddened him by being brittle, believe me, my heart didn't know a word about it, it was hard enough for me. Yes, in the first few weeks I promised Saint Alexia only if the prince served me chastely and purely for three years, otherwise he would not be his. Secretly, I grew fonder of him every day, the trial period was long, but it passed, I was betrothed to him and in short we saw ourselves locked in the bridal chamber, suddenly the chamber door flew open with a thunderous storm, the giant came shooting, seized me, fled, and seven months have been sheer since this tower has held me captive, expired. To know whether the giant has made it so easy for me to constantly repel storms without number, you must see him for yourself. Sir, what shall I say? Always challenged, always victorious, is difficult. Once when he took me to the extreme one moonlit night I still shudder. I fell on my knees, with clenched hands called upon the mother of God to send me help. The fair queen of heaven heard me, the virgin full of grace. Struck as if by lightning, the wicked man sank down and lay, powerless to harm me, for six whole hours. So often, since that time, he renewed the hated struggle, again the miracle itself, his defiance must immediately subside and his magic ring can do nothing against it. This was only the case today, and at the end of the sixth hour four of which have already passed he rises to new life, as fresh and strong as if nothing had affected him. The work of the ring is this. As long as he protects him, nothing can happen to him alive. You wouldn't believe what virtues the ring possesses. But what keeps you from looking at all this for yourself? The knight fared just like you. He had imagined, after Angulafa's name, a monster from Titan's raw seed, like the wild sons of the earth, who once, to storm the seat of the gods, tore the high Pelion together with the roots from the earth, to tower it up on Ossa, now became a man of seven feet from it. Have you ever seen the gods of Glycon, the great son of the long miraculous night, in the archetype? Or only imitated in plaster? Think you see the man standing before you in person, who brought poor Angela to the extreme in the beautiful moonlit night. As he lay, the smartest of our newer folk would have taken him for a picture of Hercules, for a Hercules in peace, when he mucked up the marble stable for orgias, 
so broad-shouldered, high-breasted Angulafa lay there. Also matched the clothes. The knight is startled, for his strength did not lie in antiquity, and so, before the chaste gaze of the day, to shimmer in the costume of the heroic age, it seems to him a real piece of heathen. Well, the maiden whispers to him, noble knight, why are you hesitating? He's sleeping. The ring, and a blow, that's it. My fame is too dear to me for that. An enemy who lies asleep, and nakeder than a splinter, sleeps safely next to me, first I want to wake him. So at least make yourselves masters of the ring first, she says. The knight approaches to pull off the circlet, and, ignorantly, makes himself the overlord of the spirits. The ring has, in addition to some strength that Huan does not yet know, also this quality, to attach itself straight and flexible to every finger, small or large, he will stretch or nestle as need be. The paladin gawks at the wonderful circlet with horrid delight, grasps at the giant's arm, and shakes it with might and main so long and hard, until at last he wakes up. As soon as the giant begins to stir, Balazin's daughter flees with a loud cry. Herr Huon, true to his courage and rank as a knight, stay where you are. When the heathen sees him, he yells at him fiercely, Who are you, little wretch, who so daringly interrupts my morning sleep? Does your little head have to itch unbearably because you lay it freely at my feet? Arise and arm yourself, replies the paladin, then, braggart, my sword shall answer you. Heaven sends me to draw you as a punishment, the end of your life of sin is near. The giant, hearing him speak thus, is terrified when he sees his ring on Huon's hand. Go, he says, ere my blood begins to boil, give me back the ring and go in peace. I only took what you stole from you, and I will give it back to whomever it belonged to, says Huan, I despise such a gift of life, get up and arm yourself, and come down with me. You could have murdered me in my sleep, moves the bar with ever more gentle courage. You are a worthy man. I pity your young blood, give me the ring. I will give you the head. Cowardly, cries Huan, shame on you. You beg in vain. Die, or if you deserve life, deserve it gallantly. Now the fiend jumps up, so that even the walls tremble, his eyes blaze like the open pit of hell, his nose snorts, steam escapes from his mouth, he hastens to put on the armor that is impenetrable even to a magic sword. The knight descends, and his defiant, sure enemy appears without hesitation, all in ragged steel, who in his rage forgot that no magic weapons could protect him from the ring's lightning. But the first blow that Huan's good sword brings to his armor gives him the mortal wound, the blood shoots up the neck like a stream, and blocks the path of the breath in its wide gullet. He falls like on the forehead of Taurus a pine falls in thunder, the tower, the field around, trembles from its fall, he no longer feels himself, his staring eyes are forever closed to the light, and the wicked spirit, heavy with crimes. Devils are already dragging him to the terrible court. The victor wipes off the blood-stained steel the black poison, and rushes to the maiden in the sal. Hail to you, my noble lord. You smelled me well. Exclaims Angela, throwing herself ecstatically at his feet as soon as she sees him, and to you, who sent him to my saviour, O Queen of Heaven, be hereby promised, the first son with whom I in the weeks will come, in clear, dense gold, heavy as it is, will be sacrificed to you. Mr. Huan, when he honorably picked them up, returned their thanks with all courtesy to the good old days of chivalry, which were not woven as finely as ours, but were all the more coarse and kept their color better. The knight's great duty was to protect maidens, and, if his heart felt uncomfortable, to spill his blood for each one at every call. The lady had not yet had time and peace enough to consider the young man more closely, now that she begged him to lay down his arms, now she might have wished for more eyes as Junan's peacock wore in his tail, so much does the knight seem to her, trait for trait, from head to foot, in formation, and gestures, in greatness and to rights. The first man on earth. Not that she just compared him to anyone standing between him and her heart, quite unsuspectingly she left her eyes alone, and mere vision is of course no sin. No scruple disturbed her in this lust of the eyes, the sweet deceit still plays so softly around her young breast, for what made her sure was that her heart was not on Alexis. Lucky for you, innocent Angela, that none of your eyes found tinder in Huan's bosom to catch. 
And of course it wasn't a miracle, for even if, as happened now and then, he met her halfway, it was the look of a hooded head, he would NT have liked to fall on a flower pot, on a wallpaper picture, any colder. An unknown thing that draws him to Baghdad like a magnet, seems to snap off the sharp point of all his eyes, and makes every attraction in him lost. In vain is her stature like a beautiful vase twisted by Cupid's own hand, in vain does the gently raised nose cling to the smooth brow in proud majesty, in vain does her breast, like a double hillock of fresh snow, around which a greying mist lift, the thin white veil, in vain is her skin as pure and smooth as a mirror of water, wherein Aurora, clad in roses, contemplates herself, in vain has beauty stamped her royal seal so visibly on every part, that her robe neither covers nor adorns her. In short, Angela with all her charms is beautiful and young for him in vain. And, far from stinging after the extension of the lovely presence, he sincerely wishes her back every moment in her bridegroom's arms, and in the end can't break free, since she doesn't say anything to tell her about it herself. Scarcely had he promised her guidance and protection, and her lips spilled out thanks for it, when suddenly a din of horses and horses in the courtyard of the castle interrupted her. It's already trampling loudly up the long spiral stairs. The young woman is startled, who can it be? But soon her terror melts into pleasure, for lo, and behold. Alexis enters. It had dawned on him, a little late, that it wasn't too glorious for him when Huan won his bright from the warrior, meanwhile, far from the shot, with his cavalry, he, her husband, in the shadow, frank and free, being tenderly dilute blood with palm wine even who will answer for him. The knight could even go away with his angel. Accordingly, as soon as his ear sang, he swung himself with his knighthood on horseback, and came at full trot, in case the danger through Huan's bravery was already past, to receive the fair one from the foreign knight to desire God's reward, and to be a little ashamed, do you think alone, he was a prince of Lebanon? Herr Huan unexpectedly spared the detour to go back to the Parmenthal with Angela, lets the handsome gentleman praise him in the bet. And feels just as good about it as if he had been scolded. And now, to complete the benefit, by the power of the ring, by invisible hands with everything that pleases the palate, a large round table is occupied in abundance. Ah, calls the beautiful bride, I almost forgot, Sir Knight, before we sit down to eat, go and quickly unlock the giant's harem with your own hand, for fifty maidens are still kept beside me in this tower the loveliest girl's flower, a veritable bed of tulips. He had saved them for his Mahom to sacrifice, I think. The harem opens, and, in full finery and colourful, lovely crowds, shows a true picture of Maham's merry heaven. Herr Huan leaves all the ladies under the protection of the beautiful gentleman, and has already ridden far away, while everything behind him is still noisy and buzzing, to at least ask for the honour of his presence at the table. Already crept, while the evening red melted into grey, the still moon was rising on the horizon, when Huan, because his horse could no longer walk, decided to rest in a beautiful place. He looks round the green earth for a camp, while his old man takes care of the horses. Suddenly, very close. A splendid tent stands before his eyes. A rich carpet lies, as far as it spreads, spread out on its floor, covered all around with cushions which, as if inspired by inner life. Gently billow at every pressure. A table of jasper, which is supported by a golden tripod, stands in the middle, and whatever makes the food-loving stomach a table of gods, the meal is served. The knight stands frozen, beckons to Shirazmin and asks him what he sees. Oh, that's easy, he replies, to see, friend Oberon is obviously nearby. Without him we wouldn't have spent the night instead of sinking into swans down, on our mother's lap so gently. That's what I call thinking about his friends. Come, dear sir, after this long journey, rest tastes sweet, let yourselves be quickly ungirded. You see, the beautiful dwarf spared no diligence, although in flight to entertain us splendidly. Herr Huan follows the advice. They both lie down half sitting around the table, and feast gallantly, also, while singing happy songs from Gascon, the cup is diligently empty and keeps filling up. Soon, unnoticed. The soft hand of sleep loosens the gently slackened bond of nerves. 
As if from the highest sphere, the loveliest music in the air fills still space. It sounds as if every leaf on every tree had become a throat, and Mara's angelic sound, the magic of all souls, resounded a thousand times from all these throats. Gradually the sweet harmony sank, equally full, but always weaker, down to the murmur of the gentlest summer air, when hardly ever a leaf moves and the silver waves ripple around the nympho's knees in the quiet brook. The night, between sleep and wakefulness, hears them always blowing softly, until under their rocking the senses succumb unnoticed to slumber. He slept on in one, till, when the early rooster scents Aurora's rose horses, a wonderful dream shakes his heart. He thinks he's walking on an unknown path, on the bank of a stream, through shady fields, suddenly a godlike woman stands in front of him, in the big eye of heaven purest mildness, the love charm around her whole body. What he felt words cannot express, he who now felt Cupid's power for the first time, and breathless. Stunned with delight. His life all in his eyes, standing rooted in the ground, thinking to see her even after she had vanished, and, since the sweet delusion finally melts before him, nothing to see any more closes his eyes dying. Stunned, in palpable death, he lay there on the shore in his dream. When he thought he felt a warm hand touch his rigid heart. And, as if awakened from death, he got up and once again saw the beautiful woman standing by his side, who in his eyes resembled no mortal, and three times more beautiful, as he thought, and fairer than he saw her for the first time. Silently they both looked at each other, with looks that said infinitely more strongly what their lips did not yet dare to utter. A heaven was opened to him in her eyes, where the soul is immersed in a sea of love. Soon the excess of lust becomes pain, he sinks in the urge of unstoppable urges in her arm, and presses his heart to her breast. He feels the nympha's heart beating in his bosom, the lucky one. How fast, how strong, how warm! And suddenly the day ceases, on black clouds rolls the thunder's chariot of fire, howling loudly, the storm's wild swarm trembles. The nympha is quickly torn from his arm in the whirlwind by invisible power and thrown into the flood of the nearby river. He hears her anxious screams, wants to go, oh hell! And can't! Stands, lifeless with terror, rigid like an image on a tombstone. In vain he strives. Gasps, and fights with arm and leg, he thinks he's stuck in ice up to his neck, looks out of the waves as they stretch out their arms pleadingly. And can't scream, not like love's fury spurs him on to plunge into the flood after her. Lord! Sherisming calls to him, as he hears his anxious snorting, wake up, wake up. A bad dream constricts your throat. Away, spirits, make room for me, Shrek Huan, do you also want to rob me of my shadow? And angry he starts up from his dream face, his faltering heart still beats in the fear of death, he stares out into the daylight, and cold sweat lies on his pale cheeks. That was a difficult dream, the old man calls out to him, you probably lay on your back for too long. A dream? Sighs Seguin's son with less wild looks, that's it. But a dream that robs my heart of peace forever. God forbid that, my best sir. Tell me seriously speaks the knight earnestly don't you believe that dreams now and then of the future teach us? One has examples, sir, and truly, since I have been accompanying you, I have not denied anything, the old man replies to him. But if I'm supposed to confess the pure truth to you right away, then I'll say freely, I do nt think much of dreams. Flesh and blood has. At least with me, it's play as often as I dream, our elders knew this well, and taught it to us in well-known rhymes. Meanwhile, if you trust me the content of your dream, I might be able to rhyme you better. I want that too, says Huan, without hesitation. Scarcely does the morning ray redden the top of that tree. We have time to work. Just hand me the cup first, so that I can strengthen my spirits, it still weighs heavily on my chest. While the wonderful cup refreshes the night, the old man looks at him quietly, as one who does not want to like it, to see the brave son of the brave Seguin weaker than befits a man. E.Y. he thinks to himself, shaking his head when he wakes up to make so much work out of a dream. But, because that's the way it is, it's always good for breakfast. Canto 4. The paladin now begins his dream story as follows, Whatever you, my good Sherisman, 
may think in your heart of what I am about to tell you, it is no poem that I, thank God. I am still a pure youth in body and mind, the way you see me here. Before that day in all my life. Never before did my unabashed heart give way to love. True, there were many beautiful maidens at my mother's court, and there was no lack of opportunities that easily tempt a boy to dally, especially when playing pawns, there was sometimes also a garter to untie, but the fairest foot left my imagination in proud rest, and if it had been Ginevra's foot, it was a foot, that's all I thought of it. That I saw so many open bosoms and bare shoulders from childhood could also be a reason. Habit is like Medusa in this piece, and for the fairest itself it turns us to stone. But what use was it to me to have remained free until my two tenth year? My hour has come too. Oh friend. My destiny was to love for the first time in a dream. Yes, Sherismin, now I have seen you, you from the stars crown me victor, I saw her and, without resisting, lost my heart to her at first sight. You say it was a dream? No, man. A ghost can't dig tracks that deep. And if you call me a fool a thousand times. She lives, I had her, and must have her again. Oh, if only you had seen the lovely angel like I do. Although, if I could grind. I put it before you, as glowing as it still hovers in front of my forehead, and I'm sure it burned your old heart to a charcoal. Oh, that only something had remained for me that received life from her. Oh. Only the bouquet of flowers on her breast. What wouldn't I give for it? Imagine a woman in the purest youthful light, woven from rose glow and lily snow after a prototype from up there, give their structure the finest balance, a quiet smile hovered on her face, and every charm, exalted by majesty, awakens and at the same time frightens the lascivious desire, think everything, and you hardly have the shadow of her. And now, gently enticed by her sweet glances, to press to my bosom this lovely woman, who seemed only the air-like form of an angel, to feel her heart overflowing in mine, it is possible that I did not faint with delight? Come now, and speak coldly to me, it was a dream. How stale, how empty and dead is my previous whole life next to such a dream. Once again, Shirazmin, it was no shadow play in the seat of fancy poured out of wine vapour. An infallible feeling tells me she lives, she was born for me. Maybe it was Oberon who made them appear. Is it delusion, oh leave it to me. The deception is so cute. Yes, nothing delusional. Can such a dream deceive, oh it is all delusion. So the truth can lie. The old man wags his doubtful head, as if someone were telling you a wondrous thing, of which you believe nothing in your heart, although you have no reason to deny it. What do you think? Asks the knight. That's just it. What embarrasses me, replies the unloved man, I would certainly like to make some objections, but what's the use in the end than that I grieve you? Only, beforehand, because your princely word binds you once against Karl, so, I thought, we should continue the march to Baghdad. Perhaps the magic will fade on the way, perhaps that Oberon will do his best, and unexpectedly the dream princess will find himself. In the meantime, dear sir, Hope is good for you, so hope. At the very least, one makes red blood. As the squire speaks this, the knight stands there with bowed brow. For suddenly the scene had reversed itself in his lovesick brain. Ah! He says, do not deceive me with false consolation. Hostile stars are above me. What can I hope for? Speak. The storm that tore her from my breast. Alas, makes me know too much of my fate. She was torn from me. She still stretches out her arms against me from the flood, my blood still stagnates with fear and alas. As if chained to the ground, I stood there, powerless to save her. That was in a dream, says Shirazmin, what are you grieving for without need and a black foreboding? A dream never fails. The best thing, believe me, is to take only what pleases us from it. That in your dreams a well-disposed spirit dismisses the future queen from your heart, he has done well. Such a thing can be believed, and in short, we now accept it as the bare truth. But the current, the whirlwind, the screws in hand and foot, the dream has added. In my younger years, when the nightmare pressed me, things like this often happened to me. 
There, for example. A black shaggy bear runs in my way while I walk. Heaven knows where from. In terror I grab my sword and draw, and draw, in vain. A sudden inability unties every sinew in all my limbs, watching the bear grow seven times as big, opens a jaws as hideous as hell, I flee and I'm scared, and I can't move. Another time, when you dream of a supper going home, at an old lady's house, suddenly a small window shutter creaks, and a nose sticks out as long as your arm. You try, half frozen with terror, to escape from her, and in front and behind stand their ghosts, who look you in the face, and stretch out fiery tongues far from long necks. In mortal fear you press yourself sideways against the wall opposite and a skinny hand slides through a round hole down your spine, cold as ice, and seeks around you to pinch you here and there. Every hair on your head turns up the tip, every way to flee is denied, the alley is visibly getting narrower, the hand is always frostier, the nose is always longer. Such things, as I have said, come across often and much. However, in the end it's just a farce that night ghosts make up in our skulls, the nose along with the fear disappears when you wake up. In your place, I don't think about the thing any further, and I'd stick to what the dwarf promised me. Fresh on. I guess what? It would end badly if we didn't find the lady back in Baghdad. At this word the knight leaps up, blown by fresh courage, as if he had dreamed nothing. Neighing towards the morning air, his racer is already saddled and bridled. He swings up, and as he looks back out of the field, the tent is gone, in a wink it rose from the lawn, in a wink it was all blown away. They now followed the course of the high Euphrates, sheltered from the sun by palm trees and bushes, through the most beautiful country in the world, silently, nobody spoke a word, although there was no lack of material to speak, for everyone was engrossed in other worries. The pure air, the pleasant morning, the joyful song of the birds, the quiet course of the river, awakens both imaginations from quiet slumber. The knight sees nothing worth seeing in her magic mirror but the beloved image. He paints the goddess on his shiny shield, climbs the steepest hill on her trail of the Taurus. Climbs. Questioning her, to Merlin's terrible grave, fights the giants and the dragons, who watch over the castle in which she languishes, and fought them from all hell. Meanwhile, in imaginary bliss, he presses the hard-won bride to his bosom. Gazes unnoticed at the banks of the Garonne, where as a child he plucked the first bouquet, from the banks of Euphrates the old man is enraptured. No, he thinks, nowhere does our lord's sun shine so mildly as where it first shone on me, no meadow so laughing, no other green so fresh. You little place, where I sucked the first light, felt the first pain, the first joy, be inconspicuous, unknown, my heart remains forever in your favour, feels secretly drawn to you everywhere, feels itself even in paradise but banished from you, oh, at least I would not like to deceive me from thinking that I will one day lie in your lap with my fathers. In such daydreams the space that separates them from Baghdad disappears unnoticed, until now the midday heat drives them into a forest that protects them from the heat. They still rested around an old tree, where dense moss swells into a soft seat, and Oberon's cup refreshes the dry palate, when. Just as it is being filled for the third meal. A dreadful cry roars in their ears. They jump up. The knight takes his sword and flies there, from where the clamour sounds. And look. A Saracen on horseback, attacked by a lion, still fights out of desperation, exhausted in strength and courage, with a weak fist. Already his steed staggers, half torn to pieces, and rolls over with him in a stream of blood, and has bitten through the pole for fear. Snorting ferociously, the lion lunges at his opponent, a flame of fire shoots out of every gaze. Meanwhile Huan still goes sideways into his dewlap. The prince of animals, who was annoyed by such a greeting, answered it with a long scratch, after which the knight's blood flowed from a thousand little fountains, if Angulafa's ring had not ruled over him, the lion would have split him in two in one go. Lord Huan gathers together what strength he can, for his death flushes in the lion's eyes and strikes his short sword with might and mane in his neck. In vain does the tail swing to a blow, from which, if the knight had not jumped back, he lay half shattered, in vain the fearful paw still looms, a trick by Sherisming kills him on the spot. The Saracen according to the rich stones that glitter high on his turban. 
A man of importance seemed still sweating with fear. The knight slowly lead him by the arm to the runes in whose umbrella they lay, the golden cup is handed to him to strengthen him, and the old man speaks in Arabic, Lord, indeed, you have to give thanks to the God of Christians. With mischievous eyes, the hero takes the cup full from Huan's hand, and when he brings it to the rim of his lips, the wine runs dry, and the cup becomes glowing in his fist, the avenger of inner wickedness. He throws it far away, roaring loudly, and stamps and rages and blasphemes terribly. Lord Huan, who dreads listening to him any longer, draws his sacred sword to convert the hero. Alone, the rogue who keeps himself overpowered has no desire to resist, like a hunted ostrich he runs into the nearby field, where both horses graze in the grass. He jumps up on Huan's tack, grabs him by the manet, and with the reins draped he runs away, in such fear and haste, as if he were sitting between the wings of stormy winds. The adventure was certainly annoying, but what was the use of chasing after the yummy? Luckily something resembling a mule could be bought in the next village for little money. The poor beast, more transparent than glass, seemed scarcely animated enough to reach Baghdad, but the old man's spine still seems weaker than to grope after his master on foot. So after the desired port, both of them continued the nightly procession as best they could. The chariot of the sun is already hovering at the limits of heaven. Suddenly they see, from afar in the wide valley, crowned with countless towers, the city's queen gleaming in the evening glow, and, through a paradise of eternally fresh green, the broad stream of the swift tiger flee. A wondrous mixture of terror and delight, secret forebodings, and strange shudders oppress the knight's heart, since the scene attracts him. Where more his word and traditional courage than Charles S. command drives him to withstand a daring of which is hardly possible a better target to see than sudden death. The danger was always certain, but it never seemed so great as when it was near. He sees with its golden battlements, like a castle of the gods, in terribly proud splendor, the throne of the emirs, which makes Asia tremble, and says to himself, and you, what are you going to do? He is taken aback. But soon his senses will be strengthened again by the courage of faith that has brought him so far, and a voice seems to reach him quietly, he will see those he loves within those walls. Up, he calls, Sherismin, unfurl all sails. You see the goal of my long run, we must reach Baghdad before dark night. Now it's going at the sharpest trot, so that horse and rider whimper. The squire pityingly pours some wine from Oberon's cup onto his animal's tongue, there, he says, drink, you good. Faithful boy. The cup does not dry up for your kind. He was right. No sooner does the mule's tongue suck in the sweet dew of magic gold, as longingly as a burnt-out stone, then a stream of fire shoots through veins and bones with all enlivening momentum, excited with new strength. Refreshed in heart and lungs, it runs away with him like a wind chime, and before the day is out they are in Babylon. They still strayed back and forth in its first streets, ignorant in the twilight, as strangers who only let themselves be guided by chance, then along the way came a little mother walking by her staff, with grey hair and long withered cheeks. Hey mother, be so good, Sherismin yells at her, and show us the way to a ham. The old woman stands leaning on her crutch, and lifts her shaky head to look at the strangers. Hair friendling, she says, it's quite a long way from here to the next ham but when you are tired and little is enough for you, come into my hut, there is milk and bread at your service, and a good heap of fresh straw, and grass for your cattle, you rest, and then move on tomorrow morning. With many thanks for your hospitably offering follow Huon. No camp seems bad to him, where friendliness and loyalty guard the open door. The new Borsis hurries up the litter. Throws thyme and orange blossoms from her little garden, serves up rich milk full of foam and juicy peaches, and figs fresh from the tree, lamenting that the almonds didn't turn out for her recently. The prince thinks he never had such a pleasant meal in his lifetime. What hospitality lacks, the good old man makes up for intimacy. The gentleman. She says, are just coming to a big party. How so? You don't know? It's the only thing spoken in Baghdad, our lord's daughter will be given out tomorrow. The sultan's daughter? And to whom? The bridegroom is one of the nephews of the sultan, prince of the Druzes, rich and fair, 
and on the chessboard none shall surpass him, in a word, a prince whom all the world considers perfectly worthy of Fairesia. And yet, said in the closest confidence, she would rather be married to a Lindworm. That's what I call strange, replies the paladin, you won't make us believe it so easily. I'll say it again, before the princess lets him come so close, she embraces a dragon, that's all there is to it. I've known the how and when of the thing for a long time. I've got a clean mouth, to be sure have to promise, yes, give me your hand, and you shall know everything. It may surprise you how a woman like me comes to such things, which are hidden even from the princely tribe and are otherwise male. So know then, I am the mother of the nurse of the beautiful Regia, to whom she counts for everything, although sixteen whole years have passed since Fatmi breastfed her, now you can easily see where I sometimes learn things from. People know that for years the caliph, proud of his daughter, often called her to table at festivals he gave, where beautiful men presented themselves to her. But town and country also know that that no one ever particularly found favour with her, she seemed to look at her less with girlish horror than with contempt. Meanwhile it was believed that she could stand Babe Khan that is the name of the prince whom the sultan chose to be his daughter above all others. Not that her heart beat faster when he came or when he departed, not to avoid him diligently was that the highest thing he gained over her, alone, she wasn't taken with anyone else, love, one thought, would come after marriage. However, since an interval of a few weeks, everything has been reversed. Since then, Regia can hardly see the poor prince before her eyes. Her whole heart revolts when she only hears talk of marriage, and, unbelievably, a mere dream the fault of it. A dream? exclaims Huan all in fire, a dream. Shouts Scarismin, what a strange adventure. You dreamed, continues the old woman, that you were being hunted by Babe Khan in the form of a deer in a wild place. She ran down from a mountain in mortal fear, pursued by twenty dogs, the hope of escaping him was already gone. There came a beautiful dwarf in a phaeton, drawn by young lions, flew in full leap towards her. The dwarf in his small hand held a blossoming lily stalk, and by his side sat a strange young fant, in knightly garb, fair as a naked angel, his blue eyes and long yellow hair showed that Asia was not his native land, but, where he always came from, enough, her little heart was taken at first sight. The car stopped. The dwarf with his lily staff touched her, straight away the deer skin fell off, the beautiful Regia, at her rescuer's request, climbed into the carriage and, blushing, sat down between him and the one to whom her heart was devoted, although love and shame still fought in her bosom. The chariot drove sharply up the mountain, and bumped into a stone, and she woke up at it. Her dream was gone, but not from her heart the young man with the long yellow hair. His image, the source of sweet sorrows, always hovers before her day and night, and since that hour the Druze prince has been unbearable to her. She could neither hear nor see him without anger. Every effort was made to spy out the cause, in vain, she remained secret and mute and immobile. Only her nurse alone, of whom, as I said, I am the mother, finally knew how to find a way to wriggle out of her breast the strange secret that gnaws at her. You alone know whether damage that secretly pleases us can be healed with reasonable reasons. The poor lady hated herself, and wanted Fatmi to always flatter evil. Meanwhile the day that you dread so much drew nearer. Babe Khan, in order to gain more respect from the brittle bride, left little untried, only nothing wanted to succeed. As is well known, she was always very inclined towards the brave. He had never before shown himself in this light, let us, he said to himself, perform a deed to wring admiration from the insensitive. For some time now a monstrous beast had terrified the whole country, it fell in broad daylight into villages and towns, and ruthlessly choked cattle and people. They say it has dragon wings, and claws like a griffin and spikes like a hedgehog, be bigger than an elephant, and when it snorts, a storm will sweep through the whole country. No such beast had appeared since the dawn of man, nor was there a great prize set upon its head. Just because everyone values theirs more highly. No one feels like earning the money. Only Babe Khan thought it worth trying, by a daring deed, to dampen the fair's pride. He goes to the sultan in pomp, and covets the privilege of fighting the lion. And when he granted it, although not willingly, he mounted his best horse early this morning, 
and rode out. What happened next is unknown. Enough, he came back, luckily, on a stranger's horse, very quietly, without glory and without a claw from the monster. They say he lay down and took Beza as soon as he got home. With all this, the preparations for the wedding feast are now made with unprecedented splendor, it will inevitably happen tomorrow, and Rija will see herself in Barbican's hated arms the next night. Before this happens, Huan exclaimed quickly, before the great wheel of creation should stand still. The knight and the dwarf are also from the feast, believe me. The old woman is amazed at the word, and looks more closely at what she didn't particularly notice at first, the stranger's blue eyes and long yellow hair, and his knightly jewellery, and that he only spoke broken Arabic, and that he was more beautiful than any man who stabbed her in the eye, the quick word he spoke, and this resemblance. It seems strange to her. Where did he come from? Why? Who is he? Twenty questions for this purpose. Which were already on her tongue, Huan's earnestness choked. He acted as if he needed rest and lay down on his litter. The old woman wants him to have sweet dreams, and scuttles away, locking the door after her. But the door was wormy and had cracks. And cheekiness itches the ear of the good old man. She sneaks back, and presses her listening ear to a crack as hard as she can, and listens with open mouth and catches her breath. The stranger spoke loudly, and with what seemed to be heat, she heard every word, only, unfortunately. There was no sense in it for an old woman of Babylon, yet now and then, for comfort in this suffering, she can quite distinctly discern the name of Rija. How wonderfully my destiny unfolds! exclaimed Huan how truly did Oberyn speak, the people of earth are weak and blind to the future. Carl thinks he must have broken my neck, his mission is clearly aimed at my ruin, and blindly he merely does the will of fate, the beautiful dwarf stretches his lily staff, and guides me in my dreams to the source of my happiness. And that says Sherismin the maiden who took your heart in the dream is the very infante of the sultan, whom Charles made your bride, that everything is fitting. And that she. Two, burned up in your dreams, like you in her, in you, you could hardly believe something like that in his eyes. And yet, says Huan, the old woman did not invent it, fate itself tied the knot. Only how to dissolve it, that's the difficulty. That shouldn't bother me, replies Sherismin, Lord, may I boldly tell you my bad opinion. I made it short and cut it fresh in two. I let the squire on my left free his air pass and the caliph his teeth and held on to my dulcimine. Just think about it yourself, starting the ceremony with your head down in her presence, then asking the old man for four molars and a handful of beard, and even embracing his only child in front of his nose, by God. It really has no style. It is impossible for fate to want that we should so grossly shift our aim from ourselves. Luckily, Oberyn already saw the best. The main work is surely blowing the damsel away from the hair of the bridegroom, and the beautiful Rija will certainly help us herself as soon as she is reported from the old woman that the yellow hair is there. Meanwhile it is up to me to have two fresh nags ready to flee near by the garden of the Sarai. Mr. Sherismin, replies the knight it seems. Did you not remember that I gave Carl my word of honour? That what he commanded me to live up to the letter? There's not a jot of it, my friend. What can arise from it, may arise from it. It doesn't befit me to foresee things like that. In case of need replies Sherismin the dwarf must finally pull us out of the water. Gradually the old man falls asleep under these conversations. From Huan's eyes the sweet sleep remains banished throughout the night. Like a boat on high waves, his anticipating heart drives with impatient swaying on impetuously tossing thoughts, so close to the port so close and yet so far. It's a moment and seems like an eternity. Canto 5. Fled you too, O Rija, on your soft swans, the sweet sleep. You saw yourself caught in cliffs from which it seemed impossible to carve a path. Hateful and terrible is the festive red in the dawn sky, hateful the day that beckons to you at Hymen's altar. For a long time she tosses and turns, sighing, until finally, deafened by the inner turmoil of her soul, her head sinks down to her bosom. She falls asleep, and, to sustain her courage, weaves a new dream face in front of the brows of those above. 
she thinks, by moonlight, to sit in an arbor in the gardens of the harem, lost in fantasies of love. A sweet sorrow, a lovely, anxious longing lifts her breast, her eyes swim in tears while she thinks hopelessly of her youth. The restlessness rouses them. She runs, with hasty steps and searching eyes, through bushes, and fields of flowers, rushes breathlessly to all green huts, to all grottos, her eyes, wildly tender, and full of tears. Seem to beg the beloved image of all beings, often she stands anxiously still, and listens when only a shadow shakes, only a poplar rustles. Finally, as she turns to a place where a bright moonlight breaks through the night bushes, she believes, oh bliss. If no false shadow light blinds her fondly deceived eye, to see what she seeks. She sees and is seen, his fiery eyes meet their eyes. She rushes to him and remains standing, in shuddering delight, as if between shame and love, doubting. With open arms he flies towards her. She wants to escape and cannot move her knees. With difficulty she still hides behind a tree, and in the sweet fear the beautiful dream bursts. How she would have liked to call him back. She is angry with herself and with the hated tree, in vain she seeks to weigh herself again, contemplating him remains her only pleasure. The sun had soon completed the third part of its course, and it was still night by Regia, so great was her delight. To be able to continue the pleasant dream while still awake. But since she hasn't given any sign of life for too long, Fatmi finally approaches the golden bed, pushes back the curtain, and is amazed to find the lady awake and in the best of moods. I've seen him again, oh Fatmi, wish me luck, call Regia, I've seen him again. That would be says the wet nurse, and looks around with a sly look, as if she were trying to spy out the bird. The young lady laughs, hey, hey, how great is your joke? One would think that should be understood. Of course, I only saw him in a dream, but he must certainly be around here. I suspect he's not far away, and don't speak to me against it, if you love me. So I'll be silent. And why? What would be so daring about my hope in the end? Speak. How should I don't you cherish? The nurse sighs and still remains silent. What exceeds love's omnipotence? She is the lion tamer who protects me, and she will save me, I don't understand how. Are you silent? Are you sighing? Ah. Goodbye, good nurse, I understand what your silence is hiding from me. You hope nothing for my flame. I myself, I hope only because I lack better comfort. The hour is approaching, already my chains clink, and my ruin is certain. Only a miracle, oh fat me, can save me, only a miracle. If not, then it can. At this word she draws a dagger out of her bosom with fiery eyes. You see? This gives me courage. This lifts me up so much. With this I hope everything of fate. The nurse staggers back to her chair, turns deathly pale, and trembles like a reed. Oh! If this is all, God have mercy! She cries, and weeps and wrings her arms. The young lady presses her hand over her mouth, quiet, she says, get hold of yourself, and puts back the dagger in her bosom. You know, in the whole world I hate nothing more than this prince of the Druzes. Before he should have me before a poisonous newt should strike its sharp teeth in my breast. If my beloved does not come to deny him the robbery, what is left for me but my dagger? No sooner had she spoken the words than one hears a pounding on the wallpapered door that leads from the bedchamber into Phaeton's room. She goes. And after a little while comes back so quickly that she almost loses her breath from sheer haste and drunk with joy. Now we are relieved of all distress. Triumph. Princess, triumph. The knight is found in her nightgown, which scarcely envelops her beautiful body like a mist. She jumps out of the laces and happily falls around the nurse's neck. Found it. Where? Where is it? Oh my dream, you're not lying like that. The nurse, even overjoyed with joy, hardly has so much point in dressing the blissfully stumbling, half-naked dreamer in a great hurry. The old woman is then called in to tell her little tale herself. The good mother starts the thing at EY, and doesn't let the smallest circumstance be lacking, not a train, not a word that escaped her guest, 
is left out in the painting. It's him, it's him. We have our man, exclaims Fatmi, it couldn't be a better fit. The old woman is questioned again, must repeat three and four times what he did, said and said not, I have to mark him again and again from head to toe, feature by feature how yellow and long his hair, how big and blue his beautiful pair of eyes, and there's still something to catch up on that she missed out on in the hurry. While she is twenty years younger, the old woman is chattering, the beautiful bride's high curls are relaxing under Phaeton's fingers. Her black hair is plaited like a snail with pearls brighter than dew. Her ears, neck and belt are adorned with such shimmering stones that her eyes could hardly bear their brilliance in the sunshine. Perfect now, adorned by her flock of nymphos for the festival and dressed as a bride, the king's daughter presents herself like a sun, and lovely like a deer that grazes among roses. No I looked at her unblinded, although now they only saw girls' eyes, she alone seemed to know nothing about how the stars must be fading beside her. The fire that shines from her eyes, the impatience, the listening longing that swells her lips and grinds her tender cheeks with an unaccustomed purple, amazes her maidens. Is this the stubborn bride they begin to whisper to each other who dreaded this day so much yesterday? Meanwhile the emirs and viziers, adorned for the festival, gather in the proud wedding feast. The royal banquet is prepared, and, to the sound of trumpets, the caliph with his grey beard steps out of the golden door of the holy palace, surrounded by slaves of all kinds. The Druze prince, still a little pale in cheeks, comes behind him as a stately bridegroom. And opposite the ivory door opens from the harem. And the bride, more beautiful than the women in Maham's paradise, enters. A veil, like a silver-grey cloud, prevents the angel's face from revealing its full splendour in a dazzling way, and yet an unearthly light seems to fill the whole room as soon as they enter. The Druze's heart swells and sinks alternately as his eyes cling to her charms, he seeks in hers what he desires to see, alone, a look as cold as alpine ice is all he sees. But. The infatuated vanity, the self-deceiver flatters, that Regia only feigns the brittle look, Oh he thinks all the snow melts away overnight. Whether he hoped too much should not remain a secret. But without now describing unnecessarily how, after the imam said the prayer, they sat down at the table to the sound of drums and cornets, first his majesty, then on the right hand the bride, on the left the bridegroom, and a hundred things, who understand each other, it's time to look around for Huan again. He, as you remember, spent his night, hot with impatience, dizzy with foreboding, on his bedding not much more gently spent than one swayed by the storm in a masthead. But scarcely has Aurora's rose hand opened the gates to the day in its golden course, when a haze of poppies and lilacs and lilies descends on his eyes like a mist. He falls asleep, and still sleeps in one train, since the sun's chariot's flight half divided the sky. His old man meanwhile left to spy out the situation from the castle, and to provide what was necessary for the kidnapping work. Meanwhile, at the small hearth, at her midday meal, the good landlady, half grumpy, makes sure that her guest doesn't wake up for so long. At last she sneaks to the door to look through the cracks again, and fortunately for her cheekiness catches the very first moment when Huan's eyes unfold the golden day. Fresh. As young May joins the ranks when the nymphs dance with the graces, the handsome hero rises half-heartedly, and guesses what first catches his eye. A kaftan, such as only the highest emirs wear, when the court adorns itself for a festival, richly embroidered with pearls on a gold-flowered background, lies there shimmering before him, wrapped around a chair, a turban on it, as if woven from snow, and around him, to complete the emir, a diamond belt, on which a sabre hovers, so rich that sheath and hilt almost blind his eyes. For all the finery, from foot to head, the little boots made of gold-plated leather up to the diamond button of the high ostrich feather on the turban, nothing is missing. The good knight thinks he's still dreaming. Whence can such state come to him? The old woman stands amazed. That goes through magic, she calls, I would have heard about it otherwise. The dwarf, says Sherismin, is definitely there. The knight believes it too. And thinks. Through all the heroes in the courtyard this makes my way to the wedding hall. And in a flash kaftan, belt, and everything is done. The landlady dares to dress him properly. But what are we going to do with this turban? 
Cut off his beautiful yellow hair for his sake. Not for the world. Shut up. It goes in well, he seems to be bent on it with diligence. Mr. Huan now stood there, except for his lilla smooth beardless cheek, like a true sultan, while the mother looked at him all over and still had to clean him. Then, when the faithful sherrisman whispered something in his ear, he begins to leave, handing a bag of gold to the hostess in a friendly manner, and now, farewell, goodbye. To do nothing halfway is the art of noble spirits. A richly bridled steed stands before the old woman's door, and beside him two boys, handsome and delicate, in pieces of silver, who hold his golden reins. Mr. Huan swings up, the boys freshly ahead, and lead him on a side path, by the river, through blooming hedgerows, until they saw each other opposite the high castle. He has already passed through the first courtyard, dismounts in the second, and enters the third. He seems to be a wedding guest of the highest rank, and everywhere. Deceived by this appearance, the guard makes way for him. He strides free and proud, and approaches the gate of ebony. Twelve moors, like giants, stand with drawn iron to turn away the unauthorized from the entrance. Only the knight's state and royal glance, as he shows himself to the high gate, quickly pushes back the saber tips, which from afar bend towards him. The wings flap. His heroic heart beats high, as they close behind him, waving again. Above it, a colonnade bordered by gardens leads him to a door of overgolden bronze. It was a great volva, filled with slaves of all colors of Combabian race, who always starved here at the Fountain of Joy, and when a man clothed in Amir's splendor in her hollow eyes swelled, with looks that died in slavery, the arms opened standing with their breasts folded in a cross, and scarcely brave enough to look behind him. Already cymbals, drums, whistles, singing and strings are sounding from the wedding banquet. Already the sultan's head is nodding doubly heavily with the smell of wine. And more freely the joy is already beginning to get out of hand, the bride alone does not share the pleasure that glows in the bridegroom's eyes, when, just as she is staring at her plate, Mr. Huan enters the room with noble freedom. He approaches the table, and all eyebrows rise in astonishment to look at the stranger. The beautiful Regia, who thinks her dreams, still keeps her serious gaze on the plate, even the caliph, busy emptying his cup, lets nothing disturb his sacrifice, only Babe Khan, whom no good spirit warns of his impending fall, twists his long neck. Immediately the hero recognizes yesterday's loose man, who presumed to blaspheme the Christian's god, it is he who sits on the left of the golden chair and bends his neck even towards punishment. Rapidly, like the flames of heaven, the rich saber flashes, the hero's head flies, and his blood spatters the table and the one lying at his side, raging high. How the terrible head of the gorgon in Perseus' fist robs the wildly indignant crowds of life at the very sight of him, the king's castle still steams, the rebellion still swells, the lust for murder snorts untamed in the bosom of the barbarians, but Perseus hardly shakes his snake-haired head. So the dagger stares in every bloody hand. And every murderer stands spellbound to the rock, so here too, at the sight of such bold treacherous deeds, the happy blood falters in every guest. They rush up from their seats as if they saw a ghost, and take up their swords. Alone, paralyzed by terror, the arm went limp in the drawing, and every sword stuck, impotent rage in the stare. Speechless, the caliph sank back in his chair. The uproar that angers the whole soul, frightens Risha from her dreams, she looks around in dismay, what is the cause of it, and when she turns to Huan's side, how does he feel when he sees her? It's her, it's her, he exclaims, and delightedly lets the bloody steel and his turban fall, and she recognizes how his curls flow. It's him, she also begins to call out, but shame chokes the sound in her rosy mouth. How did her heart beat when he came flying, in the face of the whole table, took her in his arms boldly in love, and when she, now glowing, now pale as a bust, squirmed between love and virginal grief in his arms, kissed her on the lips. He had already kissed her a second time, but where did you get the wedding ring from? Luckily the ring is on his finger, which he took from the giant in the iron tower. Although still little acquainted with its value, the worst seemed scarcely inferior to him in appearance. But out of necessity he now puts it on the young lady's finger, and says, 
I shall make you my dear bride. With these words he kisses the softly conquered beauty for the third meal on her lovely lips. Ha! Screams the sultan. And crunches and stamps on the ground with impatience, you suffer that the dog of a frank mocks me like that. Seize him. Delay is treason. And, extorted drop by drop, his black blood reconciles the tremendous deed. Suddenly a hundred blades flashed in Huan's eyes, and he scarcely caught before they rushed at him from all sides in the storm, his thrown sword. He brandishes it menacingly. But the beautiful Regia, stunned by love and fear, wraps one arm around him, turns her breast into a shield for his, the other arm masters his sword. Back, daring, she screams wildly. Back. There is no way to this bosom than through mine. She calls loudly, and you, scarcely as gentle as Cupid's lovely bride, despair now casts Medusa's eyes. Measure, stop, she calls to the emirs, back. Oh be nice, my father. And, oh you, whom fate has given me as my husband, oh save my blood in the lives of both of you. Free. The sultan's rage and threats are getting the upper hand. The heathen are penetrating. The knight flashes his sword in vain, Regia is still holding his arm. Your fearful screams pierce his heart. What is left for him to protect her but his horn of ivory? He puts it to his mouth and, with a gentle breath, forces the most beautiful sound out of his crooked belly. Suddenly the drawn steel falls from every fist, in rapid frenzy the emirs clasp their hands in dancing rings, a loud huzzah sounds back an alien through the sal and young and old, that has feet, must leap, the power of the horn leaves them no choice, only Regia, dismayed at seeing this marvellous work, dismayed and happy at the same time, remains standing beside Huon. The whole divan turns in a circle, dizzy, the old basses snap the beat to it, and, as if on slippery ice, one sees the imam himself waltzing with a hemming. Nor estate nor age is saved, even the sultan can't resist the lust, grabs his grand vizier by the beard, and wants to teach the old man one more leap. The unheard enthusiasm soon lures crowds of chamberlains out of every front room, then the women folk, and finally even the guards. They all take hold of the merry frenzy, the magic frenzy sets the whole harem free, the gardeners themselves in their brightly coloured aprons can be seen falling into the ranks with young nymphs. As one who scarcely believes her eyes, Regia stands almost breathless. What a miracle! She exclaims, and just at that moment when nothing but this could save us both. A good genius is with us. Queen, replies the hero. Meanwhile through the crowd of dancers comes his faithful scarismin, running against them with fate. Come, he wheezes, dear sir. We ain't got time to watch the dancing, the horses are ready, the whole castle is mad the doors are all open and unguarded, what are we hemming I also met Frau Fatmen on the way, packed like a resilient animal to flee. Be calm, says the hero, it's not time to go yet, the hardest thing has to happen first. The beautiful Regia turns pale at this word, her anxious eyes seem to ask and plead, why forgive? Why forgive on the steep bank of the sinking? Oh let us hurry with wing steps before the dizzy spirit melts away, which binds the senses of our enemies. But Huan, unmoved, is content to press her hand tightly to his heart with a look full of love. Gradually the power of the horn failed, the heads dizzy, the legs grew weak, not a thread was dry on all the dancers, and in the breathless chest swollen, the thick blood began to stagnate. Unfree pleasure became torment. Soaked as if he were about to step out of a bathtub, the caliph staggers onto his ottoman. Every moment falls, rigid and senseless, where the upholstery rises swelling around the wall, one dancer after the other. Emirs and slaves fall wriggling next to the goddesses of the Sarai, as it seems by chance, as if a whirlwind had shaken them down, so that the groom and the favourite gasp on one couch at the same time. Lord Huan makes use of the stillness that rests on the whole soul, leaving his queen close by the door, under the protection of faithful Sherismin whom he commanded to be on his guard, in any case, give him the horn of ivory, and then approach the spot where the caliph, still weak and weak from the ball, threw himself down on an upholstered throne. In dull silence, with outstretched wings, Lays's breathing lies around all around. 
the dancers all, heavy with sleep and dizziness, strive to open their eyes to look at the stranger who, after such a deed, slowly approaches the supporting caliph with an unarmed hand and begging gestures. What do you think will become of all this? He drops on one knee before the monarch, and with the hero's soft tone and cold gaze he begins. Emperor Karl, whose servant I am, sends his greetings to the Lord of the Orient, and begs you forgive me. It's hard for me to say. But to lean my lord's mouth and arm is my duty, four of your molars and a handful of hair from your silver beard. He speaks it and is silent, and stands calmly waiting for the sultan's answer. But where do I get the breath to describe to you in words the wrath of the old gentleman? How his features grow wild, how his nose snorts. With what impetuosity he leaps from the throne. How his eyes are pounding, and how impatient his veins are bulging. He stares around, wants to curse, and the fury breaks every word foaming on his blue lips. Up, slaves. Rip his heart out of his ribs. Chop him up limb by limb. Draw off his wicked blood with ooze. Away with him into the flames. The ashes will scatter to all winds, and his emperor Karl, may God pray for him damn it. What? Such a proposal? Me? In my own house? Who is Karl that boasts against me? And why doesn't he come when he lusts so much for my beard and my teeth? And dares to take them off himself? A man doesn't have to be right under his cap, replies an old Khan, at most, one desires something like that at the head of three hundred thousand men. Caliph of Baghdad. Says the knight with noble pride, let all be silent here, and hear me. It has been heavy on me for a long time, Karl's order, and my word. Destiny's compulsion is bitter, but to evade its supremacy, where is the power on earth? What it obliges us to do, to suffer, that must be done, that must be suffered. Here I stand, Lord, a mortal like you, and stand alone, my word, in spite of all your guards, to make good with my life, yet honour allows me one more proposal. Make up your mind to depart from Mahomed, lift up the Holy Cross, the noble sign of Christians, in Babylon, and accept the true faith, so you have done more than Karl asked of you. Then I'll take it upon myself to absolve you completely of any other demand, and let him first break my neck who demands more. As single and as young as you see me here, what you have already experienced, proclaim loudly enough that there is one with me who can do more than all your hordes. Now choose the best part. If you are wise. Meanwhile, like a messenger from heaven in strength and beauty, the youthful hero, heedless of the spears that threatened him, speaks so manfully, presents himself so bravely, Rija bends from afar, with glowing red delighted cheeks, lovingly her beautiful neck after him, but shuddering how the knot of all the wonders should unfold at last. Herr Huan had hardly spoken the last word, so old Sketch starts screaming, stamping, and pounding like a possessed man, and his mind is completely off track. The heroes all jump up from their seats in mad zeal, with snorts and thunders, and lances, sabres, daggers pierce Maham's enemy from all sides. But Huan, before they reach him, quickly snatches the pole from one of the men's hands, beats it around like a club, and, always fighting, gradually pulls himself against the wall. A large golden bowl, taken from the bar, serves him both as a shield and as a weapon there are already many wriggling on the ground around him who have come too close to his anger. The good Sherismin, who stands far at the door to protect the fair ones, thinks he sees his first master in the throng of battle, and joyfully indulges in a moment of sweet feasting for the eyes, but soon the pleasant delusion of the young lady's fearful cries dispels, he sees the hero's rush, sees his master's danger, immediately applies the hift horn and blows it, as if he cares about blowing up the dead. The whole castle resounds with it and cracks, and straightaway the most terrible night devours the day, ghosts can be seen like rapid lightning, and the rocky ground of the castle sways under constant thunder. The heathen's heart is sickened, they stagger like drunkards, hearing and sight perish, sword and spear slip from limp hands, and in groups everything lies rigid around. The sultan, dazed by so many marvels, seems to wrestle with death in the last battle, his arm is nerveless, his breathing heavy, his pulse beats feebly, and finally not at all. Suddenly the storm is silent, 
A sweet whispering breeze fills the valley with the fresh scent of lilies, and, like an angel's image above a burial tomb, Oberon now lets himself be seen on a little cloud. A loud shriek of terror and lust escapes from the Persian woman, an involuntary horror combats the shy trust in her. Her arms folded over her breast. She stands glowing beside the young man to whom she gave her heart. And, virginally aware of her sweet guilt, scarcely dares to lift her eyes to her rescuer. Good, Huan, says the spirit, you have redeemed your word of honor, I am satisfied with you. This beautiful woman has been granted you as a knightly thank you. But, before you depart from this place, consider Reja what she decides to do, before she perhaps atones with fruitless remorse the hasty choice of seduced eyes. Fate leaves her free to stay or go. Forsaking so much glory, forsaking court and throne from which she was born, to dare, on an uncertain voyage, into the wide sea of the world with one man, to live with him alone, with him the inconsistency of earthly happiness, with him the blows of fate, and oh. Often the blow comes from a loving hand. So it's well worth asking your heart carefully beforehand. Still, Reja, if the scales terrify you, it's still up to you to betray the desire of love. They only slumber who lie here as if in the grave, they revive as soon as my staff awakens them. The Sultan will be happy for what happened to you, forgive me, despite what he lost in the process, and Reja will see herself worshipped by all the world again as before. Here the beautiful dwarf was silent. And, paler than death. Huan stands there to receive the verdict. With which Oberyn, the cruel. Threatened. The fire in his cheeks sinks to ashes. Too noble or proud, perhaps to bribe a doubting heart with words of love, he stares at the earth with deeply restrained pain, and lets not a glance speak to his advantage. But Reja, red hot from his first kiss, needs no more tinder to heat the flame. How little do you think she still has to leave in order to have everything she loves in Huan? Red to the tips of her fingers with shame and love, she hides her face in a downpour of tears in his arm, while, beating high with delight, her heart presses up to press against his. An Oberon moves the staff of lilies gently towards them, as if he wanted to place his blessing on their heart's union, and a tear falls from his eye on both foreheads. So hurry on love's wings, he speaks, you lovely couple. My chariot stands ready, before the next light scatters the army of shadows, to bring you safely to Ascalon's beach. He spoke it, and ere the last word had died away, it vanished from their sight. As if awakened from a dream, Huan's beautiful bride stands, eagerly sucking in the sweet scent that still fills the air. Then a shy look falls on her father, who seems to stare as if in a slumber of death. She sighs, and sad sorrow mixes bitterness in her heart's happiness. She wraps herself up. Her Huan, whose senses are sharpened by love, does not soon see her heart oppressed, her beautiful eyes dull, so he presses her with tender force, his right arm wrapped around her body, outside the soul. Come on, he says, a the night surprises us, and every arm awakens, the one that loves us, the spirit bound with magic sleep. Come, let us flee before a new enemy tries to bar our way to flight, and rest assured, once we are safe, our protector will also take care of these sleepers. Saying this, he carries her with youthful strength down the marble steps to the chariot that Oberon procures for her flight, and a sweeter burden has never been borne by a man. The whole castle is terribly silent and empty like a crypt, and like corpses lie the keepers to and fro in deep sleep, nothing hinders the flight of love, the carriage is mounted but the young lady doesn't trust the knight alone, with Scarismin, the nurse hastily gets in too. She, who sees so many miracles for the first time, the poor woman does not know what is happening to her. How is it when she looks backwards and sees, instead of horses, for swans in front of the carriage, ruled by a child? How does her skin shudder? When she feels herself lifted up and carried through the air, and can hardly breathe dead, and cannot understand how, without overturning, so heavily loaded, the carriage rises. And, more constantly than a boat, floats on light clouds. When night finally fell upon her, what a miracle that fear finally conquered shame, and Fatmi snuggled up to Sherismin so tightly, as if to sleep against her dear bed. Presumably that the man willingly submitted, in such cases the heart likes to get involved, 
however, it is to the glory of the valiant old man that he endured this fire like pure gold. The young couple was in a completely different mood, which Amor now seemed to be leading away with swans with his mother. Whether your magic carriage takes its course on familiar tracks, whether through the air, whether it rolls or swims, whether slow or fast, with horses or swans, gently or hard, with or without a ride, you are not aware of any of this. A new dream of bliss, a blissful rapture into paradise, she thinks her present state, they can do nothing but look at each other silently, with never satisfied looks. Press one another's warm hand to the full heart in sweet fervor. And while heaven and earth vanished from their eyes, and they were the only ones left, ask, is it, or are we still dreaming? Are we in one wagon so it wasn't a dream when I saw you in the dream? Everyone exclaimed so it was Rija. Was it Huan? And a god let me find you. So wonderfully united, never, ever to part. Can the heart contain so much bliss? And then again always looking at each other, again hand for hand pressed to mouth and heart. In vain does night veil the circle of air with mist-laden wings, this does not hinder love's sight, a supernatural light shines from her eyes, in which the souls themselves are reflected in one another. Night is not night for them, Elysium and heaven is all around and around, her sunshine pours out from within, and every moment unfolds new senses. Gradually the intoxication of bliss lulls the full heart into magical slumber, the eyes droop, the senses become mute, the soul seems freed from the body, limited in one feeling, so tightly embraced by it. So deeply breathed and penetrated by him. Limited in one, merely feeling in that one, but, oh that one, how limitless. Canto 6. Scarcely did Aurora begin to chase away the shadows, and unlock the gates today with her rose-handed hands, when the swan chariot, not far from the sea-washed beach of Ascalon, under the umbrella of tall palm trees, suddenly stopped. A gentle push awakens our double couple, this one from slumber's lap, and that one from love's waking dreams. The sultan's daughter trembles in sweet terror, while for the first meal, illuminated by the morning, the limitless ocean of the world paints itself in her eyes. Full of wonder, the extensive view roams unchecked over these water heights, the immensity seems opened up before her, yet, in the midst of the joy, she shudders at seeing herself so small in the immensity. A grey veil clouds her gaze. Where am I? She calls. But, Herr Huan, who stands by the wagon with open arms to carry her into the green, brings the floating spirit quickly back to itself. Bay, he speaks, without fear, my life pressing his mouth warm with love and longing on her bosom, lifting his silent sigh bay without fear, you are in my arms. With bliss she now feels herself completely surrounded by her love, completely sunk in his arms, and young Ivy cannot cling to the trunk more fervently than she folds her round arms around his body. So he hastens to the palms with the sweet booty. Then on soft moss she sits in the shade, herself by her side, and traded his place for no sultan's lot. Soon his old man will also come to them with Fatmi, determined, he and she, to serve the dear couple to the last breath. Scarcely had Sherismin in the green bay of his master, and Fatmi seated close to the young lady's knee. Swift, like a flash of fancy, came the beautiful dwarf swam through the air. Mild light broke from his eyes through friendship's softly clouded grief, and as he came nearer, she saw a casket thickly studded with gems, shining like a sun in his left arm. Friend Huan, said the spirit, take this from my hand, although Carl expressly does not oblige you to do so, if you see him again, it will serve him as a pledge that you will literally deliver what he desires. You notice though in Rija's presence it was not fit to reveal aloud that the caliph's teeth and beard wrapped in cotton were in this casket. While the sultan was still lying rigid in his armchair, one of Oberon's invisible companions had quickly set to work, and accomplished everything without scissors and pelican. Hurry now, he continued, before chasing after you the sultan is gaining time. There in the roadstead lies a ship that will fly with you to Lepanto in six or seven days without harm. There you will find. As soon as you arrive, something else ready that will take you to Salern, and then, as quickly as love and longing inspire you, took the straight path to Rome. And deep, O oh Huan, let it be imprinted in your mind, until the pious Pope Sylvester on your hearts consecrates the covenant of heaven, 
consider yourselves brothers and sisters. Don't crave the forbidden sweet fruit ahead of time. For know that as soon as you try it, Oberon would have to part with you forever. He says it. And sighs, and quiet sorrow swells in his eyes, he bids her come near him, and kisses her on the forehead, and as they looked up, it dissipated like a cloud from their sight. The golden day veils his face, it rustles sadly, like sighs, through the palm trees, and land and sea, dull and deeply calmed, seem to smoke formlessly in a cloudy fragrance. A strange woe, a silent trepidation oppresses the lovely pair, they look at each other with pale cheeks, choking in the open mouth what everyone wants to say, they want to embrace each other and a secret horror holds their arm. Alone in a heartbeat the dull mist falls down, everything laughs as before in golden sunshine, and courage and joy return to their hearts. They hurry to the ship, and are delighted to find it already prepared for the voyage and neatly arranged by the goodness of their protector. A fresh land wind is blowing, the anchor is lifted, the sea people rejoice. The bark, swift as a bird, cuts through the blue tide with outstretched wings. The air is pure and bright, and smooth the sea to reflect in. Gently swaying, like a proud swan, the ship swims away, to the wonder of all the sons of the ocean, on a scarcely furrowed course. No one has ever done such a journey, everyone exclaimed. The knight and the beautiful stand, arm in arm, for hours on deck, and watch, and every new scene is the opium of her thirst for love. And when they look out into the immeasurable plains, where the blue of the waves melts in the air, Huan begins to speak of his country, how beautiful it is, how happy the people are there, and how the sun rises from east to west nothing sweeter can shine than on the banks of the Garonne, and all this is sworn by his old vassal. His heart leaps whenever he can sing hymns to his dear Gascon. The beautiful Regia, although every now and then a lot of words remained incomprehensible to her, listens intently, for that of which nothing escapes you, what with indescribable comfort, as new as it is to you, your heart infinitely easily understands, is, what you Huan's eyes say. A gentle touch of the warm hand, a sigh that discharges the full heart. A soft kiss that draws Rose and Wang away. And, oh, a look bathed in Cupid's dew, what convinces, wins and moves like this. What goes so quickly, in spite of the swiftest arrow, from heart to heart, so surely hits the mark, and makes so little boredom. In spiritual conversations of this kind, the word conversation was always lost between the two of us. Often, to avoid witnesses, they crept into her room and stood there in pairs at the open window, or sat on her sofa. Yes, even then not completely alone, the wet nurse, at least, must always be present, because Huan himself asked him never to leave alone. Still the terrifying sound of the stern one, do not be lustful, echoes in his ear, for you know, said Oberon, that otherwise we would have to part forever. What did the spirit mean? There was a deep meaning in his gaze, which became more and more serious, more and more clouded, oh. Tears swam in it, and his face lost its usual luster. This swells the heart with forebodings of the good night. He no longer trusts himself, Love's lightest jest arouses the fear that Oberon will condemn him. Meanwhile, the trapped flame eats itself deeper and deeper. The air in which he lives is magic air. Because Regia shares it. Her breath blows in it, her lovely shadow hovers around every object on which his eyes dwell. And, oh she herself shines on him in the morning light. In the evening red, in the soft shadowy day of the moon. In what beautiful situation, in what position does her nymphium not irritate him? The veil that envelops you tightly from all strangers falls back in the room, allowing even the timidly daring gaze to suck itself into your neck and bosom like bees. He feels the sweet danger. Oh, if it should be possible, most beautiful, he often exclaims, to endure until Rome, wrap yourself in seven veils. Hide every charm in a thousand little folds. Let living ivory fall over this on the wide sleeves to the fingertips, and alas! Friend Oberon, before all, until then, turn my heart to cold stone. It was, although his strength often fails him, the knight was in all seriousness to win the victory in this battle. It seemed to him great and beautiful to tackle the hardest adventure of virtue, already great and beautiful just to dare, and tenfold beautiful and great to pass it honourably. 
alone the possibility of subduing such an enemy, which grows stronger the more we fight it. There is nothing that gives this enemy one so soon than with the beautiful one loves to give oneself up silently to feeling. Luckily Mr. Huan remembers his duty, according to chivalric custom, to deal with the teaching of the sultan's daughter. Because ah, uh, the poor child still lay in paganism, and believed in Mahomed. Although ignorant of why. The knight, to cure her of this plague, hastens as he can, Luff bade him hasten to impart his little bit of Christianity to the fair ones. In zeal he yielded to no martyr, he was strong in faith, though weak in knowledge, and theology was by no means his specialty, his father and his creed, without glosses, all his knowledge was enclosed in this circle. But what the teaching lacks in light and thoroughness, the teacher's fire makes up for, Mr. Huan, befitting his position an enemy of arguments about words, handles the work like an adventure, and what he believes, he swears high and dearly, obliging its correctness to the whole to demonstrate paganism with its bright steel, on water and on land. Great is the power of truth in the mouth of the beloved, the heart, ahead in league with him, listens to him with lust and eager silence. What's so easy to convince than love? A look, a kiss is her reason for faith. The beauty, without questioning herself, believes in her Huan, and in a short time crosses her forehead and breast with great skill. To receive the holy bath of the Christians now as our hero thinks in his simplicity nothing further stood in her way. It's already enough for her to burn with desire that he fears it and seems to hate every moment's delay. A disciple of Saint Basil, a great enemy of the Gentiles, found in the ship, is easily one to minister to them for the fee herein of his office. The beautiful Regia, who was now called Amanda since she entered the Christian order, not only did she win paradise, she even seemed to become even more beautiful as a result. But Huan's good spirit departed visibly at that hour. It was, in the frenzy of delight, of hearts and handshakes, no end. The faithful old man winks in vain, in vain Fatmi confronts, the good paladin in his fever of soul forgets the dwarf, the warning, the danger. The old man could have waved himself to death, the bliss in which he was completely immersed, you whose kiss now even angels grant him, to press to his heart, to call her Amanda, clouds his vision, completely intoxicates him. Reja, too, since she exchanged her name from Amanden, believes she is freer from the bonds of compulsion, is no longer Reja, forgets kingship, court, fatherland, and in short, what is not Amanda all the more easily? The reminiscence that sometimes still hung on her neck like a burden, fell away with the name she received in exchange. She is now entirely reborn for Huan, gave everything she was for him, gave up a throne for love, and felt in his arms that she had lost nothing. She gave herself away and is amand, now for love only, only to live through love, has nothing else to do in the world nothing else to receive nor to give. The valiant Shirazmin, seeing the loving couple in such a mood, is terrified at their gaze. In it he becomes aware, I don't know what, that lusting is to pick forbidden fruit. A witness squeezed her, he obviously saw that. They kissed as soon as he turned his back a little, so quickly, so thirsty, and blushed as soon as his eyes touched her. In the mirror of his own youth he sees only too well what neither of them saw any more, behold, like a moth the inexperienced virtue approaching the beautiful flame unsuspectingly. How lovely the shine attracts, the gentle warmth. Deceived by her own innocence, the light staggers around her in ever smaller arcs. And suddenly, alas, she burns her wings on it. In this distress the faithful old man secretly united with fat men for this purpose leaves nothing undone that seems to him a means, that the knight's wisdom last at least to roam, he thinks of now this, now that, to keep you busy, to disturb you, to distract you, finally, since all funds are lacking, he proposes to tell a fairy tale to shorten the evening. He called it a fairy tale, although it was certainly more than a fairy tale. A calendar at Basra once told him, when he strayed through the Orient after his master's death, long before, before he withdrew into the chasm of Liban from the waves of the stormy world, and then it is very lively in him himself again he thinks it may be a word at the right time. And so it begins, about a hundred years ago, on the banks of the Tessin, lived a nobleman, 
quite green in wisdom, although very grey in beard and hair, of podagra and gout, the late bitter fruit of lust enjoyed too much, afflicted almost daily, a courtier, by the way, gallant and well experienced, and well tried in the art of courtship. After he had long had his sinful pleasure in roaming in the haughty pride on Cupid's free birch mountain after mountain down in the country around and where he found entrance, to lie with his neighbor's wife, he, I say, had finally had the idea of snuggling his stiff neck, still on the edge of life, into the gentle yoke of holy marriage. With much taste and well-called blood, he selects a child as he needs it at table and bed. For jokes and seriousness, first of all for security, a girl, pious and good, innocent, modest, inexperienced, chaste as the moon and free from all vain desires. Young moreover, pitch black of eyes and hair, rose-like in colour, and round of arms and chest. Of all the three or thirty things that a beautiful woman is said to have, he wouldn't have missed a single thing on his bride, least of all the eye, in whose fiery eyes a damp little cloud floats, the small, soft hand, the lips that swell towards the kiss, the round knee, the beautiful waves of the hips, and the sweet resistance under gentle pressure. The good old gentleman, in buying such fine wares, forgot only one thing, the six to five years that already sprinkle his head with snow. True, out of secret anticipation, he expressly made it a condition of the marital union that she should remain attractive. Warm, and all that, solely for him, and cold as ice for everyone else, alone, who will sign the clause for you? Rosette that's. Rosette was a child. Was blooming in the country, like the violet, hidden in the shade, was happy and light-hearted, and saw in her future master and husband nothing but the man who would make her a great lady, gave her rich clothes and a thousand beautiful things that amuse children as they are during the day, her darling had never thought of anything else. So the wedding was celebrated with great splendour. The noble bridegroom, though a little stiff and heavy, trudges along with Rosetta's hand with honour, and thinks his baptismal certificate lied to him at twenty. Whoever has eyes flocks to marvel at the splendid church going, a handsome couple. One hears murmurs on both sides, they are alike, like January and May. Rosetta's innocence was as is usual in such cases old Gangolf's pride, on the second day he seemed to swell with high courage, and walked straighter than a bolt. It was the last shoot of a dry piece of wood. The evils that tend to associate with grey love soon began to appear in abundance in him. The warmer Rose got, the more her age melted. Meanwhile, he doubles the tests of his tenderness in a different way, giving her gifts every day with new fashion items, with lace, beautiful robes, jewels, in short, with everything that he can see in her eyes. Whatever the cost, what pleases her is pleasure for him, all he asks for is a kiss at most, in a word, his playing the old man's part. Rosette, youthfully happy with her lot, spares nothing to please the old man in his own way, sits on his lap as much as he pleases, and lets himself be rocked on his knee, lets him dally as much as he can out of kindness, nurtures him lovingly in his incapacity, and if as often sleepiness takes hold of him, he may lay his heavy head on her bosom. So many a year they live together in harmony, chaste and faithful as pious lovebirds, so faithful you devoted, and he's so full of faith, that everyone was edified by it. In their jokes, the good man forgot his podagra and his backache, and because of him the young wife only lamented in her heart his tenth year. Alone it came, and ah! To their great sorrow, an evil came with him on Gangolf's grey head, that robbed the poor old man of his dearest feast for life for the rest of his life. Never again will he bask in their gazes, never again see that charming oval from which many a painter gladly stole the gentle features of angels and madonnas. Who should now drive away the long time, the poor blind man, if he didn't have rosettes? What would become of him if it weren't her sweet duty, to remain inseparably glued to him day and night, to always lend him arm and sight, to read and write for him, to ask what ails him, and the gout torments him to rub his knees and feet with a light, warm hand? Rosetta. Always gentle, obliging, compassionate, pays without compulsion and grumbling the heavy duty of marriage, always attentive although her bile often secretly swelled a little at his growling that her age should have nothing to complain about. Unfortunately, in spite of her goodwill, he now caught the worst of all crickets in his care chair. The worst enemy that ever crept out of hell to tease and torment mortals, 
got into the poor man, and tormented him miserably. Old, weak and blind, how could he hide, Rosette was, as much as she resembled an angel, but only a woman. Could there be a lack of tempters? The world around is full of open eyes, and alas! The eye blind that shall light it. So young, so beautiful, so woven entirely out of the sheer spark of love, who can see her and not glow with longing. Where have you ever seen such fresh cheeks blooming? Ever more sparkling eyes and lily arms rounder. True, she is virtuous, she will of course flee. What if she slipped while fleeing? Would it be a miracle the ground on which she flees is bright steel, and alas! The once falls, it falls for all time. Even her virtues. Her gentle nature, her light-heartedness, always happy and good things, what else he loved most about her, even the lovely modesty with which she surrounded him, and what else of her thousand charms, unveiled, and spared, his soul mirror shows, all this now only helps the suspicion that bites him, to dig deeper into his sore heart. The slavery in which the good young woman has languished since that time, none can be compared. Always strapped to his ailing body, she must not leave his side day or night. Suspiciously startled by every soft word, he now wears his eyes on the ends of his fingers, and at night one of his knotted hands always lies on her, now here, now there, for fear she will slip away from him. As gentle as Rosette was, such behavior weighed heavily on her heart. He calls it love, but she only saw what it was, and instead of complaining fruitlessly, began to think. So next to a man of seventy, burdened with gout and stone. To wade through life as through a swamp. And still tormented, she thinks a hard spell. A lot of things that they otherwise patiently overlook, seems in the light in which they now have to see it, extremely disgusting and not at all tolerable. His tenderness is now her heartiest annoyance, his joke insufferably clumsy. And his kiss disgusting, if he dares more, one would like to perish. And she, oh cruel. She is young and beautiful for him, and what is useless to him she must withdraw from herself. And what compensates them? The city's social joys, dance, drama, all this is its forbidden fruit. Nobody visits her old castle, as ghosts go in, everyone seems to avoid it. A great garden high encircled by a wall is all she has, to move in circles, she can lie down against a tree to dream, and then even the blind man is a burden to her. A young nobleman, brought up in Gangolf's castle and placed over his stable, is now valued for the first time, worthy of consideration. He had indeed long considered himself to look at the lady with languorous desire, and often tried to confess it verbally to her, but since she always turned away from the occasion, also reverently withdrew. But now, when frustration and grief and a long time during the day, and even more boring watching at night, make distractions a necessity for her, no wonder that she now took the matter differently. It seems hard to her, in her loveliest days, to renounce all consolation of life so completely, and Walter, whose look now regained courage, was tireless in offering himself to comfort him. His zeal increases as he gains space. He begs, she refuses, but unnoticed an understanding unfolds between them of which the eyes are but the negotiators, for Gangolf was not blind in the ears, and often one ear can serve for a hundred eyes. The old man straightens his and listens when only a fold rustles from Rosetta's dress. Such compulsion shortens the compliments of the resistance, and in a very short time Walter and the lady are already so far that the only question is how to approach. Banned and guarded by her dragon, whose coughing leaves him no rest day and night, what will the young woman think up, to gain some space and time for Walter? Nuff sharpens the wit. While she thinks back and forth of ways, chooses, discards, sees many difficulties in the best, she suddenly thinks of a pear tree with branches of the same tier, that, on the lawn bench in the garden, where hedges of myrtle grow around a marble fountain, high overhanging stood to cover the shady seat from the glow of the sun. To this charming place, which is always surrounded by mild breezes, the old man often, in the summertime, when everything thirsts and withers, takes care of himself with his wife, to lie on the cool side of the well for an hour or two on her lap, to however, he alone has the key to the garden, and apart from him and her no soul came in. What to do now, 
to get the key that the old man always carries with him in his slip. It is taken away very gently at bedtime. And while the man sings his ave, pressed in wax, the next morning the imprint played unnoticed in Walter's hand, and a postscript to it, recommending the tree to him, Walter will take care of the rest. Now what happened? It was a beautiful, warm day at the end of August, when the sun lured our blind old man, as he sometimes used to take his midday rest in the myrtle circle. Come, my dove, speaks to his other self the grey dove. Come, my little rose, lead me to that quiet ground where, since he joined us, the god of marriage so often found us arm in arm. Rosette waves, and Walter creeps ahead, the garden door is quietly opened and closed again, then it goes to a flies to the well, the pear tree is climbed, and, where the widest branch curves gently, the female's throne is determined in the thickest foliage. The old man, meanwhile, comes, with unsteady steps, gradually striding on his little Rosie's arm. Because the mouth remained almost the only thing that still served him in many and various ailments, it was to speak to her of his love and of the paradise of matrimony, usually that with which he gave her the time distribution. He then mixed in. Perhaps to bribe her, much poetry of her taunts, and mostly a piece of sermon came afterwards. From this sound it had gone on the way, and now that she had happily arrived at the well where, as you know, the beautiful pear tree is resplendent, Gangolf had also, after stroking her cheeks, and although severely plagued by the cough much tender and sweet said, the sermon just started, which you don't like in the face of the pear tree. It is, he said, since he sat like that, his forehead on her breast, in the shade by her, and never tired of stroking the round, soft, atlas arm gently up and down, is the innocence of our joy, the rest, the sweet consolation to which all joys give way, the happiness of being loved, loved and conscious man be worthy of it, in short, of what you must feel if you love me, a happiness on earth to compare? Oh speak, my darling, here the old gentleman began to caress even more tenderly, but speak freely and without any hypocrisy. For one hears us. Whom no one can deceive your poor blind man may also well, who caresses you so tenderly loves, may your gangle flatter itself that you love him again. That he is your everything, fills your whole heart, as you are his everything. Admittedly, if we wanted to appreciate the old legends. A man would be nothing less forgivable than to put his whole heart in a woman, to build on her loyalty, to trust her appearance. Long ago, from barrels and thrones, the full Diogens, the wise Solomons, taught us that a woman's heart is not a reliable good, and her cunning is equal to nothing but her fickleness. To say nothing of the worldly stories, do we not even see the holy book destroying the fame of women's loyalty from the beginning? Did not the curse come upon mankind through the first woman? Pious Lot was betrayed by his daughters, the children of God themselves, even before the great flood, were attracted to women, burned their wings on their punishable embers. The Delilah, the Jaelm, Jezebel and Bathsheba, and whatever their name is called, is unnecessary to line up for you, although the scriptures do not praise them for the sake of loyalty, but this Judith, the brave, pious, Old Field Marshal Holofern first embraces. First makes love drunk. And then kills it, who can refrain from tears. But even if the greatest number of women were rich in vices, no matter how bare in virtue. You, my only, chosen one. You. The comfort of my age and the light of my eyes, I put my trust in you, you remained faithful your duty, and you did not fail, even if the best was lacking. Your Gangolf, who loves you so pure, so faithfully, will, oh sure. Never saddened by you so cruelly. Why, moved with guilty cheeks the young woman, and morosely pulls away the swan's arm, with which they encircle him around the belt, why, she answers quickly and warmly, all these litany. With what in my life have I given this opportunity? As? Should I believe that your heart is capable of doubting my faithfulness even for a moment? Unlucky ones. Is this the final reward for all my love? To whom did I give myself completely? The first kiss of innocence, the first instincts of youth, who had them? And alas! That I am too tender is now my crime. He suspects a heart that knows no other, only beats harder for him. Hoffa G.E.R., haven't you had enough of this victory? Do you have to torment me too? Oh cruel! 
Vile. Here she stopped, as if the excessive pain choked the voice in her breast, and sobbing, the old man threw his arms around her neck and repentantly pressed the faithful wife to his heart. Oh don't cry, my darling, oh forgive what love only lacked. I didn't mean to annoy you, oh forgive me and give me a kiss. By God. I do not doubt my little Rose's loyalty. So are you. Said was it, gently struggling to withdraw from his kiss, you are all men. First you lure us into a trap so flatteringly, and if you have us, enjoy quiet pleasure instead of fresh blood with you only bad bile. Then why to the poor woman who has to satisfy you? The very little flame that you so eagerly ignited gives you cause for suspicion and secretly gives you madness. The good man, who is overcome by his hip pain at the most inconvenient time, has no other advice for his poor body than to promise the faithful wife of his tenderness. And that the shadow of suspicion is and remains heavenly far from his heart. Thus the new peace agreement is confirmed by both parties with a sweet kiss. The brave couple sank, from emptiness or fullness of heart as you will, into a deep stillness. Rosette sighs. The old man asks why. Nothing, she says again, sighing, and remains silent. He penetrates her. Don't worry. My dear, it's just lust, and it may pass. Lust. I understand. How happy you made my old man. She is silent and sighs one more time. There we have the fruit of your cold bathing, Gangolf continued happily. Say it. It could harm you, if you withheld it and harm the hidden. Oh. She speaks, if you saw the beautiful pear tree here, so fresh with leaves, so brimming with ripe golden fruit. The branches almost break. I said nothing, lest you should get angry, alone, I would give an eye for one of these pears. I know him well, the tree, he bears the best fruit in the whole country, replies the good blind man, yes, speak, how do we do it? No one is at hand, it's a harvest day, all the farmhands are scattered in the field, the tree is tall, and I'm weak and blind oh, if only the rascal Walter were here. I've got an idea, my angel. We don't need anyone else, she says, but you and me. If you were so good as to press your back against the trunk for just a moment, it would be easy for me to swing from the edge of the lawn onto your shoulder, from there it's all the way up the tree hardly two small clasps to the first branch. I have practiced climbing and jumping since childhood, certainly, it will succeed. With all my heart, replies the blind man, and yet, my child, if you were harmed. Is a branch breaking? What can I, poor poor man, do then to help you? How, if you make yourself content to wait? Didn't I say that I can't wait? I see well that you are ashamed of the small service, for everything you want I don't like being a burden to you. And yet, who sees us here? We're all alone. What was to be done? The life of an heir could easily be endangered by this lasciviousness, short, half tenderness half force, Gangolf must surrender. He braces himself, even helps the female up, and from the patient head of the good old fool Rosette swings freshly up to the breezy seat, where hidden joys await her under the leaves. Now, by chance. While all this was happening, Oberon was sitting on a flower bench, past the good blind old man, to have a midday rest with Titania, the fairy queen, meanwhile the Zephyrite company of the elves, her followers, scattered through the whole garden and mostly hidden in flower bushes, to await the moonlight, slumbering there. They sat invisible and listened to everything that just happened between man and woman. Unfortunately they also saw the pear tree scene. This made the elf king very uncomfortable. There, he said to Titania, one sees how true it is what all experts say. What is so bad that, in order to do enough for herself, a woman has not the courage to dare? Yes, friend Salomon, confesses your wise mouth, a single honest man is still seen, but one wanders around the wide world for me after a pious woman, he will go in vain. Do you see, Titania, hidden in the pear tree there mocking the blind man's unfaithful wife? She thinks herself in the night that covers his eyes as safe as in Pluton's deepest caves. Alone, by my throne, by this staff of lilies, and by the terrible power that the kingdom of the elves handed over to me with this scepter, her cunning shall not help her, nor his blindness. No. 
she shall not enjoy her high treason with impunity in Oberon's face. I want to drag the cataracts from Gangolf's eyes, and in the act of doing it shall seize his gaze. So? Do you want it? Replies with quick mind and cheeks full of glow the fairy queen, so shall my oath be married to yours. So I also swear, as true as I am queen of the elven kingdom and your wife, she shall not lack an excuse. Is Gangolf blameless? Is freedom your lot, and ours only patience? Yet, without heeding their wrath, Oberon makes true what he swore. Touched by his lily staff, Gangolf's eyes brighten, the cataract is gone. Astonished, delighted, he begins to look, looks, and shakes himself as if a swarm of wasps were leading him in the eyes, look, oh heaven! Should he trust? His faithful little rose, alas! In a man's arms! It can't be! He didn't see right, the long accustomed light blinded him, it's impossible for the best woman to stray like that. He looks again, the same face pierces his heart. Ha! He screams, as if possessed, traitor, siren, hell-bred, you don't shy away from my eyes so shamefully forgetting your honour and loyalty. Rosetta, as if startled by thunder, starts up anxiously, while an invisible arm covers the pale lover with a magic veil. What strange adventure does she think, at this very moment, so ill-timed, make the old fiend's face? Yet, according to the word of the Queen of the Elves, she does not lack for wits to help herself out of trouble. What is the matter with you, dear man? She calls down from the tree, why are you raving so much? You're still asking, impertinent. Poor me. How? You give room to suspicion. That's how you reward me for grieving me for being in distress, so that when nothing helped anymore, I made it easy by black art force with a ghost in the form of a man to wrestle around your face, and, for your love, paralyzed my right arm in the fight. What deserves thanks you even blame? And aren't you ashamed to sing me such a song? Ha! he shouted. This is where Saint Job was losing his patience. What I saw do you call wrestling? So may this newly given light of heaven's miraculous hand protect me, and you, faithless woman, may you go to hell, as I lack an honest word about your deed. How? She exclaims, so my Gangolf can speak. Woe is me. Oh. Too surely something, whatever it is, must be broken in my magic work, your eyes are obviously not clear of clouds yet. How else could you humiliate yourself with such hard talk about murdering your faithful wife? Your seeing cannot be true seeing, it is only the flickering of an uncertain appearance. Oh that it were possible to deceive myself! Speaks Gangolf, happy the man who is only plagued by suspicion. I, the unlucky one, saw it. Seen what I saw. Lament it to heaven. Was ever a woman born more unhappy? Screams the traitor with tears oh that I still have to survive this pain. My poor husband has lost his mind. And what man of tender disposition would not lose him? In spite of all his senses, who sees tears running down such beautiful eyes and such a breast swelling with sighs? The old man can no longer resist, be content, child. I was too quick, too warm, forgive me, and come down into your gangolf's arm, it is now as clear as day, I had seen wrong. There you hear it now. Speaks to Titania the elf prince, what he saw with his eyes washes away a tear. It is your work, triumph. But now also hear the holiest of oaths. I thought I was loved and found my happiness in it. It was a dream, thank you that I'm disenchanted. Hope not a little tear will be able to cloud me too, from now on we have to separate. We shall never, in water nor in air, nor where the twigs rain balm in the grove of blossoms, nor where the gaunt griffin keeps watch in the eternally dark tomb bay treasures of magic, will we meet each other again. The air in which you breathe oppresses me. Flee, and woe to the treacherous race of which you are, and woe to the cowardly love servant who drags your chains. I hate you all the same. And where a man lets himself be caught in a woman's knitting, like a stumbling, lust drunk grouse, and lies and coos at her, and sucks the false poison from her voluptuous looks, imagines that love is what blazes in her serpent's breast, and listen, infatuated, to the smiling siren, trust her oaths. 
They leave the insidious tears, he is condemned to every need, to every torment. And by the terrible name it is sworn that the spirits themselves must remain unnameable, nothing can avert this curse and my firm conclusion, until a faithful couple, blessed by fate itself, flows together into one through chaste love, and, tested in suffering as in joys, the hearts undivided, even if the bodies part, the guilt of the unfaithful atones through his innocence. And if this noble pair of innocent pure souls gave everything for love, and under every blow of the severest destiny, even if the water rises up to their throats, remain true to their first love, determined ere to choose death in flames, than to be unfaithful even to the love of a throne. Titania, is this, is all this done, then we shall meet again. Thus spoke the spirit and vanished from their sight. In vain she lured him back into her arms with a loving voice, fleeing afterward. Nothing can break the quick word that he spoke in his wrath. Even if he had wept for it himself, nothing can release him from his oath, before, according to the condition that seems quite impossible, two lovers, as he demands, find each other. From that time to our days Oberon has never shown himself in his own form, and as the people say now chosen a mountain. Now a thick forest, now a deserted valley for his dwelling, where to disturb and torment lovers all his pleasure is, and that he did the opposite only for you is like a miracle. Here the old man ended with telling, and Huan takes a manden by the hand, if, he says. Only a pair of faithfully in love souls are missing for Oberon's and Titania's rest, fate's work hovers on the brink of completion. Wasn't he himself that connected us so wonderfully? He, otherwise the dear enemy, has taken us under his protection, the rehearsals, oh better let them come. Amand puts his hand on the young man's heart with soulful glances in response. To her, who has done so much for him, what was left for her to express in words? And a scene of delight ensues, in which the good Sherismin, in spite of all his nods, suddenly seemed to lose the fruit of the fair tale. It is true that the innocence of chaste veils still concealed the growing danger from the lovers, and their tenderness poured out the more freely, the purer its source was. Never has a young couple been fresher in matters of love, but for that very reason her lot hung by a hair. To destroy all their happiness forever, it takes a moment to lose themselves in it. Canto 7. Meanwhile, after seven happy days, the lovable heroic couple, to whom every element was favourable through Oberon, was carried to the shore of Lepanto. Here, as Mr. Huan immediately heard, two lightly winged pinnaces lay ready to sail, one destined for Marsilian's port, the other intended for travellers to Napoli. The young master, a little weary of the old man's watchfulness and mentoring gaze, is very pleased with this chance service and unhesitatingly uses it conclusively. Friend, he says, a year and a day may pass before it's time for me to show myself in Paris, you know that I'm promised to Rome for the time being, and everyone else has to be silent about this duty. Meanwhile it is my duty to let the emperor see that I fulfill my word. You are my vassal, do for me what I cannot do myself, board quickly one of the pinnaces that steers towards Marseille, then hurry to court without rest, and hand over, to reconcile the emperor, this casket with the sultaness beard and teeth, and tell him what you have seen. And that as soon as I have gotten the Holy Father's blessing in Rome, nothing should prevent me from laying the sultaness daughter at his feet. Farewell, my old friend. The wind is blowing strong and full, the anchors are already being lifted, good luck on the journey and if you have done my business, come and look for me in Rome in the late ran, who knows, we might get there together. The faithful old man looks the prince in the eye, shakes his grey head, and would gladly take the liberty of leeching his young master with a little sharp salt for this ruse. But he holds up. The casket, he thinks, could have waited with no problem, until Huan himself was able to settle the account with the emperor in person. Meanwhile, when his prince and friend insists, what can he do but prepare to leave? He kisses Amandan's hand, embraces with wet eyes the dear prince's son, whom his presence scarcely pleased, now began to press, and tears trickle down his grey beard. Lord, he cries, good Lord, God bless you, and may we see each other again soon and happily. The knight's heart beat, because between his friend and himself the open sea spreads farther and farther. What have I done? Oh! What has haste tempted me to do? 
whereby his master has a man ever meant it like this man? How faithfully he endured dangers with me. Oh that I thought of it too late. Who will help me now if the advice escapes me? And who in the future will save me from myself? So he exclaims secretly, and now swears to himself and swears it to Oberon from whom he unseen, believes to feel the gentle spiritual twang around his forehead to do his utmost in the battle of love and duty with honour to pass. Carefully he now keeps his distance from a manden, and spends the night staring at the fishing star. The day's melancholy looking out to sea. The beautiful woman who sees the man to whom she gave her heart so completely transformed is all the more embarrassed because she thinks no reason for it. But more from tenderness, from her inability to cheer him up, than from her pride, she offers only gentleness and much patience to him. Meanwhile, the evil increases with every hour, and robs him and her of their rest day and night. Once at the time when already in the starry sky in the tea's lap the sparkling arcturus sinks, the noisy tumult on board was silent, and the ocean hardly moved, like a vast field on which Zephyr sways, the people in the ship, the prey of the deepest slumber, evaporated the wine that ran in their veins, and even at the helm the shore helmsman nodded, Fatmi too had fallen asleep at her young lady's feet, only from your eyelid, O oh Huan, only from your bosom flees, O oh Rija, the sleep. The poor souls atone for love's sweet poison. How its hot fire digs in her blood. And ah. Only a thin wall separates them, they almost believe they are touching each other, and not a sigh can go unheard. The knight whose long restrained urge becomes torture, whose every bitter tear that his cruelty forced out of a mandan's eyes burns on his heart, he sighs so loudly, so anxiously, as if it were his last breath. She, who has been struggling with love and shame for an hour, can finally no longer refrain from finding relief. To investigate what is tormenting him, and to offer him consolation. In white sleeping clothes, like the most beautiful angel, she enters his room, with tender pity, in chaste eyes, with fearfully open arms. He feels as if the kingdom of heaven is opening before him. His face, just before so withered, so pale as death, becomes fiery red, his pulse, which is hardly so sluggish and despondent, doubles its beats, and hops like a fish in a mirror-bright pond. But immediately again Oberon's word throws him down, and since he, bold because of her kindness, wants to draw her to his breast, he quickly tears himself away from her kiss, from her bosom again, wants to flee, stops again, comes quickly back to her to throw himself into her arms, and suddenly he stares away, with wild rolling eyes, as if wishing to abbreviate his torment at once. She sinks down on the bed, her full heart beats high through the softening robe and the pain pours down from her languishing eyes. Heavy with love. He sees it, and mankind can't stand it any longer, half senselessly he takes her it'll be the worst of it. In his arm, his glowing lips suck up the dew of love with hot thirst, and it flows completely unleashed heart in full swing. Rija too, carried away by love and delight, forgets to resist, and, enraptured, and alternately pressing and pressing him to her heart, abandons herself unsuspectingly to the long-lost kisses. With full gulps his insatiable mouth slurps up a heart-intoxicating, voluptuous oblivion from her lips, the longing is measured, and alas! Instead of hymen cupid crowns their union. The sky turns black straight away, all the stars are extinguished, lucky ones. They don't realize it. With storm-laden wings, the unbridled winds roar from afar, you don't hear it. Wrapped in dark rage Oberon rushes past her face, you don't hear it. The thunder's threatening voice is already rolling for the third meal, and alas! They don't hear it. Meanwhile, with a terrible roar, an unprecedented storm breaks out from all sides, the earth's axe cracks. The cloud's black womb pours streams of fire. The sea begins to roar the waves tower up like foaming mountains, the pink one sways and drifts in an uncertain course, the bosun screams in vain into storm-numbed ears. Loud howls throughout the ship, woe to us! We are lost. The fury of the untamed winds, the whole horizon transformed into a mouth of hell, loud blaze, the constant cracking of the ship, which alternately seems to be swallowed up by the deepest tide, now driven skyward, floating on tops of the waves that shattered beneath it all this, strong enough to startle the dead, 
finally had to wake our couple from their dizziness. Amanda departs from her lover's arms, lifeless, God. She exclaims, what have we done? The guilty man begs the guardian spirit for mercy, for help, at least only for a manden, in vain. Oberon is now the avenger of innocence, is now inexorable in his judgment, gone are the hiftorn and the cup, the pledges of his bounty, he hears and does not save. Meanwhile the centurion calls the whole people together and says, you see the general need, with every beat of the pulse, water, wind, and flame threaten the sinking of the good ship. I never saw such a storm. Heaven shines unto death, perhaps for one guilt to damn us all, cursed to perish for the fault of a wicked man. Whom the avenger's lightning seeks among us. Let us then ask heaven by lot what kind of sacrifice it asks for. Is there any of you who is afraid of the scales? Where everyone has to die, nobody has anything to risk, he said it, and everyone agrees with the proposal. The priest brings the chalice, one throws in the lots, everyone around him is on their knees, he murmurs a prayer and tells everyone to go. Full of secret foreboding, but with resolute courage, Huon approaches, lowering the tenderest of looks to Reja, who fearfully and without blood, stands like a plaster image. He draws, an O oh fortunes. O oh Oberyn. He draws the loot of death with a trembling, frosty hand. The crowd looks at him in silence, he reads, turns pale, and without resistance he surrenders to the severity of his fate. This is your work, he calls out to Oberyn, I feel, although I don't see you, angry spirit, I feel your nearness. Woe is me. You warned me, you told me beforehand. Your judgment is just. I ask no mercy, as for a manden only. Oh. She is innocent. Forgive her. Load me alone with all your anger, I bear it with patience. You who receive my death, give a pious tear to the young man whom the stars envy. I die not innocently, but I always live with honor, a moment when, intoxi intoxicated with sweet poison, I forgot the word I swore too hastily, the warning that too late echoes in my anxious ears now echoes, mankind's common fate of being weak is my crime only. I am sorry now, but without complaint. For I shall not regret the amiable crime. If loved ones are to blame, may heaven forgive me. My dying heart knows no other duty now. What else can I repay you but love, O oh you who gave me everything for love? No. This sacred ember does not smother a wave grave. She lives on immortally in the shadow of your Huan. Here his heart grows, he holds his pale hand in front of his eyes and is silent. And whoever stood in a circle was silent, no heart so raw that does not overflow with pity for a moment when it falls. It was a flash that vanished in the making. His death is security, is life for them all, and since heaven itself desires him as a sacrifice, who, they say, can resist heaven? The storm, which seemed calmed from the first moment Huon pronounced the sentence of death, now returned with renewed fury. The mast was shattered, the rudder broke. Let the whole ship scream, let the criminal die. The captain approaches the knight. Young man, he speaks, you see that delay cannot save you, die, because it must be, free, and save us from ruin. And with resolute step the paladin approaches the board of the ship. Suddenly the beautiful woman, who a while ago seemed lifeless marble, rushes at him like a raging madman through all the people, her hair blows in the storm like a lion's mane, with breast swollen and eyes without tears, she wraps her strong arm in loving fury around Huan, and drags him with her into the flood. In desperation, faithful Fatmi wants to jump after her. You hold them by force. She sees the lovely two, embraced as tightly as vines entwine quickly rolled away only weakly struggling with the waves, and since she can't see anything anymore, her cries of fear fill the whole ship. Who can bring her back what she loses? With her queen is all she loves and hopes for eternity. Meanwhile, scarcely had the raging waves touched the knight's head. Then lay, oh wonder! The grim of the storm, the thunder is silent, the hurricanes have fled, the sea, so terrifying hardly raised sinks again to the smoothness of the brightest pond, undulates like a bed of lilies, the ship cheerfully continues its way with oars, and, only two more days, 
it rests in the safe port. But how will it fare for you, you lovely couple, that, without hope, is now drifting in the open sea? Their strength is exhausted, contemplating, hearing, seeing gone, the feeling of their love remains. Embraced as tightly as if they had grown together, neither conscious of itself anymore, yet still breathing in the other, they swam along, mouth to mouth, and breast to breast. And can you, Oberyn, turn pale without grief, you, once her friend, her protection, can see her perishing? You see her. Weep for her, and won't you soften? He turns and flees, it's gone for her. But don't worry. The ring won't let you go down, you'll reach the nearby beach unharmed, she is protected by the magical mysterious ring Rija received from Huan's hand. Whoever possesses this ring, the almighty seal of the great Solomon, no element will quench the light of life, he goes through flames unburned, if he is locked up in a dungeon, lock and bolt will spring as soon as he touches them, and if he wants to be from Trident to Memphis in no time, the ring lends him wings, there is nothing that he who has this talisman on his finger cannot work through it. He can move the moon from its place, in the open market, in the brightest sunshine, an invisible mist envelops him as soon as he wants, even from the looks of ghosts. If someone is to stand in front of him, he may only press the ring, unless he bids it appear, a man, an animal, a shadow or spirit. He stands there and has to bow to his signal. In earth and air, in water and in fire, the spirits are subject to him, the sight of him frightens and tames the wildest monsters, and even the Antichrist must approach him trembling. Nor can by any power in heaven or on earth the ring be snatched away from him who does not steal it, the omnipotence that is in it protects itself and every hand that rightly possesses it. This is the ring that saves you, Amanda. You and the man who, by the bond of love and the strength of your arms chained to your breast, unknowingly how, on an island beat you and yourself, oh wonder. Found. It is true that chance has bedded you hard here, the whole island seems volcanic ruin, and nowhere does the eye rest on leaves and fresh green. Yet, this is not what stirs the blissful in the staggering minutes of the first drunkenness. So unexpectedly, so miraculously escaped the floods, led unharmed to dry land, saved, free, alone, to find each other arm in arm, that exceedingly great happiness makes everything around them vanish from their eyes, yet their condition soon calls them to feeling return. Drenched to the skin, how could they avoid undressing themselves on the beach? The sun was high and the beach was lonely. Alone, while her dripping robe hangs on rocks, whither to flee the sunbeam that withers and stings your lily skin, Amanda. The sand burns her feet, the jagged stones glow. And alas! No tree, no bush that weaves a shelter for her. Finally the young man's anxious eyes discovered a chasm in the rocks. He catches Amanda and flies away with her, hastily piles up reeds and old moss everything must be good for knee to the bed, and then throws himself down beside her. They look at each other with a sigh and suck consolation from one another's eyes for every need that is pressing now and threatens in the future. O oh love, sweet refreshment of all sufferings of mortals, blissful intoxication of wedded souls. What joys are equal to yours? How terrible was the exchange, how swift the transition in the fate of these two. Once the favourites of fortune, thrown from a princely throne, they hardly get their lives away, their bare lives hardly, and are still to be envied. The lustiest soul, adorned with royal splendour, has not the charm of this wild grotto for Rija, and he, pressed to her breast, feels immortal, becomes a god in her arms. The half-rotten moss, on which they rest, seems to them the richest bed, and smells sweeter than if jasmine and rose and lily scent had embalmed it. Oh that it must end, no matter how fondly the heart nourishes it, the sweet delusion. Two hours have slipped by unnoticed. Yes, nature desires other fare now. Who will serve you here? Inhospitable, uninhabited is this arid beach, nothing to cheat hunger is found around and around, and ah. Fiercely Oberyn withdrew his hand from them, the cup is gone. With tireless foot the young man climbs the cliffs all around, and looks as far as he can. A dreadful mingling of rocks and of chasms meets his gaze where tears he blinks. There is no luscious green from flower-filled meadows, there is no tree that beckons him with golden fruit. 
scarcely that heather and thin blackberry hedges and thistles here and there hide the bare ground. So shall I, he exclaims, biting his lip in agony, alas. So should I return with empty, hopeless hands, to her, for whom alone my life was worth preserving. I, her only support. I, who belong to her with every heartbeat, am of no use to her just to eke out a single day of her life. I shall faint to see you before my eyes, you wonder of nature, so loving, so beautiful. Languish. You who are so miserable for my sake. So much left for me. To you, who your star promised the most beautiful fate, before the wrath of heaven pushed you into my arms, you stay here you began to roar with anger and fear don't stay so much, just to still the hunger. He cried out loudly in pain beyond words then he sank down and lay in dreadful stillness. But at last a ray of faith falls into his heart, he pulls himself out of the gloom's black shell, speaks courage to himself, and begins to search with renewed zeal. For a long time in vain. Already in the ocean the edge of the sun is melting to gold all at once. Oh delight! Discovered the most beautiful fruit in his greedy looks. Half hidden under foliage, half glowingly illuminated, he saw broad robbed tendrils, like melons, swaying to the earth, inviting scent, and beautifully painted. How richly he considers himself paid for all his troubles. He rushes to it, and breaks it, his eyes open brightly to heaven, and drunken joy inspires his course. A man den, the three deadly long hours on this desolate beach where everything arouses fear, where every sound threatens and even the silence terrifies, you found yourself without him who is now your everything. You had disappeared part of the long time, Zum Camp, as the need of love covers it here, with an unaccustomed arm to carry whole layers of sea grass, reeds, and moss to the cave from the shore. Dull as she was, this toil yet exhausted her last strength, her knees broke, she sinks to the shore, and thirsts with a dry palate. Gnawed by hunger, tormented by hot thirst. In this wild place where she lacks everything. How anxious is her destiny! Where shall Yi Huan linger? What if he had an accident? Perhaps a ravening beast? Just thinking it robs her of the rest of her life. The most horrible of possibilities paint your imagination with warm colors. In vain she strives to fight with her fear, a pounding wave frightens her unhappy ear. At last, weak as she is, she struggles up on the forehead of a rock and looks in all directions, and with the last glimpse of the sun she discovers him it's him. He comes back. He also sees her spread her arms towards him, and shows her the beautiful golden fruit from afar. In those infancy of the world, the first woman in paradise was tempted by none more beautiful. He holds her aloft, as if in triumph, in the last rays of the sun, which paint her smooth skin with flaming red, while Amanda scarcely believes her happy eyes. So heaven takes pity on our need. She calls, and a great tear flashes in her eyes and before the tears fall Huan is already in her open arms. Her feeble tone and the fact that she sways half lifeless on his bosom bid her rescuer hasten. They camp, and, for lack of another tool, he uses his sword to divide the fair fruit. Here the stylus is shaking out of my hand. Can you, too severe a spirit, in such a miserable state, still mock their need, still deceive their hope? The beautiful fruit was rotten, through and through, and bitter with bile. And pale. As a dying man pales in the last breath, the deceived couple look at each other disconsolately, their staring eyes wide open, as if thunder had struck them out of the clear air. A stream of bitter tears falls with fury from Huan's eyes, from those dreadful tears, which desperation squeezes out of the half-stopped blood, with eyes full of embers, and a gouty twitching mouth and furiously chattering teeth. Amanda, gentle and still, but with broken courage, eyes blotted out, cheeks withered, lips parched to shards, let, she says, let me die. Even dying is sweet in your heart, and thanks to the avenger who, in his wrath, severe as he is, yet left me this consolation. She says it in a weak, half-choked voice, and sinks into his breast. So, broken in the storm, the lily's withering head falls. Mad with love and fear Huan jumps up and takes the dear soul in his arms and carries her to the cave. Ah! Just a drop of water, righteous God! He cries out. 
half impatient, half begging, I, I alone, am guilty. Your anger alone hits me. For me nature will become a grave all around, the open jaws of hell. Just spare yourself. Oh guide the dark foot on a spring. Just a little water to rekindle your life. He goes out to search again, and swears to bury himself consumed by thirst and hunger in these rocks before he returns empty-handed to the cave. He, he cries while weeping, who hears the pitiful young raven screaming at him, he cannot hate his most beautiful work, he will certainly, certainly, not let you languish. As soon as he said it, it seemed to him as if he heard a trickling spring not far from him. He listens with a keen ear, it trickles away, delighted, he gives thanks and searches around, and, by the faint light of dawn, he soon discovers the spot. He grasps the sweet dew in a shell, and hurries back, and refreshes the almost hurt woman. To enjoy refreshments more leisurely, he himself carries them to the nearby spring. It was only water yet. To the half-dead mind. The spirit of life seems to flow down the palate, every puff seems to be more heart-strengthening than wine, and sweet as milk and gentle as oil, it has the power to feed and to drink, and to sink all suffering into oblivion. Refreshed, strengthened, and full of new faith, give thanks to him who rescued you from death for the second meal, embrace each other, and after the last bowl, unnoticed, at the spring on the cool moss, the sweet comforter of all sorrows unleashes the bond of tired limbs, the sweet comforter of all sorrows, and they rest lovingly in the soft arms of slumber. As soon as the dawn played around Huan's forehead, he got up and hastened to new research, dares many a bold leap where the torn rock is divided by a sudden fall, feels through every corner, always careful that he doesn't lose the way back to a manden, and sorrowful, because he saw the island everywhere quite uninhabitable for people and animals. At last it leads southeast from the cave a crooked path into a small bay, and in the bushes that encircle a gorge of rocks, weighed down with ripe fruit, a date tree discovers itself. As lightly as a poor soul fleeing to heaven. Which escaped from the agony and severe embers of the purgatory. He climbed up the tree as if he were climbing heaven, and breaks as much of the sweet fruit into his pockets as he can get hold of, then jumps down and flies, as if a deer were to be caught at full speed, the lovely woman, who always lies in his mind, as soon as she becomes cheerful, with it to surprise. She was still lying, when he came, beautifully snuggled up in herself, in soft sleep. Her cheeks glow like roses, and scarcely does her robe half capture her bosom. Delighted in sweet vision, the purest pleasure of love, Huan stands there, like the genius of the beautiful sleeper, contemplated, stooping down on her, with affectionate greed, the angelic image, the ever new charm, this is who, for his love, despised happiness for nothing, to those who want to achieve it, otherwise everything that is dear and holy brings to a happy sacrifice. Love cheated you of a throne. And, alas. What for? You, brought up voluptuously on the soft lap of Asiatic splendor, you now lie on hard rock, the wide arch of heaven your canopy, your bed a little moss, before whether unprotected and mere chance, still happy here, where thistles hardly survive, to numb hunger with some wild fruit. And I, who, in the strict watch of fate, am doomed to infect my misfortune that is approaching me, instead of protecting you from accident, I brought you into this misery. So I reward you what you gave for me dare for me. Unfortunate me, now you're everything in the world. What can I do for you, to whom nothing was left but this bare life? This tormenting feeling is involuntarily loud, and awakens the lovely bride from her sleep. The first thing she sees is Huan, who, with looks in which joy and the intoxication of love only half crush the deepest grief, scatters fruit in the bosom of the palm tree. Meager fare and a shell full of water turns distress into a feast for the gods. To the feast of the gods. For doesn't her head rest on Huan's breast? Didn't he break it, the sweet fruit? Didn't he deprive himself of slumber, and crawl through many a chasm for her love? So love counts everything against him, and only despises what she has done for him. To disperse the clouds that darken his brow, she makes her beautiful eyes sparkle with pure joy. He feels the exuberance of love and generosity in her tender demeanor, and with his eyes drenched and his cheeks full of order, he sinks into her arm. Oh, shouldn't I despair, he cries. 
Don't hate myself. Don't curse every star that shimmered on the night that gave me life, curse that light when I whimpered in my mother's arms for the first meal. To see you, my best wife, through me, through my transgression, from every happiness fallen, from every happiness that smiled at you in Baghdad, from every happiness that I made you hope for in my father's country. Degrade you. To this needy estate. And to see how you endure all this without complaining it's too much. I cannot stand. Amanda looks at him with a look in which the sky opens up to him, full of what her bosom can hardly grasp, let me, says she, Huan, from the beloved mouth what my soul hates never hear again. Do empty accuse yourself, not the one who oppresses us. Sent to us only as a test, not as a punishment, he tests only those he loves, and loves like a father. What has happened to us since that dream, the cradle of our love, is it not evidence of this? Name as you like the founder of our instincts, providence, destiny, Oberon, enough, a miracle has given you to me, me to you. A miracle our covenant, a miracle our life. Who will take us out of Baghdad unharmed? Who resisted the flood that swallowed us? And when, already dying, we escaped so unexpectedly from the waves, tell me, who else but the power that protects us has thought of us hitherto? I sucked it out of her breast. The water that. In this anxious night, fanned my barely smouldering light anew. Certainly also this meal, which eke out our life, has prepared a secret benevolent hand. For what, if our downfall is decided, what would all this have happened for? My heart tells me, I believe it, and feel what I believe, the hand that guides us through this darkness, doesn't let misery rob us of it. And though hope loses its anchor, let us hold fast to that faith, a single moment can transform everything. But let the worst be. She withdraws herself entirely, the wondrous hand that has surrounded us hitherto, let it be, that year after year it will be renewed without help, and your loving, faithful Amand will find her grave here on this beach, far be it from me ever regretting what I've done. And if the free choice still lay before me, I would follow you with joyful courage into misery. It costs me nothing to part with all that I had, my heart and your love replace everything for me, and as much as fortune degrades me. If you stay with me, I will not envy anyone who considers themselves lucky through gold and purple. Only that you suffer is a mandan's true suffering. A sad look, an oh that escapes you, is what makes my own need a thousand times more difficult. Don't speak of what I gave for you, done for you. I did what my heart commanded, that's for myself, the tenfold death is no more bitter than to live without you. What is our destiny, your love helps me, my love helps you bear, as difficult as it is, as unbearable, here is my hand. I will bear it with joy. With every rise and fall of the sun my diligence shall match your husband's, my arm is strong, he shall stand by you in every work, never weary. The love that stirs him will increase his strength, will cheerfully render the least service. As long as I am enough for your comfort, for your happiness, I have not exchanged my beautiful fate with a queen. Thus spoke the best woman, and with chaste lips presses the seal of her word upon her beloved mouth, and with the kiss the cliffs around Huan are transformed, the rough rocky ground stands again transformed into Elysium, gone is every trace of naked poverty, the shore seems to be strewn with pearls, a marble pillar covers the tomb, the rocks gilded. He feels his heart swell with renewed courage. A woman like this is more than a world. With high heaven breathing bliss, he presses this full heart against her open breast, calls earth and sea, and you, all seeing sun. To bear witness to his oath. I swear it on this breast. The holy altar of innocence and loyalty, destroy me, he exclaims when I desecrate my heart. If ever this heart, in which your name burns, which becomes unfaithful to virtue and misjudges your worth, Ever, as long as this testing fire lasts, torments you through faint-heartedness, dishonors itself through timidity, ever becomes relaxed, beloved wife, for you to suffer and dare the utmost, then. Son, arm yourself against me with lightning, and may see and land deny me refuge. He spoke it, and rewarded him with a new kiss the angelic woman. They rejoice in their love, and alternately strengthen each other's resolve no matter how hard the lord of fate may practice their virtue, 
with firm courage and iron patience to save themselves for better days, and to blindly trust the almighty grace from which they experience the silent protection so often. On the same day, both of them searched the bay that bore their palm tree with great diligence, and found five or six of the same kind, which here and there were full of golden grapes. The happy couple, like the children in this, think themselves immeasurably rich with their little treasure, with sweet jokes and merry wanderings through the valley of the palms, one evening after the other flies by. But the supply dwindled. A year, a year with Blay's feet. Needs to be replaced again, and, alas! With every day their need becomes new. Poor love can count itself lucky with little, needs nothing but itself than what nature needs to spin the thread of life, but if this is also missing, then the lack gnaws twice as sharply, and the all-powerful enchantment must melt away. With roots, which only hunger makes edible, they are often forced to nourish themselves many a day. Often, when, exhausted from searching, the young man returns to the cave at night, there is a handful of berries, a mew and egg, stolen from the steep nest, a half-eaten fish, stolen by the greedy water raven, all that happiness has to offer lets him find you, who shares his misery, to refresh herself in the throes of need. But this lack is not the only thing that offends them. A thousand little things are lacking day and night, the worth of which one does not think of when one owns it, although without them we wrestle with a thousand hardships. And then, lightly clad as they are, where shall they be safe from rain, storm, and wind, safe from every inclemency of the weather, and like winter's frost drive away five moons? Already the tree's ornaments of the later season are robbed. Already the rough wind is clattering between the dry leaves, and grey fog envelops the sun's powerless light, mixing air and sea, and the waves roar more violently on the shore, which hardly breaks their rage, often, when they are furiously furious with their hard chains the atomized stream splashes up to the foreheads of the rocks. Need is driving our couple out of their quiet bay, now higher into the mountains. But wherever they turn, the arid hunger's image encircles them from all ends, and blocks their flight. A circumstance comes along that, with sweet pain and anxious joy in this state of misery, now frightens her, now delights her Amanda has already carried the pledge of Huan's love three months under her heart. Often, when she stands before him, she silently presses her husband's hand to her breast, and smiles, holding back tears in her serious eyes. A new, more delicate bond weaves itself between them. She feels a quiet yearning full of new forebodings stretching the mother's bosom. What more intimately than what she ever felt, a dark foreboding of the motherly instincts, glows, shudders through her, and sanctifies her love. This sweet pledge of love is her pledge at the same time she will not be abandoned by him who loves what he creates in his great kingdom as father. She gladly bears the grievances of the unfamiliar status, carefully conceals them from Huan's gaze, and never shows him her grief, lets pure hope look in his cheerful eyes, and nourishes the languishing trust in his breast. It is true that he did not forget the high oath which he swore to heaven and a manden, but the deeper lies the oppressive weight, because worrying is now doubly his duty. Is there more need to pierce his heart with daggers than this touching face? If the hoped-for help does not show itself in a short time, then his wife, his child, is lost along with him. For many weeks not a day went by on which he did not climb the back of the rock tomb twenty times to look out to see, his last consolation. Alone, in vain he dulled his eyes, in the bosom of the boundless heights to spy a vehicle with strained eyes, the sun came, the sun left, the sea was empty no vessel was to be seen. Now only one remained. It seemed impossible, but what is impossible for someone who fights for everything? If every hair on his head were a death, his courage remained undiminished. Of this rock, whereupon Oberon banishes him. One side was still entirely unknown to him. A dreadful mingling of cliffs and ruins protected them that seemed inaccessible. Now that need presses on his soul, now they seem to him hills easily climbed, and even if it were Alps, love has wings. Perhaps that he will succeed in the daring, that his stubborn courage will force his way through all this wild entrenchment of nature, that will bring him to fertile fields, perhaps to friendly, compassionate beings. To spare a man a burden of worries, he hides from her the worst of the dangers, into which he intends to enter for the salvation of both of them. She herself bears her share of suffering silently. 
They said nothing when they parted, but farewell. So full was the heart of both, but his eyes show her a confidence that breaks through her sorrow like a ray of sunshine. There he now stands at the foot of the mountain peaks. They lie before him like the ruins of a world. A chaos of burnt-out cinders, into which a mountain of fire finally collapses, mixed with rocks that, broken a thousandfold, in wild immense splendor, sometimes rushing down deep into the territory of the old dark night, sometimes throbbing in the clouds. Only desperation paves the way here. Often he has to wrestle rocks with his hands, often between dizzyingly deep gullies, like chamois, he makes the cliffs into jetties, soon on the narrowest path, pieces of rock block his way and light, he must. Tired as he is. Retreat, now alone a bush, which he still grasps with torn hand, resists the fall from a wall. When his strength almost fails him, recalls the escaped spirits of a mandan's image. He stands still, breathing heavily, and thinks of you, and feels master of new strength. It does not go unrewarded, this true heroic heart. Gradually the path is smoothing before his steps, and against what he has already fought, what remains for him to fight is but jest. Canto 8. The first one had now climbed from the peaks, and before him, like a rocky ledge, highly arched by old fir tops, in still twilight lay a small, narrow valley. A shudder falls upon the languid, weary wanderer, as his faltering footsteps enter that gloomy sanctuary of solitude, him is, he enters the quiet realm of shadows. Soon a gently curving path, gradually descending, leads him to a narrow bridge. Far below her rolls over pieces of rock a white foaming stream, like a water wheel. Her Huan strides undeterred up the mountain to which the bridge leads and sees himself imprisoned in the heights where the possibility of a way out soon vanishes. The path by which he came will, as if by magic, be raptured from his eye. For a long time he wanders around searching, oppressed by silent fear, until through the bushes that nod from the crevices, an opening shows itself. Which as he soon finds, the beginning is of a narrow passage that goes through the rock around a spindle winds. Almost vertically, more than a hundred steps long. No sooner has he breathlessly climbed the last step. A paradise presents itself to his eyes, and before him stands a man of noble, serious features, with a long white beard and silver white hair. A wide belt closes the folds of the brown skirt, and a long rosary hangs from the belt. With this reputation, in such a place, it was quite natural to immediately take him for what he was. But Huan, weak with hunger, and stiff with weariness, and now, in these wild heights, where he waits so long in vain for the sight of people, and from the forehead of the rocks that stand all around before him, ancient fir trees only blow down on him suddenly surprised by a white beard really thinks he sees a face, and sinks to the ground before his presence. The hermit, scarcely less affected than Huan himself, trembles a step back, but he speaks, quickly composed, do you still hope for salvation from your pain, as your look and countenance tells me to believe, so say, what can I do for you, tormented spirit? How can I atone for you to unlock that port for you were? Untouched by torment, the pious rest forever. So pale and emaciated, embraced with want and grief when Huan shone, the offence into which the old father fell was all too easily committed. Alone, as both look straight into each other's eyes, and when the old man heard from Huan's mouth what brought him here. Although the sight of him says everything, he embraces him like a son, and warmly welcomes him to his hermitage, and leads him unbridled to a fresh spring which, pure as air and clear as crystals, gushes out of a rock near its roof, and while Huan is resting and quenching his thirst here, he hurries and picks the most beautiful fruits in a clean basket in his little garden, which, for the diligence in cultivating and tending them himself, a mild heaven gave him not sparingly, and does not cease to show his astonishment how one who has not screwed on two wings was able to scale the rocks where, for thirty years already, he believes himself as lonely as in his grave. It is a true sign that a good angel is protecting you, but, he adds, the most important thing now is to give the young woman a hand of consolation. A sure path, though so well hidden that without me no one easily discovers it, in half the time it took you to press up, shall bring you to her. Back both of you. What my heart, what my little paradise to your need is warmly offered to you. 
believe, the rest of innocence tastes sweet even on heather, and the blood flows purer with cabbage and lean pods. Lord Huan thanks the kind old man, who takes up his staff to show him the way himself, and so that the way back cannot confuse him, he marks the path with fresh fir branches. Before the golden sun sinks into the evening sea, Amanda has already climbed the sighing mountain, where she drinks the mild stream of the purest sky with thirsty, wide-open draughts. In another world, in the magic land of the fairies, she thinks she has been transported, it is as if she had never seen the sky so blue, the earth never so green, the trees never so freshly leafed, for here, in high rock shelters that circle around this place of pleasure, the autumn still succumbs to the wind from the north, and figs are still ripening, and bitter oranges are blooming. With a trembling breast, as before the genius of the holy place, falls down in front of the ice-grey old Amanda, and honours the thin handful of wrinkles, which he kindly extends to her with a pious kiss. In an involuntary outpouring her heart must take him for a father, fear is banished at the second glance, her is that they have known each other all their lives. In his appearance was the native dignity, which, unconcealed, shines even through a robe, his open gaze was a friend of all beings, and seemed accustomed to always looking skyward. Although the burden of the years gently bent his neck, inner peace rests on his eyebrows, and like a rock to which clouds never rise, his pure forehead seems to hover over the earth. The rust of the world, the trace of passions, has long since been washed away by the river of time. If a crown fell to him, and all he had to do was catch it with his hand as it fell, he didn't stretch out his hand. Closed to desire. Affected by no fear, by no pain, only the cheerful soul is still open to truth, only open to nature, and purely attuned to it. Alfonso he called himself before he was raised from the waves of the world, and Leon was the land that bore him. Raised to serve as a prince, he ran with thousands, deceived by appearances like them, after the deception that always hung before his hand, always disappeared when he grasped it, the shimmering ghost that eternally demands sacrifice, and, like the stone of the fool and that hope forever deceives. And when he pledged life's best time in the intoxication of self-deception to kings, and squandered property and blood, with fiery willingness and unrecognized loyalty, in their service, he saw quite unexpectedly, in the most beautiful dawn of favor, by snapping fall free from his chains, still happy to save life on at least one board from the shipwreck. In this storm that stole everything from him, a treasure remained to him. Whereby quite contrary to court custom Alfonso believed himself completely harmless. A loving wife, a friend, and a heart. Leave this one to me. Was now the only request that his satisfied heart dared to dare. For ten years what he asked was given to him, but his destiny was to survive this too. Dre's son, in the full urge of the first youthful strength, the image of his own youth. The hope of grey years, they were suddenly snatched away from him by the plague. Pain and grief soon put the mother on the stretcher. He lives, and there is none who weeps with the poor, for alas! His last friend left him too. He stands alone. The world that surrounds him is the grave of all the grave that he loved, that which he loved. He stands, a lonely tree defoliated by the storm, the springs where his joy's world have dried up. How could the hut now, when he was hardly happy, not have been terrible for him? What is the world to him now? Another empty space, fortune's lair, free to roll her will round. What should he be there longer? He broke his last staff, he has no more business than a grave. Alfonso fled to this inhospitable, deserted island, fled into these mountains with his senses almost destroyed, and found there more than he was looking for, first peace, and, with the quiet flow of the years, contentment at last. An old servant who didn't want to leave him. The only faithful soul that left him his misfortune, accompanied him here, and her dwelling was now a rock cave. Gradually his heart rose up out of the murky flood of grief. The sobriety, the stillness, the pure, open air, purified his blood, clouded his mind, enlivened his courage. He now felt that from the eternal fullness of life, balm, also for his wounds, welled up. Often the magic of a glimpse of the sun suddenly brought him back from the tomb of melancholy. And when he finally found this Elysium, which, surrounded by woods and rocks, planted a mild genius, right as for him, 
he suddenly felt relieved of all grief, from an anxious, dreamy, feverish night as at twilight of the eternal day awakens. Here, he cried to his friend, delighted by the unexpected sight of the beautiful place, here let us build huts. The tabernacle was built, and, with the passage of time, first provided for necessity, then for leisure, as befits the age of a wise man, who always desires less than he needs. For the fact that Alphonse, when he drew up the first plan of his escape, provided himself with equipment and iron, and everything that was necessary for the cover, is self-evident to everyone. And so he now spent the late autumn in work and enjoyment of life, busy in his garden, the source of his abundance, with a toil that turns him into lust to wait. Forgotten by the world, and only, as a play of childhood, remembering all the plagues which her service brought him blessed his days of health, innocence, rest, and pure self-confidence. After eighteen years his faithful companion died. He stayed alone. But all the more firmly did his quiet spirit now turn towards that world, to which everything he once loved now belonged, to which he himself already belonged more than to this one. Often in the quiet night, when before the outer sense the bodies lose themselves as in their first nothingness, he felt a spiritual touch on his cheek. Then his half-asleep ear heard, with dreadful delight, from deep in the grove, how angelic voices gently echoed to him. He will then feel the thin dividing wall fall that hardly separates him from his loved ones. His heart opens up, the holy flame burns up from his breast, his mind, in the pure light of the invisible world, sees heavenly visions. They continue even when the eyes are softly numbed asleep. Then when the morning sun opens up the scene of nature to him again, the previous mood still remains. A radiance of heavenly bliss transfigures rock and grove, shimmers through and fills you through and through, and everywhere, in all creatures. He then sees the image of the uncreated, as if the image of the sun surges in drops of dew. So at last imperceptibly flows earth and sky in his spirit into one. His heart awakens. In this deep distance from the turmoil of passion, in this holy night that encloses him, the purest of all senses awakens but who seals my bold mouth with an invisible hand, that nothing unnameable escapes from it. I remain silent at the edge of this abyss. Such was the pious old man before whom Amanda fell down in childish tendencies. He too, so long accustomed to seeing what the heart secretly yearns for, a human face, now delights in the dear, heart-touching, no longer hoped-for sight, and presses the daughter's gentle hand paternally embraces the new son for the second meal, and looks speechless thanks to the one who sent them to him, and leads them without hesitation to his resting place, to his spring, in his gazebos, covered with golden fruit and large purple grapes, and makes them possess all that he has. Nature, he says, needs far less than we think, no riches will satisfy those who are not satisfied with little, you will not miss anything desirable here, as long as the testing days last. He said this because the first glance showed him what he does not want to ask and Huan does not tell him. For both, once misery had half shed their blossoms, betrayed by form and disposition, if not a royal blood, but more certainly a value, from which even the omnipotence of happiness cannot rob nothing of the pure full content of the inner inborn goodness. The day has already changed its autumnal light three times since this sanctuary has cherished it in its bosom and neither of them can refrain from thinking that the old man who cares for them so kindly, is not really an old man, that he is a protective spirit, maybe her Oberyn himself, who forgets her mistake, and since she has atoned for it severely enough she thinks, soon decides to make her happy again. Now this delusion is gradually disappearing, and alas! dies with him, not without pain, the hope he nourishes, but their hearts cling to a human heart all the more closely. The good old man's heart was so gentle, his sympathy so tender, his inner sense so pure, it was impossible for them to be around him for six days and remain hidden from him any longer. The young man, in the throes of gratitude and trust especially since his host still hesitates to ask him boldly reveals his name, status, and what, since that time. When he slew the emperor's son at Montlery. Till this day happened with him, by what commission Karl intended death for him and how he happily accomplished it with Oberon's protection, and as in a dream love spun, which unites him with Regia at first sight, how he escaped with her from Babylon, and the prohibition that his exalted friend imposed on him, and how, 
as soon as he forgot it in a moment of love's thirst, all nature revolted against her and her protector's grace turned into vengeance. Well, says the noble old man. Well he whom his fate raises so lovingly, and at the same time so severely, as you, does not overlook the smallest misstep with impunity, well he. For quite certain, the purest earthly happiness awaits him. At hearts like yours don't be angry at Oberon forever. Believe me, my son, his eye hovers invisibly over you, earn his grace and it will be renewed. And how do I earn it? With what sacrifice do I still his anger? Huan quickly asks the old man, I'm ready, no matter how hard it may be. What can I do? Voluntarily abstain, Alphonse answers him, what you have sinned will only be atoned for. The young man turns pale. I feel it, says the old man with a gently blushing cheek, alone, I know from whom I ask it. A noble self-confidence seizes the young man, here is my hand. Not a word was spoken any more. And blessed is he who, after more than a hundred weeks, can testify to himself that he has not broken his vow. It was the nicest victory Huan ever won. But he is often afraid of blushing in front of the old man, often because of Rija's unwavering earnestness. Nothing so amuses the old man assures him the senses in peace with duty as diligent to tire them with work. Nothing throws them off track more easily than idle dreams. In order to forestall it, the sharp axe is taken without hesitation as soon as the day awakens, and wood is felled in the grove until the dark night. To set up another hut for a manden, and to seal the roof and walls well with glue and moss, then to the fireplace, which must always blaze, and for the hearth, to pile up the necessary abundance of fat pine and small split spruce high on the walls, this and many other things give the prince a lot to do, but it also helps him to rest all the better at night. At first he doesn't want to succeed in wielding the wooden axe instead of the night sword, the unfamiliar hand attacks everything harder, and a servant would have done it in half the time. But it increases every day, because practice makes perfect, and if he now and then feels close to succumbing, the thought blows, it's for Rija, his fire on again, and strengthens the weary spirits. While Huan wears himself out in the forest, the noble old man, who still bears the heavy burden of eighty years with his feet firmly, takes no rest, only that he is seldom far from the hut. No bright day escapes that does not see him busy doing this and that in his dear garden. A mandan's concern is to wait for the small hearth. Then one would see although if angels don't weave their likeness with a quiet gaze, who sees them here? With a cheerful face, on which sorrows only float like light little clouds, the king's daughter gladly submits to every lowly duty of the small household, also what she never knew, much less ever did. How quickly she grasps it, how everything suits her. She often folds her slender, swan white arm by the water trough in front of her hut door, without the least harm, so that her tender skin loses its beautiful enamel. The joy has sweet reward of keeping the fatherly old man and the beloved man in a position that frees them from the most oppressive poverty, ennobles them, you appreciate the lowliness of the day's work. And then she sees he too is one of those angels the holy old man who sweeps from his work, and blesses her, oh then her joy is purer and more intimate as if she were honoured three times more than she left at Baghdad. When then, by starlight, the night all three are united at the hearth of the fire, and on Amandan's lovely face, which stands half in the shadow, the flame shines again, then the young man rests on her, with a still, loving, enraptured look, and his soul swells, and sweet tears roll down the dark cheek. Desire is deeply silent. She is an unearthly being who appears to him for comfort, he is fortunate enough that he may love her. And oh! In every move, in every chaste look, that he is loved, read. Often they sit, the pious, friendly old man in their midst, Amanda his right hand in her left. And listen half the night to him, telling him about his long life's journey, a play that comes alive to him. From the part that the warm young souls take in everything, he himself gets warm about it then unnoticed two stories become three. Sometimes, to evoke the spirit of gloom, who, when the fields mourn in dull silence, lurks in the snowy clouds with owl's wings, lets Huan hear his art on a harp, which he found by chance in a corner, long unused, out of tune, and barely half-strung, 
but the rattling wood seems animated by Orpheus' spirit, as soon as Regia's song is married to him. A bright winter day often lured her, when the sea smoked from the severe cold in the distance, the dazzling white snow lay thick on the mountains, and now the evening sun bathed it as if in purple, then the beautiful shine lured her in the pure stream of cold air to bathe. How mightily strengthened they felt then! How completely cheered up, revitalized! And all grief discharged! Imperceptibly, the winter time slipped by. And now the earth wakes up from its long slumber, clothes itself anew in bright green, the forest, no longer a mute, desolate ruin, where only the pillars stand, the magnificent leafy vault and high shadowy corridors of the temple of nature. Stands full and beautiful again, and leaf presses against leaf in a lovely crowd. The bosom of nature is covered with flowers, the garden and the fields laugh in bloom. One hears the air resounding with vogel sang, the rocks are wreathed, the flowing crystals of springs trickle clean again on the fresh moss, through the evidence a grove, in the mild moonlight, the song of the nightingales shatters through the silent night. Amanda, whose goal is now drawing ever nearer, likes to seek solitude, seeks out quiet, dark paths in the grove, and thickly arching branches. There she often leans, depressed by forebodings, against a blossoming tree and enjoys the weaving and humming and crowding and general life in his lap and with anticipated joy presses a lovely child in spirit to her breast, a lovely child, who lavishly endows her mother's love with every sweet charm, already ahead of herself at every tender instinct that sprouts from him. Already feasts on the first smile, with which she thanks her for all the suffering that she so gladly bore for his sake, herself feasts on every beautiful feature in which the father's image sways gently between hers. Gradually the blissful dream is smothered by timid anxieties and silent griefs, which she can scarcely conceal from Huan, and yet conceals. O oh Fatma, she often thinks, and tears stand in her eyes, if you were with me in this need. Cheer up, O oh Rija. The fate that guides you has long since prepared the way to help you. Titania, queen of the fairies, from the day that defiance and defiance so unexpectedly betrayed her of Oberon's heart she had retired to this same mountain. With her husband, who renounces her by an oath, whom no spirit dares to break under the boundless arc of the heavenly azure, with his love and him all their happiness had fled. Too late now she weeps for the vain, hasty deed of the moment, feels with shamed cheeks the magnitude of their guilt, the grave high treason they committed against him and themselves. In vain does her pride fight against the stronger tenderness. Ah! She would fly skywide, and would willingly throw, to atone for her transgression, in tears at the feet of the enraged. What use is it to her? He swore, in water nor in air, nor where the twigs rain balsam in the grove of blossoms, nor where the gaunt griffin keeps watch in the eternally dark tomb of magical treasures, ever to meet her. In vain would even the belated remorse come to him, the oath he made binds him forever. No door remains open to her to reconcile him because of the only one, alas. What is to be hoped for? She's closed forever. Because only a loving couple, like none is, like never was nor will be, unlocks them. From weak Adam's children to hope for a loyalty that no storm can shake. A loyalty that no trial can lessen, no thrill can stun. Impossible. Desperate in the distant future your eyes heavy with tears will sink into your dark bosom, nothing can lessen their misery. She now hates the elf joke, the dance in the moonlight, hates beautiful May in her rose dress. Her forehead no longer adorns myrtle wreaths. The sight of every joy tears open their wounds. She flutters back and forth through the emptiness of the wide air in the stormy wind, finds no rest anywhere, and searches with a sad look for a place that suits her melancholy. Finally you discover yourself in the great ocean of this island. Piled up of black monstrous ruins, it lures them by its blackness to steer the mad flight there. It's true to her sense. She tumbles down from the air and throws herself into a dark tomb, in order to weep away her existence undisturbed, and, under rocks, to petrify herself where possible. Seven times since Titania dies leading a sad life. The earth has become younger without her noticing. As on a sacrificial herd, she lies there on a stone, awaiting death the day rises and falls, the lovely shade sun enchantingly illuminates the rocks around them, in vain. 
The fountains of all bliss flowed over her at once, her heart remained empty of bliss. The only thing that you, with a dream of the shadow of consolation, still sweetens your eternal sorrow, is that perhaps the condition of your husband is like hers. And he may atone even harder. Certainly he still loves her. And oh! If he loves, he, condemned by himself to be the creator of her pain and his own torment, how wretched must he be! So wretched that she gladly forgives him her share. But since time, the great comforter, has the true balm for every wound of the soul, how deep it burns, the hour finally came for Titania too, when her dulled mind gradually unclouded, her heart suffered more patiently, and her imagination dresses in green again, she gives way again to the flattery of hope, and what seemed impossible now becomes her morning dream. Suddenly you dread these dark chasms, in which she once liked to see herself imprisoned, a part of the cliffs must quickly vanish from her eyes, and an Elysium stands there blooming before her. At her soft call, three lovely sylphids appeared to serve her, a sisterly dray that dissipates her grief, and consecrates herself to the abandoned, more out of love than duty. The paradise that the queen of the fairies created for herself in these rocks was precisely that where Alfonso had lived for thirty years. And, unaware of him, it was the grotto where she was enthroned, from which, carried through the bushes by the night wind, the lovely song, like angels' voices, echoed to him. It was she that flowed past him unseen when he felt a spiritual ache on his cheek. Our lovers too, from the day the waves carried them to this island, she had noticed, and made inquiries of them every day, late and early. Often, when those who thought they were alone, she often stood unseen to instruct one another more closely, and what she heard and saw made her doubt whether they were perhaps the couple she was expecting. The longer she notices her behavior, the more she strengthens in her hope. If Yuan and Amanda are not the true probationary souls that Oberyn desires, she may only forgive herself forever. From now on they are as valuable to her as her eyes, and she resolves to help the noble young woman invisibly with her little fairies. The hour came. Driven about by dull anxiety, Amanda strays in the bushes that scatter the huts around the huts with a lovely mixture of fragrance for the morning sacrifice. She strays on, as the narrow path winds. Until she finds herself unnoticed in front of a grotto. Which is lightly wreathed in a web of ivy, on whose dark enamel the morning sun shines. Alfonso had often tried to go in before, and always in vain, this was exactly what happened to his old friend, Huan himself, as often as he tried to be sure of the miracle. They had seen nothing, they only felt a strange resistance, as if an invisible gate were pushing forward, while they wanted to force their way in. A wondrous horror quickly overcame them, they quietly crept away, and no one wanted to dare the test anymore. It's not known if Amanda herself has tried before, enough, she could not resist the thought of being the first to succeed, she pushed away the tendrils of ivy with a light hand, and went in. No sooner did she see herself in it than a secret trembling came over her, she sank on a soft seat of roses and moss. Now she feels, lightning after lightning, a piercing pain shaking bones and marrow. It passed. A pleasant fatigue followed. It was like moonlight in front of her gaze, which always plunges into deeper shadows, and, gently losing herself, she fell asleep. Now lovely, confused shapes dawn within her, which soon flee past, now wonderfully fold into one another. You think she sees three angels kneeling before her, administering her hidden mysteries, and a woman, shrouded in rose-coloured light, standing beside her whenever she is breathless, holding a bunch of roses to her mouth. For the last meal, her beating heart oppresses a brief, gently muffled pain. The images fade away and she loses herself again. But soon, awakened by the echo of sweet songs that escapes half-blown from her ear, she opens her eyes in her dream and no longer sees Didre, only sees the queen of the fairies in rose glow smiling softly before her. In her arms lies a newly born child. She hands it to a manden and before her eyes, as in the morning wind, a cloud melts from the scent of flowers. In the same instant Amanda awakens from her dream and stretches out her arms as if she wanted to grasp the hem of the rosy robe, for free. She's gasping for air, she's left alone. Yes, one more beat of the pulse, and how indescribably great is their astonishment, their delight. She hardly believes the feeling, she hardly trusts her looks. 
she feels relieved of her burden, and wriggling on her gentle lap lies the most beautiful boy, fresh as a morning rose and as beautiful as love. With a trembling of joy she feels her heart rising towards him. She feels it, it's her son. Bathed in tears of heartfelt joy, she presses him to cheek, mouth, and breast, and can't get enough of looking at the boy. The boy also seems to understand his mother. At least let her enjoy the sweet delusion. He looks at you so eloquently out of his bright eyes, and doesn't his little mouth seem to suck every kiss from hers? She hears the silent call, how softly a mother's heart hears. And follows him uninstructed. With a lust that, if they could envy, the angels who look down on her, the angels themselves called enviable, she lays the lovely baby on her breast. She guides instinct, and now lets her heart fully feast on the joys of the tenderest sympathy. Meanwhile your Huan has searched for her all over the grove for too long, anxious hours, and since he found her nowhere, his mad foot finally leads him here. He approaches the inaccessible grotto, nothing stops him, he comes, oh, what a moment! And sees the lovely woman, with a god of love on her breast, engrossed, swallowed up in her happiness. You, to whom nature, at the entrance into this life, the exuberant substitute for all other happiness, the captive treasure, which all the gold of the Aurangzeban cannot buy, the best in the world what it has to give, and what follows you into a better life, given a feeling heart and pure mind, look and see, the holy curtain falls. Canto 9. It is now time to look around for fat men, who, since Rija threw herself into the sea with Huan, left in the ship, alone and empty of all consolation, weeping day and night for the fate of their wives, and of course her own too. Because ah! She cries, she screams, she tears her hair in vain. It's gone, gone with a single breath, the whole edifice of the rest of her life. What shall become of her, alone in a ship, surrounded by unbridled sons of the rough sea, who mock her sorrows, with bold eyes already, intoxicated with fiery wine, devour her prey, what will her fate be? Luckily, the beauty bereft of protection has pity on an unexpected storm, which on the second night makes the sea a playground for outraged waves. The pink one drifts, while a general hesitation unnerves the people, chased around on the uncertain sea, now west, now south, to and fro, until, when the fury of the winds has been exhausted in seven dreadful days, the captain sees himself on the beach of Tunis. To turn the coincidence, which surprises him at the wrong time, into advantage, he decides to treat fat men here as a slave. For fat me, who scarcely four and thirty times saw May unfold his flower dress, was one of the number of long-blooming figures, who neither wither nor grow old so easily, and who with charms of weight, much fire in their eyes, many dimples in the face, to indemnify you for the rosy splendor of youth. The king's gardener happened to come to the place where everything for a hundred sultanas could be bought. It seemed worthy of notice. He went up, looked at it, and found it to be a treasure. His grey head was not consulted. Nothing was missing, it seems to him, in his gilistan than just this. The gold is swiftly weighed, and Fatmi silently endures what she cannot change. Meanwhile, faithful Sherasmin pursues the commanded course with a steady wind. As soon as Massilian's port received him safely, he mounted his horse and hurried as fast as if his life were at stake to the emperor in Paris. He had already climbed the mountain of the martyrs and saw the city still lying dormant in the morning red, when suddenly his head struck a doubt. Stop, said his spirit to him, and before we trot on, consider well what you are about to do, my son. Your wise head should have already considered this in Ascalon, although the wind that blew there in Huan's sails told you left little time to think about it. But if we want to be honest with each other, you should have resisted in a completely different way then. Because. Between us, there is obviously no human sense in this ambassade. The emperor, who was previously never in favour of us, is certainly embittered in the highest degree. In the end it would only be a waste of the rich casket. For, truly, with a handful of goat's hair, and with those teeth there, God knows from what jaws. Your Excellency will make very little impression. Yes, if Mr. Huan himself, with a stately escort of horses, trabants and so on, and with the caliph's daughter at his side, had stepped in, and had himself spoken, 
and with appropriate grimaces, like a knight, befitting duke and peer, on red velvet, heavy with golden tassels, handing things over, then I wanted to let it count. There comes the splendor of the procession, the solemnity, the splendor of the sultan's daughter, holding the hand of the proud husband, in short, every circumstance benefits the other, and contributes its part to making the thing round and round. Carlin has no further objections, he has faith in his eyes and in his hands, the knight has kept his word as a man, and freely demands what no right can deny him. All of this will suddenly fall apart, friend Sherisman, if you are not smarter than the one who sent you. All right, what advice? What is to be done? The best thing would be. In any case. He sneaked out with his little box very gently before anyone noticed him, and rode at a long trot straight to Rome. The haven of all the pious, where hopefully his master has arrived in the meantime. Thus said his better genius to Shirazmin, and since, after much deliberation, he had nothing wiser to oppose to him than he thought, his final decision was to show the scapula to the good city of Paris, and spurred on to Rome to his lord to travel. He crosses the Alps, arrives, and immediately his first course is, to the late Rhin. Alone, in vain does he tire the Swiss who is on guard at the gate with questions about his master, in vain the whole front room, no one can say a word to him about Knight Huan. In vain he runs the city from house to house and all churches and hospitals questioning, and describes him from heel to head to the people, all his effort is in vain. For four eternal weeks, and then two more, he dwells in hope that is always betrayed, does N.T. let himself or others rest a day inquiring whether his prince hasn't arrived yet, and, since there is no waiting. He begins to curse loudly the great oath of the Basque people. And swears, as far as the sky is blue, to seek out the knight in a pilgrim's robe. What else could he do? His money was gone, and just to touch a pearl from the casket that cheaply has a hundredfold value in Huan's eyes, because Oberon admires it before he let his skin be stripped off. Neither gold nor silver money is coveted by a pilgrim, he can pay half the world with mussel shells and Latanian. So now for two years and more the faithful, indefatigable old man begs himself through the world, along and across the world. And stops at every port, on every island, asks everywhere in vain for his master and his lady until his last star, and a secret impulse that stirs up his hope, leads to Tunis in front of the old gardener's door. He sits there on a stone bench, to rest a little in the shade, tired and weak from long fasting, and a slave girl brings him some bread and wine. She looks the man in the brown pilgrimess dress in astonishment, and he looks the slave girl in the eye as well, and, recognizing each other with a cry of terror and joy, they throw their arms around each other. Is that you fat me? exclaims joyfully against her wet cheek the pilgrim, is it possible? Oh! For a long time Sherismin let hope go away. Is it possible that we shall meet again in Tunis? What wind has blown you into these heathen lands? And where is Huon and Amand? Ah, Sherismin, shouts fat me loudly, and bursts into tears, you are, poor me. Don't ask. What are you saying? Cries the old man, God forbid. What are you? Speak. Oh, Sherismin, they are dash. She doesn't bring out more. The faltering blossoms suffocate the red in her breast, you are. Oh God! Sobs Sherismin, and weeps like a child on Phaeton's neck in her full bloom. This is too hard. But for a long time nothing good was in store for me. Fat me oh, the rehearsal was too hard. As soon as the good woman has enough breath for the pathetic report, she tells it bit by bit, from his departure to the moment of the horrible night there, by the flaring light of the lightning. Rija through all the people, the dense crowd presses on Huan, throws himself, throws his arm around his beloved in love's frenzy and drags him with him into the wild flood, the sad story. Then they sit together for an hour, complaining and crying to their heart's content, and both, out of true love, to unite at the price of the most beautiful couple that ever adorns the world. No, she exclaims repeatedly, never, I'll never see a woman like this again. Nor shall I, exclaims Shirazmin in the same melody, ever stand by a prince's son like him. Finally. After he had been told three times how everything happened. A faint gleam of faith dawned on him, and gave him hope that perhaps they both might be saved. 
The more he thinks about it, the less he realizes that Oberon will leave them forever. In all that he did for her was intention, as he thinks, and a secret plan. With this faint glimmer of hope, which shines on him like a distant light in the deep night, he decides never to part with fate, and, united with her by the same pain, awaits destiny's explanation here in Tunis. By their advance he exchanges pilgrim's staff and robe for a slave's doublet and a grave's crest, and serves in the royal garden for a day's wages. Meanwhile, Fatmi and the brave sheriffs in the fields of flowers that they build, as their loved ones' graves, often due with tears, behold Huan, since his testing fate banished him to that hermitage full of grace and horror, not blooming the third spring without grief. It is impossible for him to wean his heroic heart, to yearn with might and main for the tumult of the world. Little Hornet, the most beautiful hybrid of maternal charm and paternal strength, that ever hung on a goddess' neck, and yet destined to other daily work than going into the wood with the axe on his shoulder, only increases his sorrow. You too. O oh Reja, in nights without sleep, your angel often overhears you weeping in silence. Both of you deeply feel in this youthful blossom, that seclusion is unnatural to you, feel the strength for nobler deeds in your breast, missing the heroic spirit, the unlimited kindness like the unlimited circle. In vain do they strive the tears that crept away from the averted eye to hide from the old father, her smile doesn't deceive him, he reads their souls. And though this world is nothing more to him, yet he puts himself in your place. In what they lost, what belongs to them, what they feel born to fills from your breast, and counts the tears that they hold as just hide from him out of love, do not blame the involuntary impulses, and only refresh them to quiet hope as long as fate hinders their course. One evening once, the day's work was done, and all three amand with the boy on her lap to refresh themselves in the magnificent splendor of the bright starry sky, they sat in front of the hut on a grass bank, immersed themselves with foreboding horror into this wondrous sea, and looked silent thanksgiving to him who created them looking up to heaven, then the pious old man, with a more touched tone than usual, began to speak of this life on earth as a dream, and of floating across, into true being. It was as if a breath of heavenly air were already blowing over to him, and carry him gently up as he spoke. Amanda feels it, her eyes overflow. It is as if she were looking after the half-disappeared man. To me, he continued, they reach out their hands to me from across the bank already, my run is soon at an end, yours is hardly beginning, and a lot, a lot of misery still, also a lot of the best joys, often it's just strengthening for new greater suffering await you while you approach the goal unnoticed. Both pass, and become a dream, and nothing accompanies us across, nothing but the good treasure that you have gathered in your hearts, truth, love and inner peace, and the memory that neither pleasure nor pain ever separated you from the faithful attachment to your duty. So he still spoke many things, and when at last they went to rest, he seemed to press them more warmly to his heart, and a tear glimmered in his eye as he hastily departed from them. That very night, startled by dark forebodings of the future, Titania lifted her eyes heavenward and all the roses fell from her cheeks as she stood and saw and read. She called to her lovely playmate to see with her what happened in that instant, and how Amman's stars are already joining together in unhappy pregnant features. And, thickly veiled in shadow, she flies swiftly to the camp where the king's daughter lies between the almond trees the boy beside her, often awakened from her sleep by foreboding dreams. Titania touches the sleeper's breast so that the unrest beating within her be silent with her rose branch, and snatches away the boy who feels nothing of it. She comes back with her beautiful booty, and speaks to her graces, you see the cruel star that stands above a manden. Hurry! Save this child in my loveliest arbor, and take care of it as if it were my own son. Then she pulled out three rosebuds from the wreath around her forehead, gave each lovely whore a little bud, and said, away, it's already getting dark. Do as I have told you, and look at your roses every day and every hour, and when you see all three becoming lilies, remember that I am reconciled with Oberyn and reconnected again. Then hurry here with Amanda's son, for her need has disappeared with mine. The nymphs bowed down and quickly fled away in a cloud with Huan's son. As soon as the morning had come, Amanda, with trembling, restless longing, sought her friend, who had his bed in a rock, far from Alfonso and her. 
She hurries away so quickly that she forgets which has never happened since she was a mother in sheer haste to look around for her son, who is still her bedfellow, and sleeps peacefully she thinks first. She finds her husband wandering in the garden, and both of them immediately run, hiding what they do to the old father's cell. How does their heart beat as they slowly approach his bed? He lies, his hands folded over his heart, breathless, his face pale and gaunt, but noble every feature, and pure, and without pain. He just slumbers, says Rija, and lays his hand so lightly that it hardly touches him, on his hand, and, since she feels it coldly and no more veins stir, she sinks in quiet melancholy onto the pale, frozen corpse, a stream of tears breaks out of her eyes and bathes his face. Oh father, she cries, you have left us. She pulls herself up and sinks on Huan's breast. And now both of them throw themselves down by the cold shell of the purest soul, in reverential silence, and satiate the painfully sweet desire to weep often press his hand to finally leave the last inch of love, and always, never full of missing emotion, stand by the beloved picture as if enchanted. It was as if they saw the twilight of a new life on his face, and as if from the pure light of heaven weaving the reflection around his forehead, which already refines the earthly substance to the spiritual body, and around the quiet mouth, which is just about the last blessing still seeming to close gently, an immortal barely visible smiles hovering. Isn't it the same with you exclaims Huan, as if delighted, to a man den, looking upwards as if a ray from that world were falling into your soul. So I never felt the sublimity of human nature. Never before was this life on earth only a path through a dark cave into the realm of light. Never such strength in my breast for every good work. To every sacrifice, every quarrel never this strength, never this cheerfulness to fight my way through all trials as a man. Let it be, beloved, that tribulation still awaits us it draws nearer to the goal. Nothing should see us discouraged nothing dampen this belief. So he speaks. Departing with her from this holy place, and fate takes him at his word. For as they come out of the cell hand in hand, and lift up their eyelids, God! What a sight presents itself to their eyes! Into what strange world are they transported? Gone, completely gone is her Elysium, the grove, the flower field. They stand there petrified. Is it possible no trace, even the sight is no longer found? They stand at the edge of a chasm, surrounded by overhanging broken crags wherever they shudder. No more grass where her garden once stood. The lovely bushes are destroyed, the dark nightingale forest destroyed. Nothing left but a ghastly mixture of craggy cliffs, black and desolate and shapeless. To what new scenes of misery does this dreadful spectacle prepare them? Ah! They cry, and, heavy with tears, raise their sorrowful gaze to the holy old man. This mountain was clothed in spring adornments for him, that Eden was planted for him, for his sake we only enjoyed it, and fate and nature pursue us anew as soon as he departs from us. I am composed, Rija calls, and snatches back an O that rises from her breast. Unfortunate. The day that brings all this misfortune has not yet shown you the most terrible thing. She hastens to the boy whom she lately, sweetly slumbering as she thinks left. He is her last consolation, fate's hardest blows she goes confidently, with him on her arm. She flies to the camp where he lay by her side, and, as if struck by lightning, she staggers back, the boy's gone, the camp empty. Did he pull himself together? Did he find the door open and looked for it? Oh God! If he had had an accident, terrible. But perhaps there was around the hut so she thinks between fear and hope perhaps in the garden only the little one lost. In the garden. Oh. That is now rocky ruin. She rushes out and, with trembling lips, calls loudly for the boy to take, searches for him all around, in mortal fear, in caves and on cliffs. The father whom Shrain called here speaks to her in vain the consolation that he himself brought he will certainly find himself healthy and fresh again all at once in these rocky outcrops. Two hours already all her efforts were in vain. Oh! In vain, shouting loudly, they roam deep in the mountains, climb all the peaks, crawl through all the cracks in the rocks, and, in order at least to find his grave, let themselves sorrowfully descend into every chasm, ah! 
No trace of him is discovered in her eyes, and her own sound echoes back from the rocks. The inconceivable chance of a child of his old age losing himself in a place where neither wild beasts nor men often wilder than they are terrible increases their fear, but it also nourishes her hope, it can't be otherwise. He just got lost. And perhaps fell asleep on some rock, tired from hiking, in his innocence. Again the whole rocky ridge is searched with hawk eyes. Every corner, every bush that maybe hides it. The restlessness drives them even, however improbable the hope of finding him alive there. Down to the beach, where, beneath the mixture of piled sand and swampy bushes, they at last, unnoticed, lose each other themselves. Suddenly Amandan's ear is startled by an unfamiliar sound. You think it was like the sound of voices. But, because it got lost again, and she was pretty close to a waterfall that tumbles over the edge from a high rock arch with a deafening roar, she thinks she has deceived herself. You don't suspect anything of greater danger, your only thought is your son's life, and suddenly, having scarcely come round a hill, beside the waterfall, she sees, dismayed, surrounded by a rude band of black and yellow men, and behind a high reef she sees a rowing ship anchored in the bay. Shortly before they had anchored here to take water, and were still busy with it, when, with hasty steps, suddenly a woman appeared before their eyes, made to shame the most beautiful at first sight. Astonishment seemed to paralyze them all. To see a young woman who resembles a goddess in this desolate place. Which the boatman usually flees. The sight of beauty softens otherwise rough souls, and tigers nestle at their feet, but these feel nothing. Your dull sense of robbers calculates the value of the most beautiful women's pictures of marble or flesh, it doesn't matter. With cold blood just according to the market price. Just like other merchants' goods. Here, cries the captain, ten thousand sultanas can be earned with one touch, as good as a hundred. Come on, children, grab it. Such a face as this is worth to us in Tunis more than twenty rich bales, the king, as you know, loves such nightingales, and this savage here has none of the beauties in his harem. You reach Almansaris, the queen, beautiful as she is, certainly the water hardly. How will the sultan burn? Chance would have dared us. Can't lead better. While the centurion spoke this unto his people, stand Regia, and think two moments what is here to choose. If these people are enemies, fleeing will not help me, since they are so close, perhaps generosity and prayer will win them over. I go and address them as friends, as saviors sent to us by heaven. Perhaps it is our luck that they landed here. Thinking of this, with innocent calm in open eyes, and with confident steps, the noble, beautiful woman approaches the corsairs but they remain deaf to their gentle entreaties. The language that speaks to all hearts won't stir their iron, dehumanized souls. The captain waves, she is surrounded, seized, and everything runs and runs to ship the booty. At their wretched cries, which echo through the rocks, Huan flies down the forest in terror, to their aid hereby. Quite beside himself, as soon as the trees no longer hide him, he grabs the first knotted stick that lies in front of him and rushes like a thunderbolt out of the bosom of the clouds at the barbarians. To see his lovely wife, who with bloodthirsty arms struggles between robbers' paws, the sight that drives him to tiger rage soon makes the oak stick in his fist warm. The pranks fall like hail on heads and shoulders with falling weight. He seems no mortal, his eye spurt sparks, and seven moors have already fallen before him. Consternation, shame and wrath, to see the beautiful robbery snatched from one man, encourages all others to attack Huon, who, as long as he can still move his arms, defends himself irrepressibly, until, when his stick falls from him in the crowd, the overwhelming crowd although he frantically hits and kicks and bites himself finally overwhelms him and pulls him completely to the ground. With a cry to heaven, Amand faints, as she thinks she sees him strangled. They are dragged to the ship, while the people on the beach storm on the fallen, and rage and snort revenge. Giving him a quick death, even if it were the bloodiest, she thinks kindness, no, exclaims the captain, to die the longer the most cruel death, if he should live. They drag him deep into the forest, so far from the beach that even his loudest cry cant reaches ears, and they tie him with ropes around his arms and legs, 
around his neck and back, to a tree. The unfortunate looks up to heaven, silent and crushed by the burden of his misery, and loudly rejoicing the barbarians go to Tunis with their beautiful spoils. Canto 10. The day is already sinking, and morning the night are. No longer confidential in sweet heartfulness spent by lovers and friends compassionately throws its saddest covering around the desolate island, where from the deep stillness now no more morning song of joy awakens, only a forsaken of everything he loves, who performs the most terrible duties by quiet endurance. Titania, veiled in a cloud, hears him groaning in long pauses from deep in the forest, sees the unfortunate man gnawing in mute fear, and turns away from him. Because, ah! In vain your tender heart swells with heartfelt pity. A stronger spell pushes you away from him with unstoppable arms, and as she hovers over the beach, a gold ring flashes out of the sand in front of her. Amanda. Wrestling with the sons of robbery, had unseen it slipped off her finger. The elven queen, seizing him, recognizes the talisman that all spirits indulge in. Soon, she exclaims happily, the measure of fate will be full. Soon the stars will reconcile you to me, beloved. This ring once bound us, he shall crown you for the second supper as my lord. Meanwhile in the ship, with great difficulty, a manden, who was fainting, had been brought back to life. Scarcely did she begin to lift up her heavy eyes disconsolately, so the centurion fell on his knees before her, and begged her not to succumb to grief any longer, it is your happiness, he said, only of which I am instrument in a few days you will be our queen. Do not worry from us, we are only there to protect you and to serve you, to own you, most beautiful, is only worth Almansa, who is like you in charms. He will lie in your chains at first sight, and, believe my word, you'll be pleased to see him at your feet. The centurion speaks it, and gives her to allay any suspicion she may harbour a rich cloth to wrap herself in completely. He is dead he continues, with a look and tone that makes all the people on board tremble who dares to commit crimes and lays his hand on this veil. Consider her from this moment as a jewel that already belongs to Almansorn. He says so and pulls back, kneeling, so that she can rest undisturbed. Amanda, not listening to the robber's word, motionless, dazed by her misfortune, sits, hands on her forehead, arms resting on her knees, with staring, tearless, dead eyes there. Your grief is too great to speak, your strong heart too tender to bear. Oh! She cannot endure this last blow. She's sinking, but she's sinking without complaining. She looks around for consolation, and finds none, empty and hopeless, a night, like her soul, is everything, everything around her, the whole world is turning into a murderer's den. She stares up at heaven even he has no consolation, no longer has an angel. At the abyss of despair where she floats, death alone still stands. Lifting her as she sinks. Pityingly he extends his emaciated hand to her. The last, most faithful friend of the suffering. She climbs down with him into the quiet land of shadows, where all pain, where all lamentation is silent, where no chain robs the free soul anymore, the scenes of this world vanish like children's dreams, and nothing remains of her but our heart, there she will find everything she loved again. She lies there like a bleeding lamb, silently patient, and sighs for the last moment, when, in the still night, Titania approaches her, bringing comfort. An invisible rain of slumbering scents strengthens the beating heart of the beautiful sufferer Matt, and imperceptibly sleeps the outer sense. There she sees the elf queen in her rose light in a dream vision. Up! She speaks, take courage. Your son and your husband they still breathe are not lost to you. Recognize me. When you see me again for the third meal, then what Oberon swore will be fulfilled by your faithfulness. You will end our pain, and as we are happy, so will you be. With this word the goddess melts into the air, but where she stood, her rose scent still blow. Armand wakes up, recognizes from her scent and rose shine, which only gradually fades. The godlike woman, who in the rock tomb, unexpectedly, formally stood by her. Moved, ashamed of this new protection, her heart seizes with grateful trembling this pledge of her son's and her Huon's life, and now defy every fate with it. Ah! If she knew what remains hidden from her for her happiness, 
How miserable this night your unfortunate friend, tied to an oak trunk with a sevenfold rope, spent, how her heart breaks. And he, before whose eyes nothing is dark, the good guardian spirit, stays. He stands at the source of the Nile, on a rocky peak, which, forever cloudless, divides the purest air. Turning his serious gaze to the island where Huan languishes, the spirit prince stands and hears his groaning, which trembles towards him from far away, looks at the morning star, and sighs and wraps himself up. Then, out of the horde of spirits, some singly, some in rings, accompanying and circling around him everywhere, one approaches him who was his confidant. Pale, without splendor, the sylph approaches. Gazes upon him in silence, and his eyes inquire of the sorrow that oppresses his king, because or keeps him from daring to ask the question out loud. Look up, Oberon speaks. And with the word in a cloud, which drives past with outstretched wings, points to the dismayed spirit of poor Huan's image as in a mirror. Sunk in deepest need, bleeding from the open wounds of his heart, he stands there, abandoned and bound in the desolate forest, and dies a long martyr's death. In this hopeless situation, his soul still swells with the angry feeling, do I deserve this? Did a man deserve it? Is our misery only a game for higher beings? How unsympathetic remains my terrible suffering, how calm everything around me? No being feels with me, not a grain of sand moves out of its place by the sea, not a leaf in these leafy buildings falls off because of me. A sharp pebble would be to cut my bond sufficient, ah. In the whole space of time there is no hand that lends him movement for it. And yet, if it were your will to turn my need around, O oh you, who so often snatched me from death when I least hoped it, all the branches in this forest would be at your hand at your nod. One holy shudder flashes through his bones with this heavenly spark, the ropes fall off, he sways, as if intoxicated, into an arm that supports him invisibly. It was to the spirit that Oberon showed the story of the faithful pair in picture. That rendered this service unseen to him. The son of light succumbed to the pitiful sight. Oh! He cried, deeply saddened, and fell at his master's feet, as punishable as he was. Can you, who loved him, close your big heart from his distress? The son of earth is blind to the future, replies Oberon, we ourselves, you know, are only servants of fate. In holy darkness, high above us, his hidden path goes, and, willingly or not, a secret compulsion draws us all to follow in the dark. In this chasm that separates me from Huan, I'm only allowed to do one more thing for him. Fly and untie him, and carry him on the spot, just as he is, to Tunis, before the threshold of old Ibrahim, who, near the city, keeps the gardens of Sarai in his charge. There lay him on the bench of stones, hard against the hut door, and hurry away again, but beware of appearing to him, and do it quickly. And don't speak a word to him. The sylph comes, as quickly as an arrow from the bow reaches the target, flies near Huan, breaks his bands, loads himself with him, and carries him, over sea and land, through the air to the door of old Ibrahim, then he shakes him from his strong hips onto the bench, as gently as on plum. What happens to the good knight seems like a dream. He looks around in amazement and tries to make it true, but everything he sees confirms his delusion. Where am I? He asks himself, afraid to wake up. Meanwhile, not far from him, a rooster begins to crow, and soon the second and the third, the silence flees, heaven's golden gate opens, the god of the day emerges, and everything around the hut is alive and stirring. Suddenly the door creaks, and there comes a tall man with a grey beard, but fresh and red of cheeks, a log in his hand, gone out of the house, and both see at the same time what no one can believe, Mr. Huan his faithful old man in a slave's doublet, the good sherrisman the worthy gentleman, whom he thought dead, in a dress that didn't seem auspicious. Is it possible? They both exclaim at the same time, my best sir. My friend. How do we find each other here? And, beside himself with joy, the old man clasps the prince's knees and weeps on his hand. To embrace him warmly Huan bends down to him, lifts him up to himself, and kisses his cheeks. Praise God, shouts Sherismin, now I know that you are alive. What good wind carried you to this threshold? But the place here is not suitable for storytelling, come, dear sir, 
with me to my cell before anyone sees us here together. In any case, you are my nephew Hassan, he whispers in his ear a young merchant from Halep, who lusted to see the world, and was shipwrecked, and only escaped with his life. Yes, unfortunately. I have nothing left, Huan sighs, but a life that is no good deed. That will all work itself out, replies Sherasmin, and hastily pushes his little room over to him, and shuts himself up with him. There, he says, sit down, then brings the best that his small storage cellar can do. Herbay, on a plate, olives, bread and wine, and sits next to him and tells him to be happy. My good sir, that after all the tricks that fortune played on us, we suddenly find ourselves here in Tunis, in front of the gardener's hut door, Ibrahim, is a sign that Oberon wants to bring us all together again, quite unnoticed and quiet. The best is still missing, but, as a pledge for Amanden, at least the wet nurse is already there. What are you saying? exclaims Mr. Huan full of joy. The same Ibrahim to whom I serve, she serves as a slave here, replies Sherasmin. How the good woman will feast her eyes on you. Then he begins to tell him what he has suffered and done in all that time, and what made him, unachieved, move away from Paris again. And how he looked for him in the late ran in Rome, and, waiting for him there for many weeks without fruit, squandered his little money unnoticed, then, decked out with shells. Begged his way through half the world as a pilgrim. Until his good spirit finally brought him here, where Fatmi, whom he unexpectedly found, to await a better time with him connected. Luckily the casket that the beautiful dwarf in Ashkelon adores has always been carried along unharmed he adds, for, as I see, the horn and cup have fled. Forgive me, dear sir. I hit the sore spot, it wasn't pretty for me to blurt out so freely, the joy of having found you makes me gossip, alone, you know my heart, and now not a word more. The noble prince's son shakes his good old man's hand and says, I know your loyalty, you should know everything, friend. I don't want to hold you back, alone, above all, stand by me in one thing. The casket that you have given me is rich in jewels. Don't you think it would be best if I hurriedly got a horse and weapons and knightly ornaments in Tunis? Twelve hours have scarcely been since a band of robbers snatched a manden from me, alone with her and unarmed on the most desolate beach. Perhaps they will lead them to these Moorish lands. To Maroc or Fez? Certainly to a place where there is hope to sell them dearly, but no harem shall take my highest treasure from me, even if I should traverse the whole world. The old man ponders the matter in silence. So the area where you and Rija were staying is only a few hours away from here. Not that I know of, said the young prince, maybe it's a thousand hours. I don't know who carried me, infinitely fast, but probably a ghost from a forest here, where the robbers tied me to a tree. No other arm has done this, he exclaims, the Oberon. I myself, says the knight, I trust him and take it as a promise that he will do even more. As bitter as the separation is, as terrifying is the image of the lovely woman in the wild robber's claws, this new wonder, friend, fills my revitalized heart with hope and confidence. He would have to be heartless, made of stone, and without sense, and utterly unworthy of heaven's trouble for his sake even if he had only heard half of what happened to me who was still capable of harboring faint-heartedness and suspicion would be. My dark path goes through fire or flood, I keep faith and courage. Only today, dear Sherisman, if it is possible, get me a sword and a horse. For too long I've been without both. At the side of love indeed, but now, in this expanse of Regia, my heart's blood seems to me to stand lazy like a swamp, until I've chased the beautiful booty from the heroes. Your life and my happiness, think about it, maybe depends on a moment. The old man swears to him that it shouldn't be up to him to enjoy the prince's impatience today. But unexpectedly. A tiresome coincidence stops his zeal on the first evening. For Huan felt so many tremors, which followed blow after blow, all at once conquered, and, languid and glowing, without rest, spent the whole night in feverish dreams. The images that were always in his mind come alive, he thinks he fights furiously with a swarm of enemies then he sinks helplessly, and clutches his son's corpse in his cold arm, soon he fights with the floods, holds the sinking beloved only at the hem of the dress. 
Soon, even tied to a tree, he sees her bleeding in robber's arms. Exhausted with anger and fear, he rushes to the bed with a fixed look. Faithful Sheriff Min S. Science comes to his aid in this need. For at that time it was a squire's office to marry the art of healing with the art of knighthood. It was inherited from his father, and many secret things were shared with him by knights and wise men on his long journeys. As soon as the beautiful morning star pales in the sky, he hurries while Fatmi shows herself busy with the beloved lord as a nurse to the gardens, where everything still rests and is silent, seek out herbs, of whose miraculous powers a hermit on Horeb teaches him, and press them out and mix a juice, which wards off the strongest fever within a short period of time. A gentle sleep begins to fall on Huan's forehead as early as the second night. Cared for and guarded with loving loyalty, and freshened up with plenty of cool drinks, he feels so well prepared on the fourth day. Around him, as soon as the moon lights up the warm night. In a gardener's doublet, with which he is provided, with Sherismin in the garden to fare. They had not yet taken many steps in the rose bushes near the hut, so the wet nurse who often approaches the harem to catch something new comes up with a newspaper that is stronger than any Laudan desk to freshen the blood and nerves of the sick. It is, she assures, almost without a doubt that Rija is not far from them. Where is she? Where? exclaims Huan with delight and impatience, starting up hurry. Speak. Where did you see her? Seen? replies Fatmi, me? I didn't say that, alone, I'll let myself be dismembered if it's not Amanda who landed here tonight. Just hear what the minute gave me for sure the Jewess Salome, who just came from the inner harem. Shortly, said she, before the evening time a bark appeared on the high sea, so she flew with the swiftness of a bird, the sails seemed to be billowing with a fresh wind. Suddenly, from cloudless heights, a fiery jet zigzags down, and with the first blow that a gale gave it, one sees the whole ship in full flame. No one thinks of extinguishing in such distress. The fire is raging. Embraced by the most terrible death. Whoever can jump jumps out of its flaming jaws and throws themselves into the boat. The wind soon loosens them from the ship, drives them towards the shore, but, a quarter of an hour from the shore, a new whirlwind seizes the boat, and overthrows it, and everything perishes. The people cry out in vain to their mahom, works, with the strained strength the fear of death, vainly rises from the flood, only one woman, who took the sky as her eye, escapes the danger becomes on the waves, as on a chariot, quite unscathed, and even unwetted, carried to the near shore. By chance the sultan stood with Almansaris just on one of the terraces of the castle, which let them see out into the sea, expectant to watch the exit. A gentle zephyr seemed to blow the woman away. But, so as not to rely too much on miracles, Almansaris now beckons, and a hundred slaves go neck deep into the sea to stand by the beautiful. It is said that the sultan himself came to the beach and received her himself. From an eye joglin who carried her on his back out of the whirling foam to the terrace. Although one could not hear what he said, he seemed to be saying a lot of polite things to her, and because he lacked the time and freedom to offer his heart to her, at least by looks. However that may be, it is certain continues Fatmi that Almansaris has shown himself to be very friendly and well disposed to the beautiful swimmer and has lied to her many beautiful things, although the stranger s seldom charm has withdrawn Almansa's heart from her at first sight, and that they already occupied a room in the queen's summer house. Fear, joy, love and pain, while Fatmi speaks, grind alternately in Huan's face. The more he thinks, the less doubtful it seems to him that it is Amanda. It appears as clear as daylight that Oberon, though still invisible, is again directing the reins of his destiny. Well then, friends, guess now, what do you think? What is to be done now? To snatch a manden from the sultan by force, Roland himself would not dare to endorse, replies Sherismin, although it is advisable secretly to arm ourselves against all that can and cannot happen. But for now, let's try cunning. What if you, since you are not ashamed of digging, hire Bay Ibrahim as a gardener? Suppose he also makes difficulties at first, he looks at you more sharply and shakes his wise head. I'm not sorry for that. A beautiful diamond has already conveyed many things. Leave this worry to me, Sir Knight. 
Between today and tomorrow we'll see you, in spite of all difficulties. Entitled to a gardener's apron, the rest is left to heaven and time. The proposal seems well thought out to the night, and is now promptly and prudently carried out. Old Ibrahim is soon so well won, that he adopts the paladin as his nephew, to his sister's son, who came from Damask, and has done a great deal in floriculture, in short, Huan is accepted as a gardener, and takes up his new post with great decency. Canto 11. The hope that swings her shimmering plumage around Huan again, you, whom he only loves, to see you again soon, the golden hope will soon give him back the whole splendor of the most beautiful youth. Just the thought that she is so close to him, that this breeze that calls him, has perhaps hardly kissed a mandan's cheek, has hardly played with her lips, that these flowers, which he breaks and picturesquely weaves into wreaths and bouquets, to send them to the harem, as is customary, perhaps adorn a mandan's curls, her beautiful life perhaps evaporate on her lovely breast, the thought is fulfilled him with delight, the beautiful red of longing and desire colors his cheeks again and shines from his eyes. The hot time of day takes the office of night in this land, and is slumbered and dreamed. Alone, as soon as the evening wind wakes up, Huan, whom love awakens, asks, already at all the shadows where his lovely one lingers. He knows the night is spent here with guards, but in the gardens and terraces after sunset nothing male is allowed to be seen. The ladies are accustomed to trotting through the blossoming avenues, in the gentle glow of the moon, now in pairs, now in small gangs, and the princess herself adorns the beautiful wreath of nymphs, then song and strings and dance shortens the lazy night, then follows, in quiet caves, a bath, to which Almansa himself so keen is the duty of prosperity here dare not approach. There was no chance of seeing a mandan whom our knight thought was in the harem unless he tarried in the garden about twilight time longer than the law permitted. He had already had the most restless night three times in a bush that anyone who had come out of the harem was forced to walk past, watched, listened, watched, and alas! Didn't see a mandan. Begged by Fatmi. Ibrahim and Sherismin. Not to risk their lives and his own, so obviously, although the chariot of the sun rolled down too quickly for him, he still wanted to go away on the fourth evening just at the highest time, when suddenly, as he turns around a hedge, Almansaris stands very close in front of him. She came leaning against one of her nymphs, panting from the day's severe fire, to indulge herself in the fresh scent of the bitter orange groves. A light nightgown, as delicate as if spiders had woven it, shades her body, and only a golden ribbon closes it around her bosom, which with beautiful impatience strives to break through the thin wall. The sculptor of nature will never build a more divine model for a Venus than this body. His charming contours floated wavy, only noticeable to the finest eye, between the precise and the superfluous, so soft, so lovely, it was difficult for the coldest Joseph sense to look at you without lasciviousness and longing. It was in every part what the imagination of the Alchemines and Lysips ever thought to be the most beautiful and borrowed from their pictures, it was Helen's breast, and Atalant's knees, and Leda's arm, and Aragorn's lips. But art never rose to that stimulus which, as soon as the desire for it awoke in it, always made it the conqueror of all hearts. The spirit of lust seemed then to communicate with her breath to the breezes that whispered around her. Her eyes are full of Cupid's sharpest arrows. And then woe to the man who wants to fight with her. For, even if he could escape the fiery languorous gaze that caresses him so lovingly, how will he become this mouth full of temptations, how will he resist his smile? like the siren sound of the magical voice that stirs the most secret chords of feeling. Who in the bosom of the soul bears the sweet delusion, as if it were already swimming in sighs of lust? And if now, before perhaps wisdom knew it, every sense treacherous, united to its victory, accelerates the last moment of drunkenness, oh say, who would not then be close to his fall? Yes. Calm down. The shipwreck, which now seems almost inevitable to us, is still far away and perhaps uncertain. To flee otherwise in any case the wisest thing wasn't an option at that moment, she was too close, although in Huan's place a true gardener would have fled. Luckily, if she asks, a basket of flowers and fruit is carrying in his arms will help him concoct an answer. Of course the fair queen is stunned to meet a man here on her way. What are you doing here? 
She asks the paladin with a look that was deadly to any other nephew of the old gardener. But Huan, eyelids lowered under the umbrella, drops to his knees with noble reverence, and offers her the basket of flowers as a sacrifice. He had, says he merely handing it over to her, the time that closes the gardens to all his equal mist. If he has done too much, his head may pay for its hasty zeal. But the goddess seems engrossed in a milder plan, while at her feet lies the beautiful wicked. She looks at him kindly, and seems to have difficulty deciding to go away. The loveliest youth she ever saw, and handsome as heroes are, with strength and dignity strange in color, in a gardener's shirt, this didn't seem natural to her. She would have liked to get involved with him more closely, if the severe compulsion of prosperity didn't hold her back. She finally waves him away, but a side glance that accompanies him seems to contain a lot, a lot. She walks on slowly, silently, even twists her beautiful neck to look behind him, and is angry that he obeyed the cue so quickly. Was he too stupid to understand the look that explained him? Does the charming figure perhaps lack soul? Is the impatient fire deceiving in his eyes? Does danger make him cold? What, or was he looking for another adventure here? Another? This doubt suddenly envelops her, which she blushes to admit to herself. Restless, pursued by Huan's image, she strays all night through arbors and avenues, listen. Against every breeze that stirs, every leaf that hits another, quiet. She speaks to her confidant, let's listen. I think I heard something rustling through that hedge. Perhaps it's the beautiful gardener, says the sly maid, he is, if everything doesn't deceive me about him, the man to risk his life, to be here in ambush, pressed against a bush, with a sight once again to please, who enraptures him into paradise. What if we surprised him very quietly, and in the act caught the beautiful sinner? Silence, fool, says the queen of the harem, I believe you babble even in dreams. And yet she directs the light step straight to the tree from which the noise came. It was just a lizard, that slipped through the bushes. A sigh, half stifled, half pressed into the bouquet she held to her mouth, confirms what Nadine read in her eyes. She turns around impatiently and is at odds with herself, bites her lip, sighs, says something, and forgets what she wanted to say at the third word, angry that Nadine doesn't give the right answer and can't guess what she is should guess the beautiful lady is, in a word, in love. Even her bouquet of flowers finds out, without her knowing it is crumpled and, leaf by leaf, torn and torn apart. The evil had now lasted for three days, and, nourished by compulsion and resistance, had become worse with every night and with every morning. Because, as soon as the evening gleam paints the colourful windows, she leaves her room, and, like a nympho, with half undone hair, sweeps through all the garden paths and fields, wherever it was possible to find Ibrahim's nephew. Alone, in vain did her eyes listen, in vain did her bosom pound with impatience. The handsome gardener no longer let himself be seen. Whatever the cause might be. Unfortunate Almansaris. Your pride succumbs. Why torment yourself any longer, she thinks and hide what gnaws at you Nadine. Who will surely notice for a long time? out of stubbornness. Concealment doesn't cure a snake bite. She thinks she seeks comfort in a friend's bosom, but what she needs is a flatterer. Nadine was a master of this court art. The juice from all the pom-poms in Africa did not so well refresh the lust-breathing sultana's seething blood, than this friend's advice and tender effort to soon draw the man she desires into her net. At midnight, and with the doors locked, to bring him into the part of the harem wherein Almansaris commanded quite unreservedly, did N.T. seem so difficult, since the sultan, her husband, the passion for the beautiful Zora Dines as the young stranger called herself, who by a miracle recently appeared on this beach quite publicly and freely abandoned himself. The nurse did not deceive herself in closing, it was Amanda herself who was pulled from the robber force Titania by lightning and brought to this beach unharmed. You know what happened when they came ashore? How Almansa immediately dedicated his fleeting heart to her, and how Almansaris received her with envious feigned tenderness. The Sultan was perhaps the most beautiful man on whom the sun ever shone, and knew how to use him so victoriously that a woman's heart never escaped him. For the first time with these Zoradines he lost his glory. 
For you there is only one man on earth, she has no eyes, no thought, no sense except for this one. The dignity without pride, the noble certainty, the decent, assumed indifference and unforced coldness, with which she knows how to keep him, who can command here, so far away from herself that he, how much he burns. You can hardly tell by a silent look dares to lament, that sees all this and calls Almansaris the masterpiece of the art of prostitution. Accustomed to twisting the sultan's heart to her lust, to rule over him, to reign in the harem without limits, could she see the scepter played out of this stranger's hand undisturbed? It is true that she lends a smiling face to her hatred, and pretends not to doubt Zorodines, but everywhere in the harem's walls are full of hidden eyes that watch over all their doings. But ever since the fair gardener rites pierced her proud heart with Cupid's sharpest arrow, lust has swallowed up jealousy. Her ambition now gives way to a sweeter stinginess, the stinginess after his kiss. Defeating him again is now her only pride. May the whole world lie at Zorodine's feet, if only she holds in her arms the one she loves. She herself now promotes the plot Zorodine's, far from her, in another part of the harem. Which Elmansa hastily had prepared for her. More decent to serve, the stranger's true status, although they have not yet confessed it, make this a kind of duty, at first sight now I could escape that she was used to seeing nothing about herself. While Almansaris, with lustful politeness, frees herself in her own room from a witness who is a nuisance to her, leaves without worrying about her, and how she can and wants to pass the time, at least at least take care, Almansa, who now completely devotes himself to his love, your free space to hatch designs, for which a hundred hands offer you in the harem. Meanwhile, the beautiful gardener grieves immoderately. That he, who for more than seven days has been stalking the walls where Amanda is mourning, has crept around, because his own heart can tell him that she is mourning the lovely woman too only to see through a lattice, just the trace of their light foot, he would, oh certainly, recognize him from thousands. Still begrudge the pitiless stars. He throws himself angrily at his friends, if you love me, can't you think of a way to win only one mouth in the harem, that whispers my name and that I'm near her in her ear? Quiet. Something comes to my mind, exclaims Fatmi, you should send her a mana. Go pick the flowers we need, I am a master of this language. And Hassan hastens, as Fatmi commanded him, to fetch a rice of myrtle, and lilies, and jasmine, and roses and dandelion. Then she tells him to pull a hair out of his curls, takes thin golden wire, and twists and twists the hair with him, ties the bouquet with it, and in it a bay leaf. On which he has scrawled A and H. Crossed. Well, she says, if I still wet it with cinnamon water, it will be the loveliest letter that a thief of your kind ever wrote to his sweetheart. Do you want me to translate it quickly for you? Don't waste any time. Exclaims Huan, thank you so much. You can't bring me an answer soon enough, love protect you and let it succeed. Go, we're waiting for you on this grass bank. Good fat me went. But because no room in the inner part of the harem was open to her, the bouquet ran through many a slave's hand, and was finally as chance always mixes into everything uninvited caught up by a mistake by Nadine and her queen, after she had only explored through questions the how and when, exultantly carried forward. Because Fatmi brought this letter, Ibrahim's slave, suspicion could not fall upon any other than fair Hassan, and that it must apply to all of the most beautiful in the harem seems just as certain, especially after what happened recently. What else could the A and H say than Hassan and Almansaris? And if she had, though not to be believed, even a rival, only the more triumph for her proud sense, to rob the enemy by force of her booty. The jealousy that this suddenly stirs up. Unites with other gentler impulses. To postpone the beautiful victory for which she thirsts no longer than until the following night. Meanwhile, enraptured by her mission's happiness, and without suspicion of being betrayed, almost breathless, with glowing red cheeks from joy and haste, the wet nurse now returns. Her gaze is already far away, like a glimpse of the sun from clouds that have just begun to part. Herr Ritter she whispers in his ear what do you give me, so today the door of heaven will open for you. In a word, ye shall see a manden. Even today, at midnight, the small door into the myrtle grove will be open to you, the slave girl who awaits you there. Follow her confidently wherever she goes, 
and fear no snares, she will get you to the spot unharmed. The good woman, who knows nothing of deceit, relies on the path she herself paved for him. How much, O oh Fatma? Am I bound to you? exclaims Huan, I shall see her again. Tonight. And if it were to go through a thousand wounds directly from her to my death, the news would scarcely please me less. My best sir, I have good courage, the stars are kind to us, you will free them, speaks Sherismin and everything will be fine. Give me only three days, to secretly hire a pink one, which shall lie at anchor not far away in a safe bay, ready, at the first sign, as soon as the moment to flee becomes favourable for us, to set out fresh to sea. The casket doesn't leave us lacking in resources yet, only gold enough. So the world is for sale. A golden key, Lord. Unlocks all locks. Meanwhile, while our hero counts the time of his happiness with impatience on his pulse, and, because his pulse beats more quickly with every moment, always overcounting itself, sighs, not more patiently, the charming sultans, already prepared for victory, the midnight is here. Chance happily offered her plan a hand, and set her free on all sides. A great festival, in honour of the beautiful Zoradines, made in the Sultaness Palace, at which the odalisks all appeared, gave her an open field in their part of the harem. That Almansaris considers himself superfluous in view of this merriment did not seem improper to anyone, on the contrary, one found the headache very natural, which, as requested, suddenly overcame her. The hour calls. The handsome gardener quietly approaches the small garden door through the bushes. How is his heart beating? He's almost breathless, because a soft hand in the dark welcomes him. And gently pulls him after it. He follows her in silence, with a soft step. Now up, now down, through narrow archways that often cross each other with little light, and now she slips away from him in front of a new door. Where are we? He whispers and taps with both hands. Suddenly the door opens. A faint glow as if, between walls of myrtle covered with ivy, the day loses itself in a spring grove discovers a row of rooms that seems endless, and, as he goes on, unnoticed the dull light becomes shimmer, the shimmer rapidly heightened to the highest splendour. He stands struck and blinded by a splendour that shames all his scene, so much as gold and lapis lazuli, and what Golkand and Siam rich send, with proud luxuriance here lavished everywhere. But unsatisfied, his loving eyes seek you. Where is she? He sighs loudly. Hardly is his ah. Escaped, thus, in a flash, a curtain is drawn away. On both sides the rich gold rustles, and what a spectacle is shown in his stare. A throne of gold, and a lady on it, as a sculptor, lost in ecstasy, thinks the goddess of love. Twelve nymphs, each young and full of charm, like Cupid's sisters, float in groups round about, to lift. Like the twilight. The rising triumph of the sun. Barely shaded by rose-coloured silk, they shone at her lady's feet, like little clouds that flow in a poet's dream around Cytherine's chariot. She herself, decked out in the richest finery and laden with jewels, merely shows him that all this colourful sparkle is unable to darken the innate splendour of her beauty. Lord Huan, who now calls himself the gardener Hassan as his eye rises to her Almansaris recognises, is startled, confused, staggers back. This all-blinding, voluptuous dream face, what's the point of it? He doesn't see a mandan. You were looking for his heart here, you were looking for his looks. Almansaris, who as very forgivably, believes that her splendour alone dazzles and confuses him. She descends from the throne comes to meet him with a smile, and takes his hand, and seems ready for him to cast off the majesty before which he is dizzy, and to derive all the benefit merely from her charm. Imperceptibly her decency becomes more and more free. A lovely. Blazing fire burns in her eyes and plays itself electrically into his bosom, she presses his hand gently and tells him to be happy. Half undecided, his gaze seems to tell her something, she waves the nymphs away, and his courage is gone too he seems too scared to just open his eyes. The scene changes. A second curtain opens. Almansaris leads her stupid shepherd into another room, where all around the wall was clothed with roses and myrtles, and a table was laden with refreshments. 
When they come in, they will be greeted with song and tones, the spirit of joy resounds from strings and song, and Hassan, as the lady tells him, sits opposite her. Blushing desire and beautiful impatience, fearfully bold, in her swimming eyes, on her glowing cheeks, confesses his victory to him, alone, from his eyes a sad, gloomy light breaks like clouds. It is true that his gaze wanders about, no longer stupid, from free pieces on her charms, but not for love, not with languishing ecstasy, not, as she wishes, heavy with the dew of lustful tears. He is distracted, he seems to compare them, and every charm that reveals itself to him below, only paints a mandan's noble image more vividly, and must, ashamed, give way to the chaste charm. In vain she hands him the glittering bowl with a look that shoots Cupid's whole quiver into his bosom. At the happiest feast of the gods, even young Hebe does not hand Hercules the full cup of nectar with a sweet smile. For free! With a frosty face, he accepts the cup that her mouth has scarcely touched, and drinks as if he felt poison on his tongue. The lady waves, and swiftly the sister band the nymphos, who formerly surrounded the golden throne, in a dance entwine, to endow the dead on the bier with new souls, and to embody spirits. Now blown away in groups, now pair and pair again, Huan sees the loveliest forms unfolding generously in a thousandfold light. Perhaps only too clearly, everything seems to give him desires and forebodings, at least he feels it, she thinks, if he only feels, how rich the spectacle is that beauty plays here. How charming is the arms light floating, the hips luxuriant swing, the ankles whirling trembling. How languidly they fall back, with half-closed eyes, as if in sweet death now, step by step. Indignantly, the noble man's surprised senses melt away in this glow. At last he closes his eyes with force. And calls Amandan's image to a mighty counterbalance. Amandan's picture, from that solemn hour, when, with the pressure still warm on his mouth, he swore the oath of love and loyalty from her kiss to him who fills and carries nature. He swears to him again, in his thoughts on his knees in front of this holy image. And suddenly it's as if an angel held his shield in front of his breast, so weak and powerless the arrows of lust fell from her. Almansaris, who paid attention to everything that his eyes betrayed, quickly claps her hands, and with a nod puts an end to the luxuriant dance. And although she hardly managed to bring herself to force feeling from the marble-hard young man in her arms, she still tries one thing that can hardly be missing, she has her lute brought to her. Leaning back on her upholstered seat with charm, and, almost to the point of enchantment, embellished by her glow, what will she fail to achieve through the favour of the muses? How swiftly, in a lovely throng, the rosen finger flog runs through the soulful strings. How charming is the play of her beautiful arms from her open, wide, falling robe. And, since from a breast that was able to beguile, the powerful feeling pours itself into song, how can he resist worshipping the goddess on his knees? Sweet was the melody. Meaningful the meaning. It was the song of a shepherdess, who for a long time hid a fire that grants her no rest, but now no longer resists the omnipotent urge, and blushing confesses her pain and his victory to the one who conquered her. The song was in the book, alone, as she sang, sing none that does not burn with the same flames. Here proud art gives way to conquering nature, the dove of Venus only coos so sweetly. The language of feeling. So powerfully expressed, the clear flow of the beautiful tones, so often interrupted by small sighs, the cheeks redder, the bosom faster throbbing, in short, everything is a full-flowing outpouring of the passions that boil inside her. In excess of what she felt, the lute finally falls from her hand. The arms open, yet, Huan, who was terrified, grabs the lute as he falls, like a zealous one, and intones the answer with a mighty tone, admits that someone else already has his heart, and that in heaven and nothing on earth can move him to be unfaithful to her. Firm was his tone, and incorruptibly severe his noble gaze. The sorceress, against her will, fills his supremacy. She pales and tears fill her angry eyes, lust comes into the crowd with its pride. She hastens to veil, she hates the light, the wide sal is too narrow, with a cold look at her rebel, she beckons to take him away quickly the peaks were already shining in the first crimson light. When our hero, his forehead covered in dark grief, came back to his friends. Startled, 
They read half the story in his face at first sight. Wretched one, he says to fat men. Who sinks to the earth in shame, where did your mind fly to? But I forgive you gladly, you were betrayed yourself. And when he tells what happened to him that night, he takes the good old man by the chest and swears, the whole power of Africa shall no longer hold him, with sword and shield, as befits a knight, to invade the palace, and wrest his reisure from the sultan. You see now, he says, even what I won with cunning. At his feet Sherasmin begs him, and for a long time in vain, to patiently submit to the compulsion of the necessary concealment for only three more days, and not to risk his and Amandan's life by a step that even bravery calls desperate, ask only for this short time to lift every obstacle from his flight. Fatmi is also begging on her knees, stretching out her head in vengeance, if she does not discover access to Amanden within this period. She swears, for the second supper no deceit shall disgrace her, in short. The knight himself feels that his displeasure does not recommend the best way. He gives his word and returns to the garden to concentrate on his service and success waiting. Canto 12. Meanwhile, on cushions of Damask Almansaris, with Cupid's fiercest fire in her breast, seeks but an hour's rest in vain. Is it possible, or did you only dream of last night's despicable adventure? A man despises you, Almansaris. He can see you and burn for someone else, can despise you and confess it to you. The thought drives them to rage, she swears limitless revenge. How ugly does he become to her? A monster, a dragon is lovelier than her imagination paints the ungrateful, how long? In two minutes she is no longer aware of the previous one, soon he will bleed to death in the dust in front of her, drop by drop, soon she will press him enraptured on her breast. Now he stands again in all his beauty, the first of all sons of the earth, a hero, a god. Impossible is he only the nephew of Ibrahim, in his whole being, in his tone and decency one can read the trace of what he wants to hide in vain, where has nature's stamp that makes a king ever been more visible. He, he alone, is worthy of her, is worthy of being idolized in her arms. And oh! She lacks a bolt of lightning to smash the foe who keeps him charmed and makes victory difficult for her. But how, Almansaris? Don't you feel better about yourself? Grant him the little pride of puffing himself out like a peacock in his heroism. To resist even you. All this only increases the desire to win. Assault him first, ere you lose heart, with every charm that true beauty prides itself on, go, so that you can handle it all the more surely. Of foreign weapons, with which art arms us, he feel and see what the gods themselves desire. And if you do not yet seduce his heart, and he still despises you then, queen, awaken your pride and create for yourself the sweet desire of revenge. So you whisper out of a maid's mouth to the little demon, whom you see sitting imperiously on this earth with a full quiver. Who intoxicates the whole world from his magic cup, and who, who doesn't know him better, calls the god of love inappropriately. Because, let it be known to every young inexperienced lady. As Modi is his name. Almansaris, in whose warm blood already a deceiver lurks, is less guarded against the deceiver from without than ever, his breath nourishes and fans her order, and scarcely that she does such things for adornment as if she resists, then as Modi is victorious. The flatterer's maid, his worthy organ, laid out the draft at once with much cleverness. Oh! Now rob lightning of its fire wings, you hours to bring it here, the sweet moment. You creep too slowly how quickly you hurry. Of lustful desire. But it's not only she who's now counting seconds, Huan survives too, tormented by impatience, the sluggish pace of the three hated days barely survives, and waking and sleeping Rija is his dream. The second morning had finally dawned on the longing of the harem queen. Curly hair of gold, beautiful and breathing roses, he rose like the herald who announced to her the most beautiful victory, already murmuring through the myrtles, which, densely blown, gird the most beautiful grottos, a light morning wind, and a thousand voices resound the bird's early call in the nearby forest. But around the grotto, under the myrtle foliage, in everlasting twilight, is the sanctuary of rest. Here only the gentle turtle dove coos its longing towards the tauber. In these lovely bushes, the dark seat of hidden solitude, 
Almansaris often bathes in the quiet morning to refresh himself. The lovely morning called upon the beautiful Hassan, while all were still asleep, to gather the flower baskets full, which he was bound to send to the harem every day, when a slave ran to meet him, and panting, ordered him to decorate the grotto. The Negro adds, urging him to hurry, that a lady is willing to bathe there. Annoyed. Lord Huon goes to do what was commanded him. He fills the largest basket with colorful layers of flowers, all of Florence's treasure, and hurries to the assigned place. Far be it from him to distrust the matter. But when he enters the grotto, a dull, wonderful horror falls on him. And a hidden arm seems to draw him back. Concerned, he puts down his flowers, but for a moment he pulls himself together and smiles at his fear. The dubious light that fights in this labyrinth with visible darkness under a thousand tinsels is undoubtedly to blame for this childish trembling, he thinks, and confidently goes into the innermost being with his basket of flowers, in ever brighter light. Here reigns a day as if for furtive joys the cunning desire chooses a magic light, not day, not twilight, he floated between the two, only lovelier because of what he lacks in both, he was like the moonlight, when his silvery light melts into pale red through rose arbors. The hero, although nothing dangerous threatens him here, hardly defends himself, enchants himself to believe. What he is least able to persuade himself is that here, where everything is brimming with flowers, flowers are still needed. Yet, how his eyes now are on all sides. Oh who describes how he feels. When on a couch at NYMF from Marham's paradise showed herself in the full splendor of the purest beauty. In a light that magically streams down upon them from above like a glory, and, lifted up by the darkness of the rest, with their bosom snow shames the lilies, in a position that irritates him like his eyes have never seen so beautifully unveiled, worth more than all that the bullock and the swan made Jupiter of the Greeks. The gases, which only, like a light shadow on an alabaster picture, envelops you here and there. Not veiled, seems to match the nudity itself with the charm of shame. Away. Pen, where a pal and Titian, dismayed, dropped their brushes. The knight stands and trembles and looks enchanted, although it was better for him to close his eyes. In sweet delusion he stands there and believes, but only for two moments, what he sees is so beautiful he sees Regia. Alone, rightly suspicious of a fortune that seems incredible to him, he approaches her, sees, recognizes Almansaris, and turns and flees, he flees, and in the fleeing feels himself caught and encircled by two elastic, round, milk-white arms. He is fighting the hardest battle that a man has ever fought since Joseph's time, the noble battle of virtue and love loyal and fiery youth with beauty, charm and hot voluptuousness. His will is pure with criminal delight, but how long will he resist her sweet entreaties, the kisses full of order, the tender, wild press on her bosom? O oh, Oberon, where is thy lily stem? Where is thy horn in this peril? He calls a man den, Oberon. All angels and saints for help and in due time comes help to him. For just when every sinew wants to wear out for longer resistance, and with lustful fury the heated beauty has almost overpowered him, Almansa lets himself be seen. Like a wounded deer, and furious to love a woman who despises him, pursued by Zoradina's image, he has been wandering in the garden for an hour already chance leads him to this myrtle circle, he thinks he hears the voice of Almansaris, and because the grotto door was only ajar, he goes in to learn more about it. The demon, who by his priestesses denied the knight's most dangerous loyalty, will already from afar at his sultan's step Almansa near a rival inside. Oh help, help! screams the quickly warned woman, and changes her role straight away with Juan's, as if she were fighting for her own body with a raging man who wanted to dish in her. Her fierce gaze, her half-torn robe, her flying hair, the terror of the young gardener, struck by the unexpected bold accusation. The place where the sultan found him. In short, everything seemed to discover the wicked in him. Oh! Allah! Be praised, cried the deceiver, that I myself owe Almansorn the rescue. Then, as she bashfully wrapped herself in all her veils, she lies, with the tone of innocence itself. A false adventure, like that shameful disguised son of a Christian, since it has come her fancy to wash in the cold, dare to surprise her here, and how she scarcely resists him by force, when, fortunately, 
the sultan still disturbed him. To absolve the knight of the ugly crime which he is accused of, all that is needed is an impartial look, but his judge also lacks this single look. The hero despises to save himself from death with a woman's disgrace, he nestles his noble arm in undeserved bonds, and silently wraps himself in his consciousness. The sultan, whom his displeasure hastens to damnation, remains dull and unmoved. The wicked shall be led away in chains, if he rules the slaves who have summoned his command cast him into a dark tomb, and tomorrow morning, as soon as the imam calls from the tower, he will, in the outer courtyard, be a victim of raging flames, and his ashes will scatter curses in the air. The noble hears his verdict in silence. Flashes one more look down at the hated woman. And turns, and goes off in chains, supported by a courage that only innocence gives. No glimpse of the sun pleases the dreadful grave in which he now sits deeply imprisoned, the night of death is like the night that presses on him and smothers every ray of hope in his spirit. Tired of fate's severe blows, weary of always being a ball of change, he sighs for the moment that will set him free. The foreboding of the sharp pain of fire frightens him. Love helps him to drown it out, she strengthens the sinking nature with angelic power. Unto death he exclaims to remain faithful, Amanda, I swore to you and keep my vow. O oh that, beloved wife, what will come your way tomorrow, forever hidden from you, forever also from you, faithful old friend, remained hidden. How gladly I suffered my sad fate without weeping. Yet, when ye know, know of what I was accused of, and with the pain of my death coupled with the shame to hear that I suffered only what I deserved, O oh God. It is too much to endure even this. At least it would atone for my sins the severest death. I accuse nobody. Only this one thing, O Oberyn, still grant him whom you loved, protect my honour, protect Regia. You know what I have done. Tell her that to keep the holy oath of fidelity that I swore I do not shrink from death by fire. So he exclaims, and, strengthened by trust, that Oberyn hears him, the poppy-wreathed god of slumber touches him unnoticed with his staff, the silencer of all sorrows, and lulls him into light dreams, although only hard stone is his kiss. Did the good guardian spirit perhaps send him this refreshment as a pledge that his suffering would soon end? Half the world was still covered in darkness when a dull clattering awakened him from his rest. He thinks he hears turning the heavy key in the lock, the iron door opens, the prison's black wall is illuminated by a pale glow he hears someone walking, and gets up and sees, in shimmering robes, the crown on his head, the lamp in his hand, Almansaris standing by his side. She stretches out the lily hand to him, smiling charmingly, and will you, says she, forgive me what was only the fault of need, not of my heart. Oh you beloved, does not my own depend on your beautiful life? I come to take you away from danger despite your reluctance. From the woodpile to which the barbarian condemned you, to a throne you deserve. Love opens the path of the sun to you, let it resound with your glory. Accept this hand that is bestowed upon you, in a wink your pursuer shall fall, and all his people shall swirl around your feet like dust. In the whole harem everything is subject to me. Trust yourself to love's secure hands, and what she dared, your own courage will complete. Stop it. O oh queen. Your proposal only increases my suffering through the torment of denying you everything. Oh. Why do you make me say it? I shall not redeem myself with any crime. Is it possible? She exclaims, can nonsense go that far? Unfortunate one, in the face of the flame already bursting from your pile of wood, can you scorn Almansaris and a throne? Tell me, he replies, queen, that I can be of use to you with my blood so that the lust with which I hasten to squirt shall show you whether I am unrecognizable. I can, as a thank you, give you my heart's blood, my life, just not my honor, not my loyalty. You don't know who I am, don't forget who you are, and don't expect anything from me that is impossible for me. Almansarius, pushed to the extreme by his resistance, she employs everything that can exercise his loyalty through all stages and tire his courage. She teases, she threatens, she pleads, she falls, lost in love and pain, before him on her knees, but the hero's firm mind remains immobile, and the loyalty he swore to a man den remains pure. Then die because you want to? She cries, out of breath with rage, 
I myself, I want to feast my greedy eyes on your suffering with hot lust. Die as a Thor. Sacrificial animal of stubbornness. She screams with sparkling eyes, and curses the first hour since she saw him, curses herself with trembling mouth, and storms away, and behind her the iron door of the prison closes again with a clatter. Meantime the rumor, the unfortunate Moravia like to spread and embellish, from their lord the sad tale also brought to Shirazmin and fat men. The beautiful Hassan, it was said, was found alone in the bath by the sultan with Almansaris, and tomorrow without mercy he will be a victim of the flames in the large courtyard. They did not question whether Huan was innocent, you knew the real situation. But even if he had been absent, he was pitiable. In cases of this kind true loyalty is shown. Instead of wasting the time with whining, they resolved to risk the utmost for him, to save him from this misery, and failed to die with their master. Shortly before the day begins. Fatman's courage and watchfulness succeed in betraying the keepers. And creeping unrecognized to the bedchamber where Reja, dreaming of Huon, rests. The joy of the unexpected reunion makes them both speechless for a moment. The first word that Fatmi can speak, ist Huan, is narration from the beloved man. What do you say, golden nurse? exclaims Amand, and throws her arms around her neck, my Huan, so close to me. Where is he? Oh. Princess what happened? Sobs those crying help. Break his bonds. Blow up his dungeon. The unfortunate threatens, out of love for you, a miserable death. And then she tells her exactly the whole thing, and her knight's loyalty and the sultana's revenge. Already, she exclaims, the pile of wood is piled up, nothing will save it unless Zorodine protects it. With a shriek of fear, half senseless, Amand drives up from her bed in wild haste, as she stands, in her light nightgown, throws the curda down, and hurries at full speed to the sultan's room, through all the slave guards who she is with sea miracles and make way for them in silence. She enters, ignoring that it was early in the day, and with lily pale cheeks, and hair that hangs scattered around her shoulders, throws herself on her knees before the sultan, Almansa, do not let me kneel in vain for you. Swear if my life seems worthy of preservation, that you will grant me the request. The rest of my life counts. Desire, O oh most beautiful, speaks with astonishment and joy at the same time. The sultan, don't let me float in uncertainty. To please you is my fiery aspiration, desire freely. My treasure, my throne, my kingdom, nothing is too much that I can give. Mansa reserves only one thing, yourself. You swear it to me. The love drunken Moor swears it. Then give me the gardener's Hassan life. How? He exclaims, looking dismayed, what a request, Zoradine. What's the life of that slave to you? Oh, much, Almansa, much. My own clings to it. Are you talking in fever do you have a crush forgive me, yes, you abuse the unlimited right that beauty gives you. In the life of a servant who atones for his crime. He atones for his loyalty. His heart is known to me, he keeps his duty, is blameless, is a man of unsullied honor, and yet oh Mansa. If he were guilty, avenge his transgression on Zoradine's knot. With eyes that sparkle with scarcely restrained rage, Mansa cries, cruel, why does your hesitation torment me? What a secret dawns from the obscure hated enigma. What is Hassan to you? Speak. Know it then, because necessity compels me to speak, I am his wife. A bond that nothing can break, a bond woven in heaven itself, binds my happiness, my everything firmly to the beloved man. We are oppressed with all its terrible heaviness fates on, who knows how soon your turn will come. You see me miserable honor, my suffering, happier one. You can do it, save me. How? You are Hassan's wife and love him. Above everything. Unhappy woman, he is unfaithful to you. He unfaithful. The cause of his fall, I am certain, is solely his loyalty. I believe what I saw. So he was first deceived, and you with him. With angry face Mansa speaks, don't draw your bow, too proud of your charm until it breaks. Your Hassan is dying, and I can only mourn you. 
He dies? Screams Rija, tyrant, he whom a word from you can give life, he dies. Do you have a heart to tell me that? He has violated the discipline of the harem, replies Mansa coldly, he is set to die. Yes, because you want it, the slave's life, his life or death, is given into your hands. Give me, most beautiful, an example of noble grace, give me back the peace that you stole from me. I lay crown and kingdom at your feet, surrender to me, and the wicked be free of his guilt. Still overwhelmed with royal gifts, he goes back to his people. Oh do not hesitate to have the kindness yourself that you desire. A word makes my fate and his fate. Baseless. Calls out with an angel's wrath the beautiful woman, so dearly does the man whom Zoradine loves not by his life. Tyrant, do you know me like that? The worst of the whores, who once served me, despised your throne and you at such a price. It is indeed in your power to ruin us. But hope not to profit from it barbarian. I too can die. The sultan is startled. The courage of the noble woman frightens him. His cowardly heart is more moved by her dread than when she asked, yet, her beauty stokes the fire of desire at the same time in his blood. What did he not say to bribe her heart with love? How he begged her. How serpent-like he wound round her foot. In vain. Their resistance could not be broken by threats, could not be broken by entreaties. She stayed there, saying that death would be more welcome to her. The sultan swears in a terrible voice at Bay Maham's grave that nothing shall save her from his wrath unless she submits the request at once. If it isn't my last word, Allah shall damn me. If one hears the enraged scream up to the vorval, make up your mind, be mine at once, if not, then die with the depraved in the flames. She looks at him angrily, and is silent. Make up your mind, he calls to the second supper. Oh, free me from your sight, says the queen of women, death's grin itself arouses less horror in me. Almansa calls and, choked with rage, gives the cruel command, and the sparks of hell spurt out of his eyes. The black first stoops to the ground and swears to do it. Already the dreadful altar stands piled high for sacrifice, crowd after crowd is already thronging towards the people, who like to be frightened, feast their eyes on tragedies of this kind, weeping, and shuddering in delight. Already standing, paired for suffering and death, bound to a torture stake, the only lovers that Oberon invented pure. A noble pair of souls fused into one, that remained true to their first love, determined ere to choose death in flames, than to be unfaithful even to love a throne. With wet eyes, their hearts in a bind, all the people look up to them, touched, and yet worried that chance might not hinder the free course of the tragedy. The lovers, as they stand bound, are denied the consolation of looking at one another, yet, above all that they suffer and still await, the purest, happiest of joy's triumphs, that it is their love that has brought them here. Death, which adorns her loyalty with everlasting laurels, is her heart's choice, they could avoid him. Meanwhile twelve black men, with torches in their hands, are seen approaching the victim in pairs. They stand ready to complete it as soon as the Aga beckons. He waves. They light. And straight away there's a loud thunder. The earth seems to tremble, the flame goes out, the rope with which the faithful couple stood bound falls like tangled hair, and Huan sees the horn floating on his neck. At the same moment that this happened, from afar, in two different ranks, spurred by anxious sorrows, Almansa here, and their Almansaris, Azorodinan, appears in two different ranks, to liberate them Hassan. Stop! You can hear them screaming with all their might. Also, with a flashing sword, a black knight rushes through the terrified crowd into the midst of the crowd. But Huan has scarcely seen the pledge that his Oberon is now reconciled on his neck with a shudder of joy, when he puts it to his mouth without hesitation, and elicits from it the most beautiful sound that has ever been blown. His noble heart disdains to murder a cowardly people. Dance, he calls, dance until it takes your breath away, this is the only revenge that Huan allows himself. And when the horn sounds, the magic swindle first seizes the people standing around the pile of wood. Black and yellow, ragged, half-naked rabble, who suddenly, how madly, spin in the fastest vortex, 
soon the Aga mingled with all his Negroes, follows him what has feet by court. In the harem, in the city, from the sultan to the water carriers. Unhappily the chess man grabs Almansaris by the arm, she resists, but what good is his displeasure and their resistance? The dizziness pulls her away to drive herself into the middle of the swarm of those who are waltzing with him. In a short time the whole of Tunis is on the alert, and no one can remain in his place, even Padagra, and ailments, and gout, and agony does not free you from this frenzy of dancing. Meanwhile, without looking at the farce, the faithful couple, in blissful delight, hold each other in a speechless long embrace. Scarcely has her bosom room for this exuberance of joy. He has now dreamed of the exam hard dream. Nothing remains of it but what makes their happiness more beautiful. Their guilt has been paid for, fate has been reconciled, reunited by him again, now nothing can separate them. Deeply sympathetic, still on his horse. The worthy sherisman he was the black knight looks towards the bliss in which her heart melted. It is he who stormed along like a thunderstorm to rescue the beloved couple from the cowardly hands of the moors, and if he failed to end a life here that, without her, was unbearable to him. He springs down, rushing through the mad dance with Fatmi, who followed him, up to help the lovers climb from their thrones. And to commend them in triumph. Great was the joy, but it swelled even higher, when they saw the well-known chariot, carried ever lower by swans through the air, suddenly stop at their feet. They quickly got in, the moors may dance as long as Oberon pleases. Although the old man thinks that rasping or jumping is a better pastime. The airy phaeton flies, light and unwavering, gentle as sleep, more agile than thoughts, with them over land and sea, and little silver clouds blow like fans around her. Already on mountains and hills the twilight was bathed in an uncertain scent, already they saw the moon reflected in many a lake, and it became ever quieter in the wide realm of the air, the swans now gradually lowered themselves to the ground with drooping feathers, when suddenly, as if woven from the red of the evening, a shimmering palace hovers before their eyes. In a pleasant forest, in the midst of towering full rose bushes, stood the palace. From whose wondrous brilliance the quiet grove and the bushes seemed to shimmer through, wasn't it in this place? Huan speaks quietly and shuddering, but before he says it, open quickly a golden gate, and twenty virgins come out of the palace. They came, beautiful as May, with ever blooming cheeks, dressed in lustrous white lilies to receive the children of earth whom Oberon loves. They came dancing, and sang the immortal praise of pure faithfulness. Come. They sang and golden cymbals rang in their sweet song, to their lovely dance come, married couple, receive the beautiful victor's wreath. The lovers, hardly thinking, enraptured in the bliss of the other world, they flow, hand in hand, through the double rows, when, like the morning sun in their bridal adornments, the spirits stood before them. No longer a boy, as he used to appear to them in lovely disguises a youth, eternally beautiful and eternally blooming, stood there the elf king, the ring on his hand. And at his side shines, adorned with her crown of roses, Titania, with a mild moonlight. A beautiful wreath of myrtle hovers in both hands. Receive, they speak with loving tones, you faithful couple, for the noble prize of victory, from your friend's hand the well-deserved wreath. As long as you keep this sign of our grace, the happiness of your heart will never leave you. Scarcely had the last word fallen from Oberon's lips than a cloud was seen bending down out of the air. And out of the cloud's lap, while golden harps were playing, three elf daughters with lilies in front of their breasts climbed. In the arms of the third lay a beautiful boy whom she handed over to Titania on her knees. The queen bends down to him, smiling sweetly, and kisses him back to his mother. And, to the jubilant song of the maidens, who in a row before them strew the path with roses, the happy ones pass through the wide golden gate into Oberon's whorehouse. What she saw, heard, in this beautiful place, her tongue never uttered when she remembered. They looked only heavenwards, and a tear of joy in the shining eyes betrayed where their hearts longed. The blissful dream lost itself blissfully in a gentle sleep. And with the day they both found themselves, arm in arm, as if newly born, on a bank of moss. To her side stood in the slightly shadowed bushes, richly adorned, for beautiful horses, and all around lay a gleaming mixture of weapons, ornaments and clothes on the ground. 
Lord Huan, whose heart overflowed with joy, awakens his old man, Amand seeks her son who still lay softly slumbering on Fatman's lap. You look around. How great is their astonishment! Lord, in which country do you think you are? exclaims Sherismin delightedly to the knight, come, look west from this stand, and tell what you see. The knight looks out, and scarcely trusts the sight. He, who has experienced so much, and whose eyes were so accustomed to miracles, hardly believes what he sees with open eyes. It is the being on whose board they stand. It's Paris what they commonly see in front of them. He rubs his eyes and forehead, keeps looking and calls out, is it possible that I've already reached my goal? He doesn't look long, stunned with joy. A new spectacle presents itself to him. It seems to him that everything around the castle was in turmoil. One hears the sound of trumpets, and a crowd of knights trots towards the tournament ground, the barriers are open. My happiness, Huan exclaims, always leaves my hopes behind. Go friend unless everything cheats me, there's a tournament, go and explore. The old man is leaving. Meanwhile, Amand von Fatmen is getting dressed. For what they must have, to show themselves in this foreign country with the splendor that befits their high status and their beauty, they found lying heaped at their feet in richest abundance. Herr Huan meanwhile, with many a fatherly kiss, lets little Hornet rock on his knee, and sees. With heartfelt pleasure. The beautiful woman gains and loses nothing through all foreign adornment and shimmering. Whether a rose shades her breast, whether a bouquet of glittering jewels envelops her in splendor, always beautiful in itself and breathing love, seems to have lent you nothing from him, and lacked nothing from the other. The old man now arrives with the news that the barrier has already been opened for three days. Carl. He speaks still driven by his anger, has announced a tournament in the kingdom, and guess what thanks the victor will receive today. Nothing less, sir, than Huan's land and fiefdom. For to see you crowned with glory from Babylon is what Caesar does not dream in his sleep. Arise, arm me, Huan shouts with joy, no other message could be more welcome to me. What birth gave me may now be mine through virtue. If I don't deserve it, the emperor will let the modest one who deserves it. He says so, and sees Regia smiling and nodding silent applause. Her bosom beats his victory. In a few moments her hero is already standing there resplendent in full armour. They get on horseback, the knights and the women, and go to the city. And everywhere people look, enraptured by their splendour, and those who tread the streets idly run after them. Mr. Huan soon arrives with Regia in front of the planks of the Stechbarn. After taking leave from her. He leaves Shirazmin to her protector here. Pulls down his visor, and rides into the barrier. Loud praise follows him from both sides, he who seemed far superior in decency and strength to the best of chivalric works hitherto cultivated. Seeing Shell stood at the finish, on his proud steed, the knight who carried off the prize in these three days of the race, and the emperor looked out of the castle with the princes. Mr. Huan, in knightly manner, bows deeply before the emperor, then before the ladies and the judges, then romps about the brave stallion in the circle, and announces to the victor that he has come to refuse his thanks. He should first say his status and name, but his oath that he is a frank, and the splendor of his dress, makes him free from the law. He weighs and chooses from a pile of spears the one that seems to him to be the heaviest, swings it with a light hand, and now, full of confidence, stands at his stand. How Amandan's heart is beating. Like fiery prayers she sends to Oberon and all the angels, when now the blaring trumpet gave the impatient ones leave to run. The bowl swells up in the night, who until now has made all his rivals kiss the earth, that he is forced to stake his fortune and fame on this new hill. He was a son of Julin of Megans, and to him jousting was scarcely more than hare hunting. He storms like a ray of black clouds lap. In full fury at his opponent. Yet, without even swaying in his seat, Huan hits him so hard in the chest, and throws him sideways against the planks with such force that all his ribs sicken from his fall. He loses all desire to fight, for squires carry him out of the barriers in a faint. A jubilant shout of victory hits the clouds, and Huan stands alone as the victor on the plan. 
He remains at the goal for a while to see if anyone still wants to fight for thanks, and since nobody shows himself, he hurries at a fast trot to a manden. Who shines like a goddess high on her beautiful steed, and leads her to the castle. You arrive. He very politely lifts her down, and leads her up the high marble steps, to the viva shouts of the people. An opaque veil envelops Amandan's face like a cloud of silver, through which every eye strives in vain to pierce. Full of impatience as to how this adventure will unfold, the crowd innumerable streams after the noble couple. Now a sal opens, high on his throne, surrounded by his council of princes, sits old Karl in imperial state. Lord Huan takes his helmet from his head, and enters, in his beautiful curls like the god of the day. And everyone looks at the quickly recognized one with horror. The old emperor thinks he sees the ghost of the night. And Huan, with a manden on his hand, respectfully approaches the throne, and says, My liege. Behold me, obedience to my duty, back in thy lands. For what you made a condition of my return. I have accomplished it with God. In this casket see the sultan's beard and teeth, on whom, O Lord, according to your word. I put body and life, and see in this beauty the heiress to his throne, and my beloved wife. With these words the veil falls from Ressian's face and fills the soul with new light. An angel seems, in its celestial splendor, softened only lest they perish standing before the astonished, so tall, and yet so lovely to behold, Rija shines in her myrtle wreath and silver robe. The queen of the fairies, unseen, clings to her friend, and all hearts are suddenly hers. The emperor descends from the throne, kindly welcomes them to his court. The princes crowd around Huan, embrace brotherly the noble young man who came home glorious from such a procession. The old grudge is dying in Charlemagne's breast. He lovingly shakes the hero's hand and says, Our empire will never lack a prince's son who is like you in virtue. The End